So welcome back to, uh, to day two. Uh, also seeing a few new faces um, uh, this morning uh, that weren't here yesterday, so that's great. Welcome to you uh, as well. A uh, lot of great energy in the room yesterday, a lot of great discussions. I really want to harness that into day two, bring that forward. A uh, lot of good discussion over the, the drinks and nibbles last night too. Uh, different uh, points about different presentations, uh, especially about some of the things that were said in the panel, uh, you know, some hotly debated uh, concepts and uh, there as well, uh, you know, over the drinks last night. So bring those in. We're going to have plenty more time for discussion today. Got lots of uh, various panel sessions throughout the, uh, the morning and afternoon. So bring those in. And again, we really want to come together, harness the energy and that really to be the catalyst to send us forward to, uh, to get this research program that generates, uh, that generates change in our space. So uh, really good to see. Let's keep that uh, momentum uh, going. Uh, we're going to, uh, to, to start a session very shortly, but Firstly, we want to do a little bit of a recognition uh, for the International Day for Disaster Risk Reduction. Many of you are familiar that this is a global day. Uh, the theme this year is uh, around early warning, uh, something which is very much part of our research uh, program. And, you know, as we see uh, in various parts of our country right now with uh, floods and, uh, and heavy rain falling across uh, the southern parts of our country, how important early warning uh, really is. So it's a, it's a really a poignant uh, theme. So we're just gonna have a couple of short videos just to start off. Uh, the UN have been very, uh, very generous in, in supplying these and actually recording one specifically for us here this morning. So uh, firstly, we'll have a video about the International Day for Disaster Risk Reduction. And then secondly, from the UN Special Representative, uh, Anesh uh, Kumar uh, as well. So uh, we'll welcome those videos now. Survival is the most basic of all human instincts. Yet millions of people cannot survive because they are not warned of impending disasters. According to a report we are releasing on the 13th of October with the World Meteorological Organization, less than half of the countries of the world have reported having a multi-hazard early warning system. Among the least developed countries and small island developing states, the numbers are even lower. This is unacceptable. Early warning and early action save lives. On this year's International Day for Disaster Risk Reduction, I call on all countries to implement Target G of the Sendai Framework to increase access to multi-hazard early warning systems and risk information. Together, we can achieve the global goal set by the UN Secretary General that every person on the planet is covered by an early warning system within the next five years. We can. We must stop hazards from becoming disasters and put the world on a path to zero climate disasters. Thank you. A very good morning and greetings to all of you from Bonn. At the outset, I would like to congratulate the Natural Hazards for its formal launch and thank the organizers for inviting me to speak at the NHRA Research Forum. The event is being organized at a very opportune moment when all of us are joining hands today to observe the International Day for Disaster Reduction. This year, the International Day focuses on the target G of the Sendai framework that aims to increase the availability of and access to multi-hazard early warning systems. This assumes special significance this year given the recent announcement by the UN Secretary General to cover every human being on Earth by an early warning system in the next five years. To kickstart this process, UNDRR and WMO have collaborated to develop a global status report on early warning systems that is being launched today. And I'm very happy to present some of the key findings from the report. At the very beginning, the report finds that only half of the countries in the world have reported the existence of an early warning system. And this means less than half of the least developed countries in the world, or only one third of the small island developing states, or only 40% of African countries. But even where the early warning systems exist, we find their quality and coverage issues. When we approach early warning systems in these countries from the four elements of early warning systems, we find least progress has been made in terms of risk knowledge, 
or preparedness to respond. But given their interconnected nature, the other two elements in terms of observation and monitoring capabilities or dissemination of early warning are also not very advanced. And to make matters worse, we find that climate change is rapidly altering our own understanding of risk, both in terms of increasing frequency and intensity of disasters, often taking us by surprise, but also the changing nature of hazards. We find that the disasters have started mutating and behaving in a very different way than the conventional way, and early warning systems have not been able to keep track of the changing nature of such hazards. And when we say multi-hazard early warning system, it has a big limitation because often multi-hazard, when countries perceive it to be limited to a number of hazards being monitored, but we need a systems approach to early warning system that can also track the interconnected and cascading nature of hazards. And this assumes high significance, especially in the context of Australia, given the recent bushfires, which is not an isolated event, but the sev has several cascading impacts. We also find that while we have become more efficient through our early warning systems in tracking the primary impact of events, the secondary and tertiary impacts of the same event still keep challenging our systems. And we have evidence that while the impact of primary events have started declining, the secondary and tertiary impacts of the same events have started seeing an increase. And early warning systems don't often keep track with such cascading nature of disasters. And finally, we find that the people-centric early warning system seems to be still limited. Various elements of multi-hazard early warning systems tend to be very authority-driven, while early warning systems need to be people-centric and people-driven, driven by communities, with a shifting focus from early warning dissemination to communication. With the focus on last-mile outreach, we need to greatly enhance the community capacities to take preemptive actions. So while each of these challenges that I've outlined are also opportunities for improvement, the report also highlights some key opportunities for greatly advancing our capabilities. For instance, we have high evidence by now that early warning pays off, both in terms of mortality, but also the livelihoods and assets of people, and both through the uh, anecdotal evidence that we have across the world, but also through quantification of data that we have, we find that countries that have better early warning system seem to have lower mortality rates. We also would want to highlight some of the key initiatives that have been taken in the last few years. For example, the Climate Risk and Early Warning System, CRUISE, or the Risk Informed Early Action Partnership, REAP. We also find that there are many capabilities being enhanced through SOF on observational capacities. But we also would like to highlight efforts being taken by UNDRR in terms of filling data gaps through disaster loss and damage databases, the Sendai Framework Monitor, and also the Risk Information Exchange. One key aspect which has come up very strongly in the report is in context of low-cost technology in capacity-constrained environments. The role of technology for forecasting, of hazard monitoring, also of dissemination and communication of information is of very high importance. Finally, the universal early warning coverage to be achieved in the next five years, as has been envisioned through the Early Warnings for All initiative, is itself a key opportunity. This report will inform the development of the action plan for early warnings for all that will be launched at the COP27. For the research community, these are very key opportunities. We need to deep dive further into some of the gaps that the report has highlighted, especially on the last mile outreach, so that we can all make the world more resilient in the face of climate change. I wish all of you successful conference, good deliberations, and fruitful outcomes. Thank you very much for your attention. Good morning, everyone. We meet today on the beautiful lands of the Turrbal and Yugara peoples, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. The Turrbal and Yugara peoples have long looked after and cared for the Mianjin region as kin, and they continue to do so. We have gathered at this forum to share and discuss research and it's important to recognize that these lands and waters have always been places of teaching, research, and learning. I recognize that I'm a guest on this country, as I always am wherever I walk in Australia, and understand there is much we must do to learn from and listen to our First Nations people. My name is Kat Haynes, and I'm the Node Manager for New South Wales, ACT, and South Australia, and I will be the chair for the session this morning. Healthy natural landscapes are inherently more resilient as they are less vulnerable to the stresses of climate change and hazard impacts. They are less likely to generate or increase hazard risk, and most importantly, 
they offer protection from hazards. Western science and practices see humans as separate to the landscape. We control and we manage. To First Nations people, healthy landscapes are intricately entwined with healthy people. Care is provided to country and is received in return. We will now hear from a number of speakers about how we can combine traditional and Western knowledge and work together to be effective custodians of the land and reduce the risks posed by natural hazards. This is a new theme for our center. It's a recognition of the critical importance of healthy landscapes to resilience, and also the importance of First Nations people to this. While many of the talks here today have a fire focus, NHRA aims to fund a diverse range of projects within this theme as we move forward. First, I welcome Dr. Turlo Guerin, who will be giving a 15 minute keynote. We will be holding questions to the discussion at the end. Turlo is the CEO of Lancare New South Wales. He's a senior industry and community leader in risk, strategy, sustainable development, and stakeholder engagement. He has a passion for connecting, collaborating, and enabling communities to flourish. Please welcome Turlo to the stage. Thank you, Kat, and uh, thank you, Andrew, for inviting me. I think that was really kind of you and your kind words as well, Kat. Um, I think Kat has actually said my speech in a really elegant short form. I'm a bit stuffed now. <laughs> so, <laughs> she summed it up because uh, um, that's the essence of what um, we're doing in, in land care. Um, and I, I did wrestle with the topic and um, I was going to call up Andrew yesterday afternoon and say, Andrew, I'm, I'm really not sure, really not sure about this topic, you know, I'm just, I could go so many different angles on it and <clears throat> he assured me that you're really intelligent people, so I, I knew I couldn't just, you know, wheel out the usual stuff that I'll talk about. Um, so I thought, uh, what wouldn't you know about? in land care that would be relevant to um, the work that you're doing in your respective organisations. So I'd like to just touch on an important idea and that is land care is people care. And I say that because unless we look after people, unless we help um, individuals to be resilient in themselves and unless we enable them and resource them to solve the problems in their, their own regions, we really, we're really wasting our time in the whole risk reduction area. Uh, so I've sort of come to the view that we have to look after our people. We have to do that really, really well. And someone asked me the other day, Turlo, what's your, what's your, what's your business model? We, wanna, we need to catch up and I need to find out about your business model. I thought about it, yeah, God, good question. Uh, I think they've just done the company director's course. And um, so I looked, I just thought about, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Now our business model is quite simple. Our business model is we run really good meetings, high quality meetings um, to bring passionate people together so they can learn about looking after themselves as individuals, as groups but also for healing and supporting, fixing up their landscapes. So we're in the people meeting business and we generate revenues as an organization um, by offering up our services to mostly to government. And our um, partner organization, which complements us called Landcare Australia, they mostly get funding from um, corporate sources, but also some federal funding. Landcare New South Wales, uh, get state government funding. So we're in the people business, bringing people together, connecting people. When you connect people, they collaborate. And when they collaborate around things that they're passionate about, they do stuff, they contribute. And when Andrew and I were talking about this morning, we actually, we'll get outcomes. Um, so th this is the power of the land care movement. So I haven't mentioned anything about resilience or healthy landscapes or anything like that, but I, in some ways I don't need to because you know the details and I've 
if you put my slides up, um, I've got names of um, some collab co-collaborators on there. Um, and they're the smart people who um, sort of gave me lots of lots of ideas for the talk about, um, and that's where I got confused. Oh, should I go down the climate change resilient space or should I um, take a more academic approach? Um, but uh, what, I would, what I would say is land care is all about people care. And in our, in our space in risk reduction, let me give you a bit of an overview as to um, what, what we're doing and, and how we approach it. So I, I've mentioned the soft side, so about people care, land care is people care. And I think it's quite self-evident, just enabling um, educating people on how to prepare for a risk. So when a flood's coming, about fires, about the warning systems, but also in how to design more carefully, more, more thoughtfully tree plantings or tree clearings, because um, we don't want to contribute to the problem of risk. So there's this soft, soft approaches to hazard risk reduction that we bring in land care. And the other area is the ecosystem-based um, adaptation. adaptation. Um, so this is where we're putting in plants into areas that can help flow, um, so it slow the flow of, of floodwaters, and which may contribute to a reduction in um, flooding peak surges, as is one example. Um, another area that's of relevance um, is in the uh, in the area of drought. So that's a really important aspect for risk reduction. And it's one of the key things that we do in land care, and we've been doing it for a long, long time. Um, and the example I use in, in the Western region of, um, of New South Wales, which by the way is about 43% of the total area of New South Wales. And uh, I was out there in June and we visited three farms and it took us about the best part of the day. And when I, um, went out and, and saw them, we, we got to the third farm and that, that, was, a, that was, I think, um, 100, 120,000 hectares. So we're talking really large areas. And the farmer showed, showed us what he was doing. And um, again, we had a whole group, there was about 30 of us, we were traveling around in a, in a sort of convoy cohort learning. And the farmer showed us, well, you know, we, we do this civil works, basically it was civil works, big yellow bits of equipment building drains um, to slow and capture slow flood um, waters and enable that flood water to uh, drain and, and seep into the soil rather than just washing off and carrying, carrying all the topsoil with it and all the nutrients. But the beautiful thing about it was he, um, he'd connected up with New South Wales DPI, Department of Primary Industries. They came out and did some assessments on areas which were um, impacted by um, uh, sort of just really dry, you know, un, 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 um, contoured land. And then the DPI people did some soil carbon analysis on that um, uncontoured land. And then they did analysis on land, which drainage, really simple drainage being put in place. And they showed the difference in carbon in the, uh, in the, in the area where there was no contoured drains, um, the carbon levels were um, less than a percent. But where they put in these, car these, um, these, these spoon drains and various drains to slow down the flow of water, the carbon, organic carbon levels were up to 6%. So it was a, quite a massive um, uh, sort of demonstration of, of, of growth and, and plant life, et cetera. So there's a number of other ecosystem um, sort of services, impacts, uh, adaptation effects, um, fire resistant plantings and, and you know about that and I think you've already talked about that um, but in terms of the numbers let me share some of the um, some of the numbers in terms of our impact I mentioned we're in the game we're in the, the business of of meeting and bringing people together just in our current program which is in its third um, a third of its fourth year. So we're aiming to, we're heading towards um, the end of our four year program, funded program. Um, have all, had almost 300,000 um, volunteer hours across the state. 
And if you know the area of New South Wales, it's about 80 million. So our volunteers and our coordinators, and it's about 84 in total, um, have contributed to land caring activities, which includes a lot of the risk reduction work that I mentioned um, across 53 million out of the 80 million hectares in New South Wales. So it's a massive resource that we've got and we need to nurture it and we need to fund it and we need to, to resource it further. I mentioned the meeting we had out in Western New South Wales. Louise Turner is our regional land care coordinator um, based right near Whitecliffs. And um, there's an alliance of about 20 farmers, massive, farm, massive farms up to, as I mentioned, 120,000 hectares each. They are getting together and they are understanding and they're studying how to hydrate their landscapes. These are landscapes that are typically washed out with waters when, when floods come. So uh, critically important work. And unfortunately, not many people know about what they're doing. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna wrap up now. But we're in the people business. My role as the CEO of Landcare New South Wales is to ensure our land carers get the resources they need. That's my primary role. And I have to keep them engaged and support them and enable them to focus on the things that are important to them. So we're right in the, in the middle of um, pitching our current program um, to our agricultural ministry, a minister in New South Wales. Agriculture, Department of Agriculture is our primary source of, of funding um, in New South Wales for the land care activities. Um, so we're seeking, we're gonna be more bold. We've decided that um, we've probably haven't stepped uh, up to the place sufficiently in land care and we need to take, be a little bit more courageous. So we're gonna ask for more funds. Now we believe we've got the resources and the capability to deliver more um, than what we have already. Um, and the third point there is we're gonna make it easier for our land carers to do the things that they love because they hate doing admin typically. They hate doing tax and accounting and budgeting and paying people. They just wanna get out and volunteer. They wanna work on the local creek or they wanna do the erosion control work. So we're gonna make it easier um, for them. Some lessons in working with communities from land care in New South Wales, you have to listen and listen and listen and re-listen and then check back in and listen again. We have these things called musters. Everyone has a muster in land care, almost every group. So there's hundreds of them going on. Um, very important. The second point, um, we've got to um, organize our data and information better. It's, it's just, we're too disaggregated. I think that's the right word. So it's really hard to sort of make meaningful stories and pictures out of it. I showed graphs earlier, um, which are, are good, but we need more useful data. So that's the second point. The third point, the most important one, and that is, um, the people care comment. We need to support our people um, and we need to do that more effectively. And um, we need to be smarter in how we do that. We need to take, um, we need to understand what are the various aspects of culture change that are important to us. And we know one of them is we need to be more courageous. So I think we've undersold ourselves as an organization and we can no longer do that. We have to step up and make sure that we're at conversations like this important one here this week, but also um, with other agencies. So not just with agriculture, which we're very grateful for, New South Wales Agriculture for their support, but we also need to be talking with health ministries. We need to be talking with education ministries and their bureaucracies and their departments because we've got to grow. We need more people on the ground. We've got to get um, risk reduction work actually happening. Um, so we need more support. And I mentioned about the conversations. So our new program, we've just pitched it. I mentioned to Andrew yesterday, uh, this morning that um, yesterday afternoon, my boss and I'm the, the chair of uh, Link in New South Wales, Stephanie Cameron. We pitched to Minister Saunders, New South Wales Agricultural Minister um, yesterday afternoon and um, 
and we put forward our case and for further funding. Now, it's not cheap. It's not cheap um, running Landcare. Our existing program, which runs for four years, um, that's cost us $24 million, or cost the taxpayer $24 million. However, it's not all that cost. We've invested in people. The bottom line is, and we've done a, a Treasury approved, New South Wales Treasury approved cost benefit analysis. The net benefits of our program are $62 million. So the, the leverage, we, um, we understand that the leverage range is from about 3.8 to um, 6 to 1. So for every dollar that New South Wales government puts into our organisation, they get between 4 and $6 back in benefits. And a lot of that's regionally invested, which is uh, regional wealth creation, which is very important to the land carers. Um, but we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna be asking for more, we've asked for more, and we can demonstrate that we still get those net, beverage, uh, net um, uh, benefit leveraging, uh, and that's critically important. And we need to do this if we're to take risk reduction seriously. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tolo. If you'd like to take a yeah. seat over there. Great, thank you. So first, we now have D Professor David Bowman, a professor of pyrogeography and fire science from the University of Tasmania. David is a newly minted ARC laureate fellow. So please join me in welcoming and congratulating David. How do I press this button? Forward. Forward. How do I this? Is it the green one, David, to move the slides forward? Yeah, that one. Um, and one. I should have said as well that all of these speakers are now going to have five to seven minutes to give us a provocative talk before we move into our discussion. Oh, hi. Um, thank you very much for providing the opportunity for me to talk about um, some of my experience, my philosophy, and my intentions um, with this new fellowship that I've been um, very gratefully um, awarded a huge uh, responsibility. So the title actually of the fellowship is Practical and Sustainable Pathways to Community Coexistence with Bushfire. It's a bit of a mouthful, but basically um, the claim is to solve the problem. That's, um, that, that's a big claim. And I've got to explain that, um, how that claim can be at least partially uh, actualized. So very quick outline of the talk. What is pyrogeographic thinking? You know, what session would you put a David Bowman, Bowman in is, is really sort of because pyrogeographic thinking is holistic, it's very difficult to pigeonhole. Um, I want to reflect on my experience of working together. Then I want to introduce the Laureate Fellowship, um, give you a little bit of background about what, what the intent of a Laureate Fellowship is and the specifics of the program, which hopefully will show that I'm trying to walk the walk. So what is pyrogeographic thinking? And why would you apply it to the global fire crisis? Um, and this has been said at other times, it's really about problem solving, not problem framing. Academics are very good at framing a problem, um, but the prize now has to go to the people who can solve the problem. The problem is urgent. And the problem is that the structures that we have to solve the problem, now it's a mouthful, but think about it, is are all wrong because the problem is a holistic problem and the structures we have atomized the problem. Think of state agencies, think of university departments, think of NGOs and everything. You've got to, you know, all of these turf conflicts, is that what? There's no turf conflict. We're trying to solve a problem. And what I would argue to solve the problem is that you've got to actually rethink it. So to start off with, you need transdisciplinary training. You need to take naive, enthusiastic people and tell them that it's totally okay to think outside the box, inside the square, think upside down, think laterally. There is no correct think. There's no one think anymore. 
It's actually just thinking about the problem. But you need clear objectives. If you go into a model, and you'll probably come out in a model, you need to know where you want to go, but you need to do it collaboratively. Co-design, very important concept. We've heard about people who go to solve a problem that, that you know that actually doesn't exist, you know, and they, they get a prize for, for solving a non-existent problem. So how do you do that? Well, you've got to actually start engaging with managers in the community. You've got to actually learn different sorts of talk, different ways. When I do a lot of media work, I unashamedly can change my idiom, sometimes but recklessly. But that's not to be patronizing people. That's to be actually saying, you know, like, I get it. I've changed the Toyota, you know, tire in a bog. You know, I, I know what this is. I can empathize with people who do practical stuff all day. They don't want to hear about, you know, sort of goes back. Um, something's gone wrong here, but anyway. So what um, I want to do is just think through some shared philosophies. Um, what we're really doing is we're trying to create bushfire safe communities. That's what we're doing. We're going to improvise. Necessity is the mother of invention. Co-design, no, no one is an island that takes a village. These are all truisms, but they're really important truisms. Applied action research. You know, the thousand faces of the hero, that, that there are so many different ways of thinking about these problems that the, you know, applied pyrogeography is that you can actually comfortably deal with all of the parts and all of the different perspectives. There's no correct way, there's no correct talk. And really, this is the kicker. There is no program scheme, nothing that can actually properly fund this problem. This problem is actually so enormous that you end up having to do things that maybe accountants or process-driven bureaucracies can't deal with, which is that you've got to blend share to get around the funding scarcity. If you try to just stick to the rule book and say, oh, today is my 0.5 and I do this and then I do that, then you have certainly in an academic environment, a sterile, unproductive, useless laboratory. I want you know the Jackson Pollock thing where you go in there and you start throwing paint around. You're not actually hung up about you know, what day it is or what module it is, because that's how you're doing creative, interesting stuff. And that's what people want to hear about. So from little things, big things grow, I took some money from the University of Tasmania, which wanted a holistic view. I created a fire centre, then I created a fire lab, then I created a living with fire course, just because I felt like doing it. Then I started getting some little small grants, working particularly with the city of Hobart, then that grew into something much bigger with four councils. Then I got some you know, ARC initiatives and now I've got a laureate fellowship and I haven't stopped because that's not enough because the problem is even bigger than that. It's bigger than this center. This is a huge problem. Don't fool yourself into thinking that little fish feeding from the government is gonna solve this problem. This is an existential problem. This is a real problem. So what is a laureate? A laureate is meant to be doing something groundbreaking, internationally significant. It's meant to be forging you know, linkages internationally with end users. It's meant to be really enhancing scale and focus, at attracting people who are meant to be pretty good at what they do and, and really creating that research environment where you can mentor something I'm really passionate about. I want to write myself out of my job in a way. I want to be able to go back to an environment after I retire, where people actually welcome me back because I've done good things for them. That's really what you've got to be driving yourself. How can I get that next generation to be empowered and comfortable and to have agency? So very briefly, um, the, the Laureate Fellowship, if you look at the circle, it goes from a global perspective, a regional perspective, a historical, biophysical, cultural, and social perspective, wrapping it all around, into creating tools, techniques, and training. All of those things have got to go in that. It's like a whirlpool, driving that. And you'll see one of the, the work packages is Aboriginal cultural learning and management, really important part of this. And that's going to be co-designed. I can't tell you what it is. All I know is I've got some money to employ some people in the Aboriginal community. We've got to talk about it. It's not my place, to you know, it's not deterministic. 
And that's part of the co-design. You've got to walk the walk with co-design. So we're doing some really interesting things already. And I really hope that we can use this as a flywheel to spin up some much bigger and more interesting things. And maybe what I would like to think in the future is that Hobart will be a place people want to come because they will have see real world, walk into real world fire adaptation. Not talk about it, walk in it, see it, experience it, sense it. That will be a success because that is an enduring legacy. Thank you. Thank you, David. Next, please welcome Vanessa Kavanagh. Ness is a Wanarua and Bundjalung woman. She is the manager of the Cultural Burning Unit at the Department of Planning and Environment and has very nearly completed her PhD at the University of Wollongong. Thank you, Ness. <laughs> Nyanyeri Vanessa Kavanagh, Mamirang Bangam Banjalang, um, and Wanderua woman. Bugube Mianjin Dugan, Bugube Yagawa and Tugga, Tugga people. Um, just uh, thank you all for having me. Thank you for the NHRA for inviting me to speak today. As Kat said, um, very nearly finishing my PhD. Um, just a couple of slides just to quickly talk through. You know, my work in the Cultural Fire Management Unit now is is big and it's pretty overwhelming, but it was really nice to come back and have a look at part of my journey and the reason why I'm doing this work. So drawing on the momentum of cultural burning that has been undertaken in, um, in New South Wales for thousands and thousands and thousands of generations, but the, the sudden thrust of attention that it that came about with the more recent Black Summer bushfires and the work that key Aboriginal people had been doing um, in the decade up, up to that point. I started my PhD with the University of Wollongong in 2018 and drawing on that momentum, but also my own personal interest and um, commitment to supporting Aboriginal women in caring for country. Uh, my topic is Aboriginal women and cultural burning in New South Wales. So, um, you know, women are underrepresented in all of the emergency services and um, Aboriginal women's involvement in cultural burning is underrepresented as well. And for thousands of generations, Aboriginal women have been caring for our landscapes, our people and our country. So that underrepresentation is not um, a valid uh, situation. So my research is qualitative, it's participatory action research, involves Indigenous storytelling as an Aboriginal woman myself and with my own experiences, my stories are just as important as the stories of the women that I'm working alongside and, and learning with you know, the methodology, semi-structured interviews and focus groups, but it's research that um, I'm looking to support Aboriginal women, advocating for Aboriginal people as well as Aboriginal women and amplifying the voices of Aboriginal women specifically. Um, and it's work that I also participate in along, along the journey. And so part of this Indigenous storytelling, you'll see in these photos, the photos tell the story. So as the key researcher here, I'm not the person holding the microphone. I'm there holding, you know, helping and supporting and advocating and holding things up so Aboriginal women can tell their own stories because they, they're very important. So just some of the key findings, you know, Aboriginal women know why our involvement in caring for country is important. Um, Aboriginal women all are already participating in cultural burning in New South Wales in, in some areas and in other places, they're very interested in participating. They know that it's important for a multitude of different reasons. So the Aboriginal women that I, were talking, that I was talking with want to know how to engage. They're seeking advice on how to engage as participants, how they can have more influence in the planning of cultural burns. And some Aboriginal women wanted to undertake cultural burns on their own. The Aboriginal women also talk about our experiences of marginalization. So even just that underrepresentation, but also some very explicit examples of underrepresentation and marginalization. 
Aboriginal women know this, but we know that our uh, full participation is crucially important for a number of different reasons. And it's not just cultural burning, it's all forms of caring for country because we have relationships with country and for, you know, for many different um, reasons. So access to country was something that Aboriginal women talked about as being really important and something that through cultural burning that they were able to, to access pieces of land that they hadn't been able to to access in the past. So accessing place is important, protecting Aboriginal women's sites in the landscape and protecting Aboriginal women's values in the landscape. If you don't have Aboriginal women at the decision-making table, when you're setting the priorities, how do you know what those priorities are? So it's important that Aboriginal women's values are being protected and included. Intergenerational knowledge transfer was another big thing that came out of the, the themes from the um, interviews. And what I wanted to make clear that this is not just intergenerational knowledge around cultural stories or traditional ecological knowledge and wisdom, but it's also the intergenerational knowledge transfer that our young kids need in their current lives. It's part of our cultural and identity building, but it's the responsibilities that our kids are gonna inherit when they go forward, knowing about who they are, where they come from and how to care for country in those places. Um, and I'll speak to that in, in one of my upcoming slides. The women talked about, you know, if, if um, society actually wants to close the gap, if they actually want to close the gap, Aboriginal people not only must be involved, but we must be leading the process. So it's really important that we're there and we're leading. And, you know, there is that talk around, you know, it can facilitate forms of reconciliation and hazard mitigation. But for the Aboriginal women that I speak with, it's these are secondary priorities. So you can see the numbers of Aboriginal women um, the women's group that has expanded there just in the, the, the different years of the National Indigenous Fire Workshop in the pictures. So increasing numbers is important. So just two slides that look at some of the quotes that from women in that I uh, spoke with. We know our experiences of marginalization. So just the, the bold text there. Um, it doesn't feel like a lot has changed and it still doesn't feel like a very welcoming or safe place for us. I know I definitely feel that myself, but I put up with a lot of stuff because I know that it is important what I'm doing. So think about the, you know, she mentions that it's not very welcoming and it's not very safe, but I put up with a lot of stuff because I know that this stuff is important. You can see that I take, I've just taken that photo from um, the internet about, you know, black women are firefighters too. It's not just about the numbers, but it's about our experiences. Um, and the bottom photo there is from when I was a firefighter, that's at Mount Yengo, um, 2001, when I was working in national parks. Oh, that didn't change. So Aboriginal women know that we need to be involved in cultural burning because it reinforces our cultural rights of, as, of passage as Aboriginal women. And this has been severely impacted on through colonization. It's important for Aboriginal women to be involved in cultural burning because they're the ones who we're gonna rely on to pass that knowledge down to their children and grandchildren. And that's, you know, sometimes it's not thought of or incorporated into um, the values of the work that we're doing. It's also, it's really important because it's part of our responsibilities. We don't just have um, interests in caring for country, it's our cultural responsibility to care for country. Um, Aboriginal women want to look after uh, those places in the landscape that are, are important to us. And so we have responsibilities and we need to be able to have access to country to be able to do that. So a photo there of me and my kids at the fire um, workshop down in, in Barma National Park. And just to finish off, you know, personal story. Um, my mum said to me when I started my PhD, she said, I don't care what your topic is as long as you take your kids with you wherever you go. And um, try telling that to someone who you're doing a uh, risk analysis um, process with when you're about to go out and work with fire and um, you're gonna take your kids along. So interesting journey, but that's part of the learning as well. You know, if we want our kids to learn about country and culture, we have to have our kids alongside of us learning about it with uh, our knowledge holders and elders and, and cultural burning facilitates intergenerational participation 
And that's really important where the legislation and those, those rules don't always allow or understand the importance of that. So here's a photo of my daughter lighting her first cultural burn. And in the quote there on the left in 1817, just near Wanarua country, Thomas William Parr was noted as um, recording that the, the land had been um, recently burnt. And the, he was one of the first white people to have ever gone into this area just south of Wanarua country. And then 202 years later, I take my daughter back there and she lights her first cultural burn on her grandfather's land. And so those are the lessons that you don't get in school. These are the things we need to skill our young people up with because they are going to be, um, they're going to inherit the natural disasters that we were foreseeing and that we are experiencing. And that this is something that all Aboriginal women should be able to have the ability to do, not just me because I'm doing my PhD. Thank you. Yes, no worries. So our next speaker is Ollie Costello, a bundling man who probably needs no introduction. Ollie is on the NHRA board. He works for the Department of Planning and Environment and he wears many other hats. Ollie works to support a range of research, policy, advocacy, education and on the ground projects related to cultural land management. Thank you, Ollie. Google Bank. Am I going to be able to see my slides down here or not? Maybe not. All right. Jingle Ah, Blagomir. Um, first, I'd just like to start by acknowledging country and paying respects to elders past, present, and future, um, particularly. Um, Brother Tommy for the warm welcome yesterday. For those of you that were here yesterday for the welcome, I think we would all feel that sense of connection. Um, and I guess um, the welcoming spirit that was shared with us. And um, and then um, those that joined us for the wrap as well, having a smoking. And so, you know, I sort of want to build on that, um, that feeling of yesterday. Green button. Nalina Bilan Boran Guan Boban Jigana Warba Managali Manabadaram. We learn from the wind, the rain, the flood, the lightning, hail, fire, they teach us stories. Nalina Garama Li Jagun Jagun Garama Mari. We care for country as country cares for us. Uh, that's a statement that um Uncle Rick Cook, Marcus Ferguson, that made the message sticks, and I um co-created, uh, it's a part of a longer piece of work that we developed for the State of Environment uh, Report Extreme Events chapter, if you want to check it out. Um, and also the sticks that um, Marcus carved for us as well and painted. So I've got a few slides to go through. And the first one I wanted to, um, pretty fire heavy and I'll mix it up a little bit, but. I guess just talk about the importance of caring for country with fire. That's obviously been a big part of my um, learning journey. And it's, I guess, been a central part of a lot of discussions around the role of um, cultural knowledge and First Nations um, knowledge um, around dealing with natural hazards and bushfire in particular. Um, but it goes much, much beyond that. But some sort of key, key kind of things I want to talk about really is reclaiming those fire stories and passing that knowledge, you know, like really great to you know follow Ness there and um and I've got my daughter Jali who, who features um a lot in my, in my slides um and um Jali means trees in Bunjalung and and I guess there's I guess passes processes that um that I'm learning and that that we are learning and going through learning how to reclaim these stories reclaim um understandings of country and and so fire's been a big part of that um, and that, that ability um, to, to learn from country and to hand down that knowledge is just so critical. It's just such a critical pathway. Um, and for many, and you know, me included, I didn't learn fire you know, until I was a, um, a young man. I didn't learn it from being young. Um, I'd learn around campfires and you know, like cooking and you know, um, smoke and all that sort of stuff a little bit. 
Um, but it wasn't landscape fire, you know, but ever since my daughter's been three months old, um, she was on her first fire. Um, and, and my son as well, um, from, from, you know, before they're even one, they're on, you know, landscape fires. They're out um, with us um, lighting fire. And I think that's, that's really hard. It can be really hard for land managers and fire agencies to conceive the importance of that. Um, and that was some of the work that I was involved in at New South Wales National Parks around the cultural fire policy. And that was the one thing that was my like, that, you know, if I'm involved in this, we need a pathway for our old people and our young people to be on, on country with us and burn. Otherwise, uh, why, what are we doing there? We're not, we're not providing that, that pathway for, for knowledge exchange. So we'll never learn. There's so much, you know, for all the knowledge that I have, it's the tiniest bit of knowledge. There's so much more knowledge that, um, that I, I need to learn and that we all need to learn about, about these landscapes because they've been so heavily impacted by colonisation and mismanagement and our people and all of us, you know, all our ancestors, we've been fractured. Um, and we all need to understand that connection to place and how to come back um, to custodianship and that responsibility. And, they, and so that's what we learn from country. We learn custodianship, we learn responsibility um, and we learn to look after places, important species and habitats because that's, that's a part of us. That's the, the food, the fiber, the, the water, the air, that's everything. That's, that's what we need to learn how to look after. So identity and survival and well-being, um, responsibility, in evolving systems, you know, we're not going, I'm not saying let's go back and we're not saying let's go back and burn like we did in 1788 or 1530 or the dream time or wherever. We're talking about evolving landscapes, you know, climate change is happening. The climate is always changing. Landscapes are always evolving. Um, things are happening much faster now. We're having more extreme events. We're going to have more of them and they're going to be bigger. You know, we all have experienced that. Um, and so, we need to understand that responsibility um, in an evolving landscape. And it's just the principal way for people to manage country. You know, it's one of those things, we need to understand that connection. It's how we look after country. We, we burn, um, not all the country, but the places that need fire. And that's our law and that's our practice. Anyway, I'm ranting away. Um, I'm not sure these are gonna work, um, but people have been asking me about the rain. Mary mentioned it yesterday. So I've got a couple of little clips. I don't know if they're gonna actually play because I don't know how to manage this enough. IT can help me up there, but. Um, I don't think they will. Um, normally it's just like a bit of gravel and grass. Um, and if the other one. Is gravel, Lismore yeah. um, was being flooded. And so the day before that, um, I might even have some other slides actually. Um, this is actually a bit later on, but the day before that, I went down to this crossing. Um, this is about a month later before the second, the second flood. Um, and it was higher than that. It was not as high as that. Um, and uh, we and went and had a look around and thought, oh, it's going to be, a, there's going to be a flood in Lismore. You know, the next day, that's what I woke up to. The heaviest rain that I've ever seen in my life. It had been raining like that all night. So that's why a flood can be two metres higher than it's never been before when the previous flood was 12 metres high. So, you know, two metres is a big difference. Um, and so this is what we, you know, this is about learning from country. You know, these are experiences that I, I got to share um, with that land and learn and go, wow, this is the heaviest rain that I've ever seen and reflect on my work in fire and reflect on my knowledge that actually my connections to country and my knowledge of country came from water. And I was I essentially, you know, storm born. I come, when I was first brought home from um, hospital, there's a big storm, massive storm. Um, and I have um, vivid memories, maybe not, I was only three days old, of this storm. Um, and uh, it's shaking the, the, the caravan and, and my f mother and father holding up, you know, tin and boards and stuff, trying to um, shape the, stop the windows from, you know, um, water and wind coming in. Um, and learning in the creek, I show another photo often of, you know, being down in the back creek and 
you know, catching penny turtles and fish and just learning about country, just feeling uh, connected to the country. And then years and years later, you know, this happens and, and the fire story starts to come full circle into flood. And like, oh, it's all one system. It's, you know, fire, water, it's, they're just spectrums of relationships to country. Um, and they're all about storm. Lightning is our fire law teacher, you know. It was around when I was born. Uh, I was born in the storm time in December, you know, in the lightning time, the flood time, the fire time. Um, and, and then, uh, yeah, and then the wind brings the rain, it brings the, the, the storm and uh, the, the flood. So they're all spectrums of, of relationships to country. And I'm, too, I'm getting carried away here, but um, this is another slide that I just, this is in the um, report that I um, wrote to um, Butter and Wilburn um, to the flood inquiry that Mary mentioned yesterday. Um, so these are in there if you want to go check it out. But this is like a month later after that, um, the first flood hit, uh, hit Lismore, where I showed the, the footage of the rain, we were going to check out whether we might be able to get out the next day because my cousin was getting married and uh, we really didn't want to miss it. We'd been trapped um, for a couple of days and we'd been trapped a month before for a couple of days um, and we were pretty keen to go and see our family. Um, and so I thought, oh, I'll just go have a look, see if we might be able to get out tomorrow. So we drove down, went to this first causeway, um, you know, about a foot high, you know, we, we um, generally have to cross a few causeways um, at different times of year just to be able to get around. So went and walked through it. You know, if I can walk through with my gumboots and my gumboots don't get wet and there's no wash out of the road, I feel pretty confident to, to, to cross uh, a causeway like that because um, I know the ground's solid and I know that, you know, I can walk through it pretty safely. Um, anyway, so we cruised through, went and had a look at the river, cut back down, went over the other river, check out what's going on. Same river, but just further down. Um, and this, at this point, it wasn't really raining. Um, and then by the time we got down the other side, it started raining. And after about 10 minutes of rain, um, we started coming back and water started flashing over a few places. By the time we got back up about half an hour later, I'm, this is standing on the other side. So the signs in the first photo were sort of looking back. Um, the water in about half an hour has gone up about six feet. You know what I mean? So. Uh, I'd never seen that before. I'd never seen that extreme uh, flash flooding. Um, and that just goes to show, I guess, um, the, the, the risks and also learning. And I guess the risks that we take, you know, I felt comfortable crossing the causeway and we always get told not to cross, you know, flood waters and, and whatnot, but we literally can't leave our home for weeks if we don't cross um, flood waters at times. You know, I'm probably running out of time. But, um, but yeah, just a little lesson learned, I guess that I wanted to share um, about learning from country. Um, this is probably my last slide. Um, this is um, a painting that my, my daughter, Jali, um, recently painted. Um, and it's for the New South Wales Reconciliation um, Challenge, uh, and a, a, a sort of a creative challenge that they, they run every year. Um, I don't have my notes, so I can't remember exactly what it, what it was, but it was, it, the, the theme was about water um, and being on an island. And, and so there's a whole heap of artworks that you could, I was going to try and spruik her um, shamelessly, but the competition actually closed last night. Um, but you can go to Reconciliation um, New South Wales website and there's a whole heap of kids artworks about, about reconciliation and about water because of the, the impacts of uh, the floods this year. Um, and she showed it to me just the other day, and I, and, I, and I said, oh, you know, pretty interesting, pretty cool. Um, the, the text are, is um, lyrics from Big Things, Little Things Grow, um, which has a special meaning for me and, and many other people about, about Vincent Langari um, and the, the struggle for land rights. Um, and I said, oh, well, what's, what's going on? And, uh, you know, with the story here, and it's called Leaking. And you can see the city and the, the pollution coming out. And you can see all the paddocks of all the, 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 the mosaic of the, the country that's been cleared um, and impacted um, by colonization. And you can see uh, what's, what's happened to our big, mighty uh, river. And, uh, and uh, you can see the impact that our ancestors had and our ancestors, you know, the Jali trees, you know, with the clean, the clean water. 
And so for me, this is such a powerful message um, and it gives me so much hope um, that, um, you know, some of the things we get up and we, 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 we rant on and rave about um, can be captured by a 12 year old telling a story about reconciliation and, 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 and water. Um, you know, my daughter goes to the living school in Lismore. It got wiped out by the floods. Um, you know, they've had a pretty rough, rough journey, the living school. Um, started in 2020, COVID, you know, bang, um, floods. And so um, they've had a pretty hard time. And so I guess it shows that understanding and resilience and what we can learn from country um, and how important it is to support being on country, getting our young people on country, giving them the opportunity to learn their culture, learn who they are, understand their, the, the knowledge they have and apply that. I, I forgot to put the other slide up, but she was up here uh, not, too re not too long ago at the, um, the UN Risk Reduction Conference, which I didn't make it to. She made it up to um, with some friends and she said it was the best day um, that she'd had. She loved it. She got to meet with all these other, um, some First Nations people and other community, uh, other youth talking about what they can do um, to make a difference around reducing risk and dealing with climate change. And so there's so much um, more work to be done, but it gives me great hope um, that we'll be able to continue in that journey together. Uh, Google Bear Walla Walla, uh, thank you for the opportunity to share. Thank you. Thank you, Ollie. Next we have Dr. Sam Lloyd, who's a principal scientist for the Queensland Fire and Biodiversity Consortium with Healthy Land and Water, the regional NRM body for Southeast Queensland. Sam has over 20 years experience in research and environmental management. So please welcome Sam to the stage. And also a reminder to put your questions on Slido, please. Thank you, Sam. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me here this morning. Um, I feel very honoured to be following on from this morning's speakers and um, especially touched by Vanessa's presentation. It's just so powerful hearing you talk about your work and I feel very privileged to be part of this group. I'd also like to thank Ollie and Vanessa for both mentioning the importance of our children in what we do. I. I can't stress enough how important I think that is. We can engage with children in so many ways, literature, artwork, there's really no excuse for not including them. I've brought my children to many work events, sometimes at my peril, but I do it because I believe it's important and because I have to. Um, in 2016, the Queensland Fire and Biodiversity Consortium coordinated and hosted the National Bushfire Conference. And I had my son sitting next to Simon Heemstra for me, and he very kindly announced to the whole room, is mummy finished yet? So that is the risk. <laughs> but it's also so important. My children understand the value of my work. It's, it's not just a job. It's part of who we are. It's part of our values as a family. And I think that's really critical. So um, thanks, Kat. Um, as Kat said, I'm principal scientist with the Queensland Fire and Biodiversity Consortium. And we're a program of Healthy Land and Water, a natural resource management body for Southeast Queensland. Today, I'd like to talk to you about stakeholder engagement for improved fire management in the landscape. But before I do so, of course, I would like to recognise and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands we're meeting on today, the Yuggera and Turbal people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging for nurturing our landscape. We have so much to learn. I'd also like to say thank you and acknowledge the partners of the Queensland Fire and Biodiversity Consortium. We have 18 partners and we're really proud of that collaborative partnership. It includes all of the local governments in Southeast Queensland, Queensland Fire and Emergency Services, Queensland Parks Services, Main Roads, SEQ Water and Powerlink. And you heard from Powerlink yesterday with Steve Martin. So the key objective of the consortium is to provide a coordinated response and best practice recommendations for improving fire management, fire ecology and biodiversity conservation through education, engagement, research and support across the state of Queensland. We aim to translate science into practice for improved understanding and management of fire risk across the landscape. And we heard that a lot yesterday about translating science into practice as we all 
better acknowledge and recognize the importance of taking scientific publications and turning them into manageable, tangible packages of information for our stakeholders. So the consortium aims to achieve these, um, this, these objectives through four main delivery pathways. Training and information, which includes our popular workshop program, applied fire science research, representation and advice, which includes things like responding to legislative changes and, and planning schemes and the like, and networks and collaboration, which to be honest, a lot of our partners rank as the most important thing that we do, bringing people together and sharing that information. The program began in 1998. So in the past 24 years, we've amassed a respectable number of deliverables across the program and it keeps growing. In 2018, we changed our name from the SEQ to the Queensland Fire and Biodiversity Consortium, basically due to a demand of our services out of SEQ. And any of you who work in NRM will understand that that was a delicate process that needed to be managed through collaboration with the other regional bodies. But I'm really proud of the fact that we are now able to work across the state of Queensland and keep getting invited to share in what we do. So today we're looking at how do we best engage with stakeholders to improve fire management across the landscape and reduce risk. So the first thing we need to do is identify and recognize what is a stakeholder and who are our stakeholders. So a stakeholder is someone who lives, works, or is engaged in your area of interest, which obviously, for, excuse me, for us in fire, is fire. Now this includes private landholders who own the majority of bushland in Queensland and sometimes are overlooked in the way we work. And that doesn't mean in terms of their role in society or the risk that they're in, but in how we engage, how we translate that information, how we communicate and share, we sometimes lack a little in how that's approached. So the consortium, we have two main stakeholder groups. Uh, the first one being our partners, so which as you saw with the logos are primarily local government, state government, utilities. But beyond that, we have a lot of collaborative partners that we work with in the professional fire and natural hazards world. But the second group is landholders and it is a distinctly different group and they require their own tailored engagement process. Now we do this by uh, two main meetings, our fire information nights or community fire events and our fire management planning workshops, which are aimed at the property level planning process. Now you can see there on the left, that's part of a slide that we built together for the, Queen, uh, the SEQ Bushfire Recovery Project, which was funded by the federal government at, um, through their bushfire package, recovery package for wildlife and habitat. And we did that project in Noosa and the scenic rim. So a fire information evening or a community fire event, the aim is to provide an informative event, a relaxed open environment where we bring together representatives from the key stakeholder groups for that area. So for instance, when we were running this in the scenic room, it includes the council, ourselves, the fire service, parks, sometimes it might include defence or main roads. Whoever owns the land is responsible for the land. We always engage with the, the First Nations bodies in any of these projects. They're one of our first partners before we even go to do the talking with everybody else. So we focus on a whole range of issues at these information nights. They're a precursor to doing a workshop. So not everybody that comes to a fire information night then comes to the workshop, but you must come to the fire information night if you would like to come to the workshop. So a fire information night might have a hundred people there, but a workshop would be capped at about 20 properties. So as the name implies, the property level fire management planning workshops, we work with landholders to assist them to build a fire management plan for their property. Now, as you can see there, this is a very hands-on approach. We, build, we provide maps for the landholders for their property, A3 size maps. We include things like LIDAR, um, fire hazard, RE, regional ecosystems, and infrastructure on their property with topography and aerials. Now they then work with us using this um, manual here to build their fire management plan. We identify what are the assets on the property? What are the biodiversity values? Do they have a business there? Is there grazing? Is there private forestry? What if, what's nearby them? What are the risks associated? Do they have fire trails that need to be upgraded? Do they have nothing? Where are the water sources, et cetera? So we work with them to, to build that map 
so that then at the later stage of the workshop, we can identify what would you like to do? How are we going to rank that? What's the most important thing? What are the costs associated with it? Do you have the skill set to do this work? And what sort of time frame? What would you like to achieve in the next six months, the next 12 months, et cetera? And this makes it a much more approach, approachable process for a landholder. And it's also really important, I'm sure some of you are thinking, why are we doing this on a desk? Why are we not using a digital form? And that's really important, partly because our landholders, a lot of them are older and that's, that's not how they operate. And secondly, because we believe from a learning perspective, hands-on first is super important. Of course, we digitize the maps, but first writing it down, following the process, being involved, holding the maps, you learn so much better that way. The workshops are super important in a space of about a five year period. We delivered over 70 workshops and community events to nearly 2000 people with over 30 partners in about 15 local government areas. Um, and we're not a big team. So just a couple of little survey results for you. And we talked to our landholders before and after the workshop. So we asked them, what are the things that prevent you from doing this work on the ground? And if you'd asked me ahead of time, even after all these years, I would have said either fear of litigation, money or time, but it's not, it's a lack of knowledge, which is pretty critical when you're running a program that's talking about building capacity. Now we know that people are seeking extra knowledge. We did know that, but I didn't think it would come out first. So that's really reassuring and important. Obviously you can see things like litigation and time are there, but it's not as high as knowledge. Now, then we asked, we asked them a range of questions. And one of the ones I wanted to show you was what their understanding was of the concept of a recommended fire regime before and after the workshop. So we don't just launch straight into this. Clearly, it's something that you come to. We talk about it at the fire information night, then we go through it in much more detail at the workshop as it relates to the regional ecosystems or the, the, the broad vegetation groups that they have across these properties. So before the workshop, you can see that we've got maybe 20% of people who have an understanding of this. After the workshop, this increases to 80%. So this is really reassuring. This is an important fundamental understanding of fire management planning when we're talking to people about balance. So this is not just about safety, <coughs> excuse me, and risk. This is about balance in the landscape. What is on your property that you care about? What are the priorities? And to fully understand that, we're working with people who live in the bush, they need to understand what are the recommended fire regimes for the different vegetation types. So this again is very reassuring that people are taking on board these quite sophisticated concepts in the process of a one day workshop. It's not a lot of time and there's a lot of work to do. So just quickly having a look at some of the key learnings from the workshop survey is that a lack of knowledge and skills is a key reason for inaction. Time and process are also a factor, but really knowledge and skills that people responded very well to information, especially around fire ecology, understanding the role of fire and that it's not all bad, that there are plants in particular and animals and ecosystems that really rely on fire in the, um, to stay for their place in the landscape. Confidence and knowledge readily increased after attending a workshop and attendees were willing to undertake a greater variety of on-ground works following the workshop. Key lessons of engagement from 24 years of, of the program. And this has been touched on by all our speakers this morning. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but this is how we've collated it over the years. Build on collaborative engagement. Be as inclusive as you can be. Don't make an assumption that a particular group or an area of a geography in your region doesn't belong at the table. Be respectful of in, and inclusive. I'm sure any of you who know, who have ever worked with, uh, with graziers and, and people that run properties, if you walk on and try and tell them what to do, that's the fastest way to, to just get a, <laughs> a swift kick up the backside. So that's not how we operate, but you see it done sometimes and you can sort of sit back and just wait for the response. Be respectful of the knowledge that people have as well. There's, there's always something out there to learn just because there, there may not be somebody who sat at your table before does not mean they don't have something to bring. Acknowledge and consult with, um, with traditional owners and First Nations. There's an etiquette and a way to do this. And I, it's so um, reassuring to see the reconciliation action plans, Healthy Land and Water have a reconciliation action plan. And we're working really closely with First Nations, especially across our Black Summer projects at the moment. Tailor your engagement to your group, which takes time and it's expensive, but it's super important to, to 
reach the group in the most appropriate way, whatever that might be. Uh, demonstrate application and balance. So for us, it is about minimizing the risk, recognizing the environmental and the biodiversity values on the property and being considerate of the relationships or the engagement that's already happened in that community. <clears throat> Aim for longevity, be around. We want to value our people and value those relationships. Share and showcase your results and success. And the one thing I didn't have on there, because it's, it's not to focus on the, the difficulties, but be mindful of the trauma. And we've seen this a lot following Black Summer, more than I've ever seen it in the past. And I grew up in Royal National Park, but seeing the trauma in some of those communities and recognising that is super important before you go in to, to not only be considerate of those people and the impact you might have, but of yourself as well, and the ability of your program to be able to support those communities. Thanks, folks. And our final speaker, Dr. Andrew Edwards, is a phyroecologist and spatial scientist from Charles Darwin University and has developed a program of techniques for fire and vegetation mapping across the top end, applying spatial science to fire ecology. Thank you. Thanks, Hi, everybody. Um, thanks, Kat, Andrew, and Co. Uh, I, I would commend you for putting this group of people together. It's very diverse. I have to say, uh, all your talks are uh, very different to what I'm going to be talking about today. But there are elements to what um, mine's a bit. Of, it's a bit contextual. It's a bit real. It's sort of nature-based solutions, um, ecosystem services based. Um, I'm a scientist. I um, work in spatial science, so you're going to see a lot of maps here today because um, that's what I like. I don't like words so much. And uh, but all the elements of what everybody else has talked about are, are covered in this, which is really interesting, but it's from a North Australian perspective. Um, there's many people involved in all of this work. It's not mine. It's definitely not mine, except for little bits of it, uh, the maps mostly. And um, you, um, the, the idea of empowering Indigenous uh, ranges mostly to be involved in natural hazards management is a project that uh, we were funded to do through natural hazards, uh, Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC for a number of years. So there's a component of that in here too. So just some context, I'm talking about North Australia. This is the area that we work in out of Charles Darwin University. Darwin's there at the top in the middle. Um, obviously the other big um, population centres are over in Cairns, sort of, you know, 1500 kilometres away as the crow flies and similarly down to Broome. It's a pretty big area, not very many people, um, lots, and, lots of issues with natural hazards, particularly bushfires, but also cyclones are really big as you probably hear very regularly, um, and lots of flood events because we have um, very big rainy wet season every year and so we get floods every year and some places are more or less affected than others. I'm talking sort of today about these groups up the top there. So NAOSMA, I've got colleagues here today from NAOSMA, the North Australian Indigenous Land and Sea Management Alliance. They're sort of an overarching group. You can see their pretty cool logo, it looks like North Australia. Um, so you can see that they're, they're representative of lots of different people. And then Charles Darwin, we've got James Cook University in Cairns, they've got quite a Bit of a different focus than we do on a lot of First Nations um, collaborative research. I mean, the Research Institute for the Environment and Livelihoods that I sit in is also, um, uh, you know, very focused on collaborative work with First Nations people. And then we've got within real the Aboriginal Research Practitioners Network. Now, that's a group of senior traditional people from Arnhem Land. That's that bit highlighted in the middle of the map there. It's the north, uh, the eastern side of the top end. I'd say Arnhem Land's probably an area of about um, uh, 100,000 square kilometres. Um, what's that, 10 million hectares? Pretty big, you know, substantially big thing. And, and their work has been very different and very new. Um, so they're, they're trained, uh, they're a group of uh, senior um, researchers. They go out into communities to uh, undertake some sort of survey. So uh, for instance, I could say, hey, what do people think about natural hazards in Nukur? And there's Nukur there, and this is an actual survey that happened. And they spend two weeks in the community, walking around, doing these participatory type survey questions. Uh, they've got a thing called a dilly bag that they carry around and they've got little tools like piles of beads and things like that, so that they can um, get, you know, good, maybe even quantitative responses from people about questions and they're doing it in a culturally appropriate way. They're doing it, you know, men with men, women with women, 
young people with young people and old people with old people kind of thing because there's a big group of them and they're also um they're doing it in first language as well which um as we all know in um uh you know the best way to 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 to, to learn is to learn in your first language so APNA are a really big part of all of this and then there's just us and we're the sort of the pointy sciencey nerds at the end who do all the fire mapping and we've done sort of carbon accounting type stuff research so this is the issue and um, this map sorry you guys in the front you have to turn around it's going to be maps so you might as well stay looking that way um this is the issue so this all the red stuff is a wildfires that have occurred in that year of 2004 so this is the top end you can see there's there's a shitload of fires every year. And this is this was very typical, the red part of it was very typical for uh, many, many, many years, um, you know, until this thing called Savannah burning, which is this nature-based solution to uh, fire management. And it's a way of earning money and, and for people to undertake um, you know, fire management and be paid to do it. Early dry season, EDS is the early dry season fire. So that's sort of more the prescribed burning period when those fires would have been sort of done in the early part of the year, sort of May, June, July. Um, and you can see Kakadu there in the middle and West Arnhem Land, they're sort of two crucial areas that I'll be talking about that um, uh, have figured in a lot of this research um, that I'll be talking about. So this was the problem and um, there's been a solution, this um, Savannah burning, and this is what it looks like today. So this is my mapping. I pulled off our website yesterday. We have this website where we do all this mapping uh, of fires, but every week we update the fires. As you can see, we need to update it every week because there's a lot of them. And um, all the green stuff now in Ireland, see how fine it is. It's all little spaghetti. It's, it's, you know, it's very, very strategic, very fine, very well planned, tons of consultation with all of the landowners in that area. Um, uh, as well as them being involved in their own burning. So, I mean, it's interesting, you guys were talking about, you know, family groups going out and burning. That's what happens all through Arnhem Land is people go out with their families doing, we have a big school holiday break in July, which is a really nice time, coincidentally, to burn in that part of the world. So they go out and families walk around and do burning and stuff together. It's, it's really awesome. I've been involved a little bit and it's just fantastic. Um, so there's a lot of that going on on the ground, but most of that is done by helicopter. So there's a lot of very highly technically trained people who have to work in helicopters, have to work with incendiary devices in helicopters, dropping, you know, people call them bombs, but they're not really bombs. But they look like bombs, but um, so, you know, there's a lot of work goes into this. You can see, and it's, and it's got to be funded. And the way that it's funded is through carbon. Um, just as a bit of a look, another look, uh, this, um, this, I was just going to be able to, I was going to flip through this, but I'm not sure how to work these buttons. So that's, that was fire frequency up until the instigation of all this Sabata burning program. And that's it today. So you can see late dry season fires are the wildfires. You can see there's a lot less. Can I go backwards? Does that go back? Yeah, look, good look at that. So you can see lots less. Cool. Um, love maps, don't you? So Savannah Burning, I'm just going to, uh, there's a lot of words here, I know, but they're important because it really summarises and, and um, you know, there's, people have a lot of questions about Savannah Burning, but you're just burning to make money out of carbon. Oh my God, it's so much more than that. And it doesn't, and that's sort of a means to an end. There's, um, this grew out of a lot of work with um, traditional knowledge from people in Arnhem Land initially, but then a lot of other groups across the Kimberley and Cape York as well. A lot of knowledge from leading fire ecologists at the time. Lots and lots of people had lots of input into their ideas of what was happening. And then all of that knowledge was synthesized into categorizing habitat types that we could implement early dry season burning in. So your, your classic eucalypt woodland, open forest, uh, some of the sand, all by fire sensitive, but um, sandstone communities, which are very extensive across the Kimberley and across the top end of the NT particularly. But then there were classes that when this was not appropriate for. So grasslands often need to be burnt uh, quite hot to reduce woody thickening. This is a very summary version of all of these things. Floodplains need to be burnt hot regularly lately. People like to go out on the floodplains, collect turtles, collect food, magpie geese, etc. So then they like to burn them in those times. 
And then there's a whole lot of fire intolerant communities, a lot of riparian vegetation, et cetera, that shouldn't be burnt and they're excluded from the methodology. So that's a really important point to note because there's a lot of people have a lot of issues with you're just burning indiscriminately. It's not, it's very strategic. It's very well thought through. And there's lots of, uh, you know, there's a lot of background information went into it in the, in, in the, in the planning and the making of it. Uh, as I said earlier, it includes a lot of uh, annual consultation with traditional owners in each of the larger estates. Uh, so that people, you know, they talk about the burning that they're going to do around their communities, around their sacred areas, and um, the walks they might be doing, and the burning they're going to do that. Then the ranger, the local ranger groups go, all right, well, we'll do this other burning in, the, in your region to match up with that. They make a map of that. And then they get together with the other range of groups and they make a bigger map of that. And then everybody's got a big plan of what they're doing. And it's, it's awesome. And it's weeks and months of planning, but, and it's done every year because it has to be, because you can see the, the type of fire. Um, so what, what it finally does is it provides, um, we've got this improved fire management happening. Um, it's got very strong cultural underpinnings in, in the way that it's uh, undertaken, although it's done very technologically now with helicopters and stuff, but there's still a very traditional walking, you know, and, and training for children component to it. Um, and, and potentially it should have, from all of the knowledge, the fire ecology knowledge we had, it should have very positive biodiversity outcomes. Um, where it doesn't, we're trying to adapt to and improve that. And, um, you know, and those sorts of data are going in all the time to help people. We've got an information system we're developing with maps of threatened species. And so, all right, here's a habitat with a bunch of threatened species. We need to protect that. Okay, let's work on that. That kind of thing sort of being implemented all the time. It also means we're developing a very skilled workforce. And I'll show you a map of how extensive the skill base is in North Australia, uh, inland management. So. Um, we've got capacity and aspiration for many more diverse employment pathways than being a ranger. And um, I'm not going to say just being a ranger because being a ranger is pretty awesome and pretty you know, diverse in and of itself, but it means people can go and do more management roles, learn about leadership um, and take on other activities. And one of them that we've been talking to a lot of people about is being involved more so in emergency management. So we published this paper earlier this year um, that, um, you know, we're, we're, my, my very clever, clever colleague, Kamal, Dr. Sanger, she, um, she did all these calculations on how, what it would cost to actually instigate sort of emergency management personnel in all of these remote communities based out of ranger groups. And it's, about, it's only about 9 million bucks a year to cover 25% of the continent. It's, you know, probably New South Wales RFS could throw that out of their um, petty cash. We've got... <laughs> um, so this is how extensive it is. So in the last 20 years, all these ranger groups are now being funded through carbon money to do fire management. Most of the carbon money that they get is thrown all back into um, fire management. Helicopters are not cheap. Country's huge. There's a lot to do and they're doing it. Um, but if you just do a little 100 kilometer radius around each of those indigenous ranger groups, you can see the extent of coverage that we would have in emergency management. Because I mean, those roles, emergency management roles within an indigenous range of group wouldn't necessarily be just for two people. It could be for everyone having little bits of capacity to go and do bits and pieces. And, um, you know, so you'd have, you'd have pretty amazing and extensive coverage. And the other big thing I think you might be missing too here is that with indigenous range of groups, they don't leave. They're not leaving the community. They're not leaving the country. So they're, um, they're there for life. So even though they might leave the group, they're not leaving the country. So it's it's a very different concept as well. Um, I, I threw that up there because the Aboriginal Research Practitioners Network run by uh, Bev, Bev Satoli, um, who actually lives in Denmark. She um, She's put this, this really excellent document together um, called the Dilly Bag, and it's about how to engage with, um, uh, in, a, in a participatory way and use all these research tools. It's pretty fantastic if you want to grab that and have a look, it's online. Um, and these two recent publications are the ones that I've referred to, where, where a lot of the information I've presented to you today come from. So the first one's really boring. I wrote that, it's all about just uh, how much got burnt and where and when and stuff. But it shows how effective the program has been in reducing wildfires and all that kind of jazz. Um, 
don't read that one. The other second one, Empowering Indigenous Natural, that's one we, uh, we published recently. And you can see there's a whole lot of people, those two men, Alan and Ted, Damaranji and Zambara, they from uh, Gulungu uh, um, uh, in um, uh, Yongu country. And they, um, they put together this beautiful diagram, this framework of how their community actually works in you know natural well you know natural hazards management how how it could work it, it's pretty pretty extensive pretty fantastic um yeah and that's all i'm going to say today so thank you thank you andrew um i'm afraid we have run over a little bit so i'm going to take up a little time of morning tea and we've had quite a lot of questions. We're not going to be able to get to them all. So we're just going to do the best we can and a request to the panel to answer as succinctly and briefly as you can. Thank you. So uh, the first question is mine. Um, <laughs> um, so we're, you know, the session is about healthy and sustainable safe landscapes. Why are our landscapes not currently healthy and safe? And I'm going to throw this one to Ollie and Ness to start us off. Yep. Um, country is uh, not safe because Aboriginal people have been displaced from country and the management regimes that we have don't suit country. They're based on Western science and that doesn't always fit. Yeah. Um, so many words, not much time. Um, one quick thing, yeah, like, because the, the, yeah, the, Stories haven't been told and continue to be learnt and the land's been cleared and there's a whole heap of impacts on country that are really, you know, like driving climate change and all the impacts of these extreme events are exacerbated by that, by the cleaning of the trees, reducing, like, so the water doesn't slow down. It just runs like gutters and all that sort of impact is really critical. But one little segue is that... Um, I actually first learned about cultural fire from, and I didn't throw the slide up, but um, my mother ran off to Arnhem Land and brought back this old man, um, Billy Yalawanga, um, and he was a knowledge holder for that Savannah firework. And yeah, and one of the quotes in one of the reports is him saying, the fires come through here because the people aren't here anymore, like, or words to that effect. And that had such a profound impact on me. And I was like, didn't really understand at the time really what that meant. And then as I thought about it, and the more I thought about it, it made more sense. And it's what Ness said, because you can see from those maps that Andrew brought up that people are not, people weren't there and the fire's running everywhere. And when the people come back, things change. And so getting people back on country, restoring the land, like getting all that country healthy again, that will be what has the impact. Thank you. And the next question is from Josh Whitaker. David, Ness and Ollie talked about people and country as a holistic system, but pointed to the disjointed nature of current management. So if we were to start over today, what would that look like? And again, I think that's probably Ollie first. <laughs> Good question. Um, what does it look like? Um, I think it looks like what we talked about. It looks about, it, you know, the, and it's been mentioned a few times. Um, we need a, a holistic, systematic change. Like, we've never had, I don't know, I just reflect on my experience in this space and the things that I've, I've witnessed um, firsthand, you know. I literally turned up to Parliament House for the round table of the post-bushfires um, after the hailstorm. And I, I didn't, it's in the State Environment Report, I've got a lump of um how i was gonna say coal <laughs> that's what happened um in my hand in front of parliament and it's that kind of understanding that comes that there's all these structural issues um in our economies in our society and we can learn from first nations because we all come from first nations they're all our ancestors when you go back far enough your old people live from the land and they had a relationship to the land that meant that they were a custodian of it. And so what a new paradigm looks like is custodianship. That's actually feeling a sense of responsibility and connection and greater purpose. So instead of what happens now, we all look at what each other has and fight over what's going on that we're not a part of. It's actually like, 
acknowledging and respecting and connecting and supporting each other and being able to share just like Tommy welcomed us to country you know being welcomed being shown this is what you can do this is what you how you can support this is how you can be a part of this country when a seed lands in the soil and it grows and it pops its head up it has the opportunity to understand what contribution it can make to that system not all will survive but being able to understand that is a critical pathway and we need to support each other to grow. David, did you want to add to that? No, Josh thought you could, but okay. <laughs> um, a question for Sam. How do you go about establishing longevity with landholders with two workshops? Uh, thanks, Kat. Uh, we don't. <laughs> We've been around for 24 years. That's how you establish longevity, acknowledging, of course, that's really nothing <laughs> in the scheme of the nation. But in terms of our work in southeast Queensland, we work across the sector and across the community. So even though the workshop might begin with the fire information night and have a work and, and then a workshop after that, you're engaging the whole way along. So you're engaging with perhaps, uh, for instance, the Land for Wildlife program and through their offices and through the local government offices to reach out to that community and engage with them and help support them. And then following the workshop, you're doing the same again. So um, it's not that we can go back and revisit the same people time again. And um, that's not necessary either, because what we also find is people get saturated with information and pressure or what they perceived pressure. So you do have to be careful but it doesn't just happen in two workshops. It is about being a long-term program that has a presence in the community. Sometimes that might be engaging one on, um, in a group, small group session like a workshop, and other times it might be providing resources and materials or supporting other partners and other stakeholders in the community like parks or local government or land care or the traditional owners to do what it is that they're trying to do. Thank you. The question here for Andrew uh, around how can, you know, the great work being done in the Northern Territory, how can we apply that to the rest of Australia? Is that possible or is the sort of landscape too different, the landscape, the society too different? Um, obviously they're different and I'm not familiar with your political landscape down here and how it all works a little bit. You know, we hear things, of course. Uh, we're just plodding along doing the thing we're doing. Um, Oh, look, I mean, I think uh, a really good example is uh, Nailsma are running a work, have been running workshops in the north and getting the agencies to come and talk to the groups. Um, so we've got, you know, very well established um, Aboriginal resource agencies who have Indigenous ranger groups who uh, work with the agencies at some level, but it's getting them together and talking about the systems and how they could um, integrate. Um, uh, uh, you know, traditional landscape management into, you know, that very hierarchical structure that's very different. There's lots of differences that need to be worked out. And I think that's, it's very possible. But I, I think the key that we've learned mostly, it's just, I mean, it was pointed out a lot today is just listening, you know, just go and talk to people and listen to some stuff and, 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 and listen to their perspective and try and think about how you can integrate it rather than putting your your need on top of it. I mean, we I've seen that with some of the emergency services agencies, the Northern Territory one, I will say. They, they, you know, they're really hung up on the act and they're not necessarily thinking about how that could um, uh, translate into a local community situation. Thank you. Um, I have a question. How do we bring Indigenous knowledge into the mainstream conversations of land management and I, and I throw this to Turlo first uh, yeah. for a perspective on how you're doing that within Landcare. Yeah, so what what we've done in our current um, program, Landcare program, so we get funded about $5 million a year, and that includes not just Landcare, like the, the peak body and all our 84 coordinators also includes the local land services component of that. Um, the uh, We've got a stream, it's about a million dollars a year called Working Together, and we've got a, um, an Aboriginal land care manager. And um, so we've actually had two roles in that, two people in that, in that single role over the last three years. And then we've employed two people that work with her in the regions. 
So it's a start. Now there's 11 regions in New South Wales that cover that 80 million hectares, right under in our world, Lancair, New South Wales world. We want, and we've asked yesterday, I asked for um, 11 um, Ab Aboriginal um, land care officers. So we've got one in each of the 11 regions. And um, that's a really good start because again, it's, it's localizing, it's grounding, like Andrew was saying, it's grounding and you, we apply the generalized to the specific because you can't take the general stuff out, out to a land care group. You've got to, you've got to break it down and, and work with it locally and, and make it local. Um, so I'd answer your the question to Andrew before, I'd say, yes, but you've got to use the right process. It's a grassroots, it's, it's the essence of grassroots, taking the abstract and, and turning it into something incredibly practical and relevant. And that will keep people coming back. So it's not two workshops at all. It's the whole mindset of grassroots, which holds people to the land and to each other. Great, thank you. And a question for David around uh, funding for projects. So how do you source funding for projects involving co-design when you don't know what the project or the outcome will look like? Short answer, great difficulty. Um, <laughs> and it, it's basically what they've done to us, they being the people who hold the power and the purse strings, is that they make us business people. And so to a certain degree, um, just like a builder, you know, making a quote, telling a story, but he's running three other jobs and you just hope like hell that it all holds together. But, the, but if you really want to do the co-design, particularly with Indigenous people, you've got to do a Trojan horse. You've got to just actually make it happen against the grain because the grain actually is selecting against this because the money, in my opinion, there should be a separate component of a budget that can't be cut and deleted. And that is an engagement of indigenous people because it's the easiest thing to knock out. Everybody loves it, nobody wants to pay for it. Well, just make it invariant and then it makes it easier for everybody. Otherwise, when push comes to shove, there will be the best of intentions, but actually the indigenous people will get dotted again. Yeah. And I think my final question, there's an ever increasing pressure on First Nations people to lead. How can we ensure culturally safe processes that build capacity and capability? And this is a question for Ollie and Ness really, and maybe Ness, you go first, because I know that the two of you in particular get asked to do an awful lot of things. So what's the question again? <laughs> <laughs> um, how do we ensure culturally safe processes to build capacity? capability for Indigenous people? Because there's ever increasing pressure on you guys to stand up and lead. Yeah, um, it's a, it is a significant responsibility. Um, we spent a lot of time, we as in Indigenous people spent a lot of time educating our non-Indigenous co-designers um, about cultural safety and, you know, cultural awareness sometimes and that um, I was in a workshop yesterday and I said, you know, make it a mandatory selection criteria process before anyone can get a job in, in caring for any caring for country role or hazard management role, that they have to have a baseline cultural competency, just like having a driver's license, because otherwise the work comes back to Aboriginal people to pick up that slack. And um, as Andrew said, you know, communities do all this work, investing into training the latest manager, getting them up to speed and, you know, getting them culturally competent in their community and then they leave. And then a new manager comes in or a new researcher comes in and then the process starts again. So it's extremely repetitive and exhausting and taxing for Aboriginal communities. Um, and the, the flip side of that is just make it all Aboriginal people doing the work and leading the process and inviting in the experts as needed, when needed, paying the communities to do the work ourselves and outsourcing when we need to. Yep. Holly? Yeah, I think it's really about um, listening. I think um, Lee said it best, you know, we've got two eyes and two ears and one mouth, you know? So I think it's about creating that safe space. You know, I think um, that's something that, you know, as a new board member at the center, that's something that I'm very keen to try and 
support. And I think, you know, the last couple of days have been a reflection of that. We're, we're trying to make sure we've got cultural protocols in place that respect First Nations custodianship of the place where we are and the, where people are, are coming from as well. So I think just making that space, um, you know, I bring a lot of hope from seeing those maps. They also raise a lot of questions for me as well about um, how systems are changing landscapes and we can see the benefits of some of that, but there's also probably more that we need to learn and, and ways we need to change our thinking as well. And so I very much think that what's happened in that, that Arnhem Land Savannah Burnie process can happen in lots of other places in different ways. And if it doesn't happen, well, then we're in real big trouble. And I think the key kind of thing to reflect on is that a lot of those landscapes, people have access to country. They're there and they're supported to be there. Um, and when you give a few little resources, not even much really comparatively, you can have a massive impact. And so I think that's the lesson that we need to learn is around how do we create more space? We listen to people, we give them access to country, we resource them and we let them lead um, where they have purpose and knowledge and that the young people grow up with that knowledge like that's that's we've got 200 years of legacy oppression and colonization and we're still living through it it's it's not over yet and we can actually all support each other and come together and solve a lot of these really critical challenges that's actually what's happening we're actually being taught over and over and over again until we learn our old people, all our ancestors, they learned that. That's why you're here. Um, and now we have to all learn that again, again and again, until it just becomes how we do things, the way we talk, the way we dance, the way we listen, the way we tell stories, the way we act. When we walk on country, country guides us. We end up in the right places. We end up with the right people. Things work out. You know, that's, that's the way the land will, will teach you if you listen and learn and show respect. Thank you, Ollie. I wish this session ran all day. I think we, we have more than enough to keep talking all day, but I'll have to call it a close there so that everyone can get some morning tea. I'd really like to thank all our speakers and panel members today. Thank you very much. Oh, and after morning tea, there's a split session into the two rooms. And then when you log into Slido, you'll see that you can choose which room you are in. Thank you, everyone. All right, welcome back, everybody. We'll settle in quickly. We're starting this session a little bit late, and Loriana, who's chairing the other session, and I have made a promise to David that we are going to keep these ones to time so that you can go to lunch at 12. So welcome, everyone. I want to start the session by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're gathering today, um, the Turrbal and Yagara peoples, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And in the spirit of reconciliation, I extend that respect to other, um, all, to all First Nations people, including First Nations people who are joining us here today. So my name is Blythe McLennan. I'm a Node Research Manager at Natural Hazards Research Australia. I'm delighted to be chairing this session on resilient and sustainable built environments. So the session today has a more particular focus than that as well. It's um, the, the, the theme running through the presentations is really around the resilience of lifelines that sustain community functioning and well-being, and include, including but not limited to critical infrastructure and essential services. So the format of the session includes three presentations, uh, a response to presentations by an invited provocateur, and then everybody will be coming back together on stage for a panel where um, they'll be responding to your questions. So please have Slido open, um, ready to go. We have two concurrent sessions running, one in Boulevard B1 and one here in the Boulevard Auditorium. So please select Boulevard Auditorium. For those who are joining us virtually, I believe Boulevard B1 room is not functional. So please welcome and join us in the auditorium today. This is the best session, so you've got the good one. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna hold off quest asking questions to the presenters until the end. So if you have a question for a particular presenter, please put their name in it so I know who to direct it to for you. And just while you're on your phone, consider joining in the conversation on Twitter with our hashtag NHRF22. Um, there's quite a discussion been going on there, which is great to see. So I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Adriana Keating. 
So Adriana is a research fellow with the Fire to Flourish program at Monash University in the Monash Sustainable Development Institute. She's a systems thinker whose research focuses on the human dimensions of disasters at the science policy practice interface. And Adriana is also part of a research team undertaking a project with NHRA on the resilience of community lifelines in regional and remote communities. So not surprisingly, Adriana is presenting today on the life on lifelines resilience. So welcome, Adriana. Thanks very much, Blythe, and uh, good morning to everyone. I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting today and the lands of uh, all of this uh, country. Sovereignty, sovereignty was never ceded. Uh, as Blythe mentioned, I am joining here today as part of the Critical Lifelines, uh, Lifelines Resilience Project, which is a collaboration between RMIT, Monash and the Australian Disaster Resilience Centre. Uh, and I would like to acknowledge my colleague, Maida Rashid, who has done uh, quite a lot of the work contributing that I'm gonna be presenting today. So thanks very much to her. Before I start a little bit um, about the program, so it's their project, it's called Understanding the Resilience of Lifelines for Regional and Remote Communities. And uh, it's a truly cross-disciplinary um, program with researchers from across quite different dif disciplines, social science, physical science, um, engineering, a lot of quantitative stuff going on in there. Um, but we're trying to take a really people-centered uh, approach with an applied case study. And our focus is very much on community outcomes. So the program aims to understand the characteristics and enablers of lifelines, including cross uh, sectoral interactions, identify opportunities to improve long-term resilience, including how to reduce cascading compounding and the systemic climate change impacts and identify key data, information, knowledge and research needs and strategies. It is very much about establishing a, a research agenda in this space. And so that's what um, I'm going to be talking about. But the project's only sort of just started, so I'm not going to focus too much on our findings because they're, uh, they're not quite there yet. But um, yeah, the, uh, the project is very much about understanding lifelines and before, and I think the first thing to do here is to have a conversation about what is a lifeline and what is resilience? Uh, I guess no presentation or paper or comment or a scroll on a napkin or anything about resilience would be complete without first uh, discussing the conceptual debates uh, that always happen about what resilience actually is. And uh, I have to admit as a disaster resilience researcher, this is a conversation that I'm a little bit sick of having. Um, but in this case, I actually think it's a really useful starting point. So resilience within the built environment, which is what our session here today is about, and within critical infrastructure, I mean, for very obvious reasons, is gonna start with taking an, an engineering resilience perspective. And that's one that conceptualizes resilience as being about how much disturbance a system can take while remaining within its stable equilibrium. Ecological resilience is another major strand that has informed the disaster resilience debate as we see it today. And ecological resilience conceives of multiple city state regimes with the balance of the system depending on the functioning um, of it within a set of nested systems. Can I scroll up? Uh, thank you. And there's social ecological resilience, which is my field, um, takes a social ecological systems perspective that focuses then on the complex interactions between elements within nested systems to focus on things like adaptive capacity, transformability, that kind of thing. And this is where a lot of the thinking in the disaster resilience has landed in recent years. So here we've got just a, you know, some different perspectives on what is resilience. Now the research agenda that we're exploring in our critical 
uh, Lifelines Resilience Project is really rooted in bridging that divide between engineering, ecological and social ecological systems resilience perspectives. So in doing that, we're able to explore what's meant by critical infrastructure or lifelines, which I'll get to in a second, and untangle the relationship between community resilience and lifelines resilience, and finally uh, achieve our goal of a holistic research agenda um, for lifelines resilience that positions it within a system of systems. And this is very much uh, at the forefront of where the research in uh, Build environment resilience is going at the moment. <clears throat> and yeah, just to say again that this, uh, what these, the next couple of slides have been developed by uh, Maeda Rashid. So our project, project talks about resilience, but in Australia at least, that's not a very commonly used term. Uh, in Australia, we typically, typically talk about critical infrastructure. And I think that's very much the starting point for, for what you probably came into this room thinking about. Um, the Critical Infrastructure Resilience Strategy 2015 takes, uh, is emblematic of what a traditional view of this might be. And it defines uh, resilience as critical infrastructure, sorry, as those physical facilities, supply chains, information technologies and communication networks, which if destroyed, degraded or rendered unavailable for an extended period would significantly impact the social or economic well-being of the nation or affect Australia's ability to conduct national defence and ensure national security. Now, that's um, great and interesting but my system's brain is already wanting to add a little bit more and go a little bit deeper with that. And it looks like I'm not the only one. Uh, so the, um, the Security Legislation Amendment, Critical Infrastructure Act 2021, has expanded the focus from four sectors originally with that traditional framing, which were water, electricity, gas, and ports, to 11 se sectors and 22 asset classes. So this is more like it for me. So we're starting to focus more broadly on the things that a community relies on uh, for its well-being and the critical lifelines for individuals, families and communities that when taken out by disasters cause devastation and in particular multiply effects of disasters and cause a lot of flow on impacts. And I love this quote because I think it really sets the scene for this work and really clearly demonstrates um, this shift in think in what this shift in thinking means is quote resilience the resilience of approach in relation to critical infrastructure requires a shift in focus from resilient infrastructure that is the sole focus on the resilience of assets themselves to infrastructure for resilience meaning the contribution of assets and networks to the resilience of the system it requires strengthening the asset network and sector, as well as strengthening places, precincts, cities and regions. And if anyone from Infrastructure Australia is here today, I would love to connect with you um, because I think this is quite fantastic. And so figuring out how this shift can take place, I think is the task that we're all faced with, anyone who's even tangentially related to this, to this field. And I wanna share some observations or thinking with you that um, hasn't been fully developed, put into a paper yet or anything like that, but I think it's, it's possibly relevant here. Um, and it, that revolves around the focal points that emerge when we start talking about disaster resilience. So a number of us have been grappling with the idea of disaster resilience for a number of years now. I've been in this field for over 15 years, thinking about disaster resilience, what is it, how can we, um, measure it, how can we assess it, how can we build it, what does that even mean? Um, and the field has gone through a number of uh, evolutions in that time. And understandably, there's always been a focus on emergency response capabilities, as this has always been the immediate concern for uh, people impacted by disasters. And that's always been central to disaster risk management as well. But one of the things that the resilience debate has brought into the disaster space has been this emphasis on the value of social capital. And most of my work uh, is now focused on the value of community-led disaster resilience strengthening. So I'm not downplaying um, this in any way, but I do think that the emphasis, the current emphasis reorientating 
emphasis we're seeing on social capital might be putting us a little bit at risk of losing sight of the importance of continuity and rapid repair of critical infrastructure and lifelines. So a systems, if we're gonna take a systems approach, that's going to demand that we appreciate that communities aren't isolated systems. They rely on the provision of services from the state uh, to function. And to neglect this, this fact would be to fall into the highly problematic um, approach that sometimes happens with resilience, where it's used to justify the lack of provision to service of services to Australians that Australians have every right uh, to expect that their government can provide them. So what I'm trying to say is community resilience can't exist without lifelines resilience. And I will also show that lifelines resilience can't exist without community resilience. And so this is this bridging that we're talking about. And this was really driven home for me yesterday when I was talking to a community organiser from the Clarence Valley in, uh, in New South Wales, and her community was really severely impacted by the 1920 bushfires. And they've also had recent flooding. Now, her community is accessed by a single unpaved road. And when the main road through the region uh, is cut off by the flooding or fire, traffic obviously is diverted th through to her little, um, this unpaved road that links a whole lot of hamlets. And then this causes a lot of damage to the road, which then is subsequently not repaired. So we get, um, we get potholes, we get young inexperienced drivers um, who have car accidents, often young people, they crash their car and they can't afford to repair their car and then they lose their job. So there's all these knock on effects. And you know, is this unpaved road critical infrastructure? Well, it's pretty critical. To, to that community. And so there's something there in who gets to define what is critical infrastructure. Um, and the, that, the communities that, are, that exist along this road there, there's a lot of debates about the pros and cons of paving it. Some want it paved for certain reasons, others don't want it paved for certain reasons. And so here you can see that there's a lot of complexities just in this small case study, this small area of critical infrastructure. And what this antidote, antidote, anecdote, that's better, highlights for me is that just because the community is not directly responsible for the provision of these lifeline services, their perspectives must be paramount. So in all of this, um, I've pulled out, I hope I've pulled out <laughs> a few challenges and started to explore some potential ways forward. So firstly, we need to bring the engineering resilience perspective together with social ecological systems perspective and community voice. And this is about changing mindsets across all those areas and making those linkages um, and coordinating management. We need to generate knowledge about the shape and functioning of this system of systems uh, that drive outcomes for community during and after disasters and that that is what the Resilience Lifelines project is really starting to look at framing up. And finally, in practice, this is a governance and management challenge. And I know some of the other panel members are gonna be talking about that in a lot more detail. You know, How can these complex, interconnected and con very contextually specific systems be governed and managed so that communities can thrive in the face of disasters? And I don't think that's an answer. I think that's a question that um, I'd look forward to exploring with you all. Thanks very much. Thank you, Adriana. And I realized in my excitement to get our session going, I did not pass on the message stick to you. So um, I apologize for that. Camera will be getting the message stick. So I'd now like to introduce our second speaker, Cameron Atkinson. So Cameron's a PhD candidate in the School of Social Sciences at the University of Tasmania, and he's a member of the Disaster Resilience Research Group. He's also a student in NHRA's postgraduate program. So his interests lie in disaster resilience and disaster policy. His research is centered around critical infrastructure resilience and protection and the construction of disaster resilient communities in Tasmania. So Cameron is presenting today around the resilience and sustainability of critical infrastructures. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you very kindly for that introduction, Blythe. Uh, 
To begin with, I would like to acknowledge the traditional landowners of the lands that we are on. And I'd also like to extend that to leaders past, present and emerging. So, resilient, sustainable, critical infrastructures. What is the role for governance? You're gonna move, come on, thank you. So what are they, what do they do and how are they interrupted? Well, our critical infrastructures, they provide for the modern functioning of society. If we did not have them, the wheels would quite literally fall off. When you turn a PowerPoint on, you get power. When you open a tap, you get water, pretty simple. And when we don't have it is when we realize we need it the most. And they are interrupted in such a variety of ways. So if you look in, at the top right, you'll see the Nord Stream 2 gas line, which was attacked a few weeks ago. Just that pipeline alone has emitted, I think it's about a third of what Denmark emits in a year for emissions. If you look below that, and I hope there's no Optus customers in the room today, I think you're all, all uh, pretty aware about what happened a couple of weeks ago there with the attack on our communications infrastructures. And I'd also like to draw your attention to the top, top right panel. Those are all the communications and data cables which line the seas. Now, after they get off the continental shelf and when they're away from tides, they're only about an inch in diameter. They are very easy to sever. And you'll see with the eruption, underground, undersea eruption in Tonga, that short while ago, severed the cable there. So communication was lost for quite some time. And it also happened in Tasmania in 2016. And if you wanna talk of systemic risk, that also coincided with a, a season which had very little rain. So that then flowed onto an energy crisis for the state as well. And then under that, we have our traditional gambit of fires, floods, hurricanes, and everything else. Now, our infrastructures are interconnected and they're also interdependent. And that means that they're not just technical systems. They're social systems as well because of the people that run them and operate them. They're economic systems because we all have to work within the confines of the wonderful thing called capitalism. And they're also ecological as well because of the resources that they use and that they are situated within the environment. And each critical infrastructure relies on another. Water, power, they're so interconnected. Transport, communications, education, innovation and technology, what we're doing now talking about providing new knowledge for these systems. Everything touches another. And there's also a set of problems too. Our infrastructure is getting old. A lot of it was built in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and they're no longer fit for purpose, but they're also getting past their physical and their economic limits. We have changing populations as well. Our urban demographics are changing rapidly. These systems were built with a small pop smaller population in mind. So their ability to service each and every one of us as you know, population increases dwindles with, with, with every per extra person on the system. They're also more difficult to maintain and they also suffer from legacy decisions. Now, legacy decisions are the decisions that have been made in the past, which affect them today. So if you look at Tasmania again, we have a lot of hydroelectric dams on the, uh, on the West Coast, because that's where a lot of the rain falls. With changing climate patterns and less rainfall, that makes it very difficult to pick up a dam and move it to where the weather patterns have changed. So that requires a, a rethink as well. And while we're talking about climate change, we can't predict what's going to happen. 1.5 degrees is where, where we're heading towards, two degrees, three degrees, for those that were here yesterday, you know, this is, this is a very dangerous time. Now, our expectations with our critical infrastructures is that, well, they keep working. We like having power. We like having water. We like having access to health systems. We like being able to call each other on our phones. So sustainability in this area is, is that we use our resources today 
so that we can use them tomorrow, so that your kids and your grandchildren have access to the same quality of life that we do today. That is what sustainability is. That means that each and every one of you has skin in the game. And resilience in this context means that it continues to work, that we build our system so that when something happens, they are able to bounce back quickly. They are able to absorb or withstand, that they continue to function to serve us. And what does that mean for governance? We've already been talking about systems thinking. And I think we need a system of systems approach because each and every infrastructure is interconnected. When you look at governance in one area, you have to look at it in another. Not because it's zero sum, not because you know doing a bit of work in one area takes a bit of work away from another, no, no. It's because there are interlinkages and we have to accept and factor in uncertainty. We, we might make the wrong decisions. We might not account for something. We've been doing it for however long humans have been existed, existing. We bugger up, <laughs> accept it, accept that it's going to happen and move forwards with it. And we have to acknowledge that these different aspects of our infrastructures, these social, social linkages, these economic linkages, technical and ecological ones can't be looked at in isolation. We have to think about things as a whole. So my research is evidence-informed. I'm doing a series of interconnected systematic literature reviews looking at water, transport and energy infrastructures. So what that means is, is prior to research beginning, I've put out a research plan that's been published. So if you want to see what I'm actually doing in this field, you can look it up right now, see the plan that I've put together, the methods that I'm going to use, how I'm going to analyze, analyze the, um, the results, and also the data items that I'm searching for. And these data items include things like, how is resilience defined? Each infrastructure has a different definition of resilience. And as we've just seen, there are different schools. There's ecological, socioeconomic, socio-technical schools, all of which have something to say about resilience. Same with sustainability. We also, I'm also looking at areas for cooperation and collaboration because we need to find where we can work together in these solutions. That's me. Thank you. Thanks, Cameron. And you'll see a very strong theme emerging through this session. So our third speaker and final presenter in this session is Professor Alan March. Alan's a professor in urban planning at the University of Melbourne. His research examines the practical governance mechanisms of planning and urban design, and in particular, the ways that planning systems can successfully manage change and transition. He's especially interested in the ways that planning and design can modify disaster risks um, and researches urban design principles for bushfire. But Alan's joining us today to talk about systems approaches and urban planning. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much, Blythe. Uh, yes, uh, curated very nicely so far, I think, um, uh, this series of talks, but also coming off the back of yesterday and this morning. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, at a fairly high level and I'll go through a few slides and I've been told to keep to time. Uh, a steely gaze from Blythe and indeed Andrew. So uh, a bit of a mouthful. Uh, it's like I'm being paid by the word there, but I want to go through some ideas and be a little bit prospective about what the future might look like. And before I get there, I just set out a couple of very basic principles. I know that you know them, but just to, to think them through. The built environment is a complex of multiple risk scapes, different times of day, different times of year, for different people, for different sorts of hazards. It could be, you know, COVID, it could be flood, it could be uh, bushfire smoke drifting over the city and so on and so forth. But cities have a lot of irreversibility in them. While they're dynamic, you can't change them overnight. And that's one of the big challenges. 
I'm just going to play around a little bit with this very basic idea. We've all seen it many, many times. Uh, but one thing uh, that I like to play with, particularly with my students, actually, is just, you know, you find out who hasn't done basic maths as well. The denominator there, we want that to be bigger. So the answer is less risk. <laughs> so uh, we want this, the numerator to be small and the denominator to be big. And a couple of times people go, God, I never understood that before. But um, hence, hence we go through basic ideas sometimes, I think, to remind ourselves. So uh, I'm gonna use one little case study, uh, some work I did, it's, it's kind of the last thing I did with Bush Fire Natural Hazard CRC on Heatwave for Resilience New South Wales. And I want just very quickly to go through some, some core findings there, mainly to illustrate some, some other ideas. Of course, Heatwave uh, roughly, uh, defined a few ways, but generally it's four or three or four sustained days of heat that are unexpected or unusual or just sustained. And that brings on all kinds of mor morbidities and mortality in ways that um, don't necessarily need to have occurred if people were cared for or avoided the heat when exposed to the heat. One of the big things we see in the horizon is that the number of deaths and indeed the morbidity will go up as well. By 2050, it, it's likely to double or perhaps more, depending what papers you read. So the project was about the National Construction Code, the building codes, you know, the, all the little detailed things. And I'm a town planner, a planning law person. I like getting down in the detail and working out what works and what doesn't work. But I also think we need to get back up to the big picture as well, because you can get stuck inside all the little codes. We need, it's an ecosystem. We need all of it. So... I did some research uh, on the building code. It quickly went out to the planning system. It quickly went out to the health system. How does this all fit together to look after people during heat waves? And I won't read all those out, but basically the, the building code is silent about heat wave. It doesn't say anything. It's, it, it, it doesn't raise it. it and, and so in some ways it's benign, but by omission, it causes lots of problems. Uh, and and I'll, I'll talk about those problems uh, more. I mean, we do talk about energy and we do talk about heating and cooling, but not about heat wave. And, and that, that particularity is, is important. So to critique this thing of the building code within a wider system, getting to that system's words, which is the curation of this session, I've gone back to, I hope, I hope a, a well-known uh, model that we've probably all used uh, pressure and release, Weisner, uh, it has its origins back in 94, I think, the first edition of that book, At Risk. And the key idea here is that we've got an event, a disaster, and there's pressure because we've got uh, um, root causes going right back in time and right back to fundamentals, dynamic pressures, and then they manifest in unsafe conditions. And then when we add the hazard, the pressure of the event and consequences greater than if we had rolled back all of those other features to the release part of the model. And then going back to that first idea, um, okay, let's put this onto resilience. It wasn't really on the radar. So I'm, I'm mixing and matching here. So some people would be perhaps horrified by my, um, I was a planning theorist once at my first job, I was called planning theorist. So I'll, I will muck around with your theory, your idea, your model. Um, uh, okay, what if we put resilience on this? Basically, uh, we're dragging those, those elements above the line. We're trying to take them down into the good stuff below the line. So, uh, and, and we can also modify the hazard sometimes. Sometimes you can't modify the hazard, of course, to reduce risk. And... So what I've done here, I've, I've effectively transposed my, my findings uh, for the, the silence in the building code and, and in its connectedness with the rest of the systems about heat wave, I've transposed them into the pressure and release model. Now, I don't intend for this to be absolutely pre precise. I haven't put numbers on it, but you can start to see, I think, with a, a long list of words, and I apologize, that most of the problems are upstream. They're, they're fundamentals uh, and they're very hard to change quickly. So um, I can look here. Uh, 
multifocals. And, and of, so what do we want to do? And, and here I'm trying to take us to hopefully a more positive mindset of not, it's not all doom and gloom, although we do need to be mindful of that. How do we fix these unsafe conditions? Well, it's about modifying what's happening in the root causes and the dynamic pressures. Uh, we've got this huge legacy stock in Australia of structures that are really not fit for purpose. They're hard to retrofit because they weren't designed to be retrofitted particularly. We, we've got a hazard that is highly variable across geographies, but the building code is static. Uh, we've got all these at-risk groups. We don't necessarily know where they are. Uh, we, we've got under-resourced uh, preparation response, although health services are, are doing pretty well in this space, given the circumstances they work in. Uh, but when we look at the dynamic pressures, well, uh, how, how do we hook in the building code and indeed a heat wave event and the conditions to a wider set of systems? Uh, a lot of our systems are very homogenized state-based systems. The planning system, for example, even though local government administers it, Generally, they're using a set of rules that have been given them to our state, state government, again, which don't really do much to do with heat wave. Uh, lots of brittle systems involved. It's not just electricity grids um, in remote communities that might just have one way in and one way out. Uh, it's, it's a range of, of brittle systems there, such as relying on an air conditioner um, exclusively to reduce heat. Uh, it's, or it's having uh, an air conditioner with no electricity being supplied to it in a structure where you can't operate the windows because you're in a high rise. And, and I could go on. We've got, we've got a built environment now. Suddenly, uh, particularly high rise, and I've, I've got a bit of a thing about high rise, uh, while it's delivered a lot of benefits for density, we haven't thought much of the risk stuff through except evacuation from fire events and pressurised sprinkler systems. The other risks we haven't done well with, we found that out during COVID. There are plenty of others apart from those as well. So then we go back another layer, root causes. Well, climate change, um, how do we think about healthcare and caring for people? How do we think about developing land? How's that tied into our GDP obsession? I'm not saying GDP growth is bad, but we're tied into immigration, housing growth, building on the edge. And as we are doing that, we're not thinking about various things. And in this case, heat wave. We don't model the likely heat wave outcome for a, a, a design for a new development on the edge of our cities, or indeed an infill in the middle or the middle ring. Um, so so uh, we don't really think about social equity in the fact that we've got some groups that are so much more vulnerable in, in terms of heat wave and indeed other risks. So obviously I'm feeling passionate about this and I'll, I'll try not to go on and on because I'm, I sense Blythe is about to look me in the eye with her steely gaze. But so here I, I suggest, well, I really think uh, to follow this theme of, of systems and, and whole, of, um, whole of system thinking. So, well, how can we find the release part of this model? Uh, can we move that, that line between the denominator and the numerator up? five minutes to go. Uh, so this is just notional. I haven't done research on this, but I think we'll find some things are going to be easier to change and some things are going to be fundamentally difficult. It will likely be very messy and it will be very uneven and there'll be political cycles fitting in with this in various ways. But, but I would say we really need to task ourselves with advocacy and research and hard evidence about how we can push that, um, push resilience up into it and transform the conditions by paying attention to the, the things back in root causes and the dynamic pressures. Um, so how can we do that? Uh, I'm not sure if you can read the detail on there. This is an excerpt from Miro et al, 2016. One of the many, I, I thought I'll, I'll try not to have a definition of resilience here, but I've kind of inferred one. Urban Resilience Miro 2016, I think it's actually a very good definition. It's quite workable. It doesn't really think about the wider ecological systems that we live in so much, but it is an urban resilience model. Uh, and it takes us to, following from the other speakers, to well, what does an urban system have in it? And I know there are other ways of thinking about this. This is the one I tend to go to for its simplicity. And thinking about, say, 
a hazard such as heat wave, well, what are all the parts of that puzzle that we would need to work on to improve our, our heat wave outcomes over time? And how would they fit together? And I'm not gonna pretend to have all of the answers here, but to provoke you. Uh, <clears throat> and I suppose you need to recall, I've got my town planning and my urban designer and my planning law hat on of thinking we need to change all that up. So <clears throat> my final two to three slides. Well, the other thing we need to do is, well, what is the future going to look like? It's not all bad, although there will be bad things in it. We need to leverage what our settlements might have in them and to maximise the benefits of these inevitable changes that are coming. They were coming without climate change anyway, because cities are, and settlements are dynamic places and technology changes and demography changes. So what is it going to look like? Now, a long list, and I apologise for that, but the one thing we must be sure of is that they are going to change. They, their locations will change. Sea level rise is real. We'll need to move out. We'll need to get denser in some places and we'll need to be low density in other places. Technology will come along and change that a little bit. Climate change is definitely going to change it. But there's some good things we can think about here. How can we leverage smart cities without them being brittle? How can we reduce risks? How can we also make them safe and equitable? Because these all have other benefits for risk management, don't they? We know that well, you know, wealthier communities are usually more resilient because they've got access to resources and knowledge and lifelines and so forth. Um, are they going to be equitable? Are they going to be decarbonized? These things are definitely joined together because we can't just adapt. We need to mitigate at the same time and take responsibility for, you know, urban systems are fascinating, problematic things because they, they offer some benefits of shelter and prosperity and, and, and whatnot, but they also, of course, contribute vastly to carbon outputs and climate change and so forth. Um, we need to make them beautiful. We need to get the benefits of biophilic um, interactions with nature uh, amongst our cities. How can we do that? As well as reaping benefits um, for heat wave, for example. And my general answer to this is we need deep risk governance built in. I say that again as an urban planner who looks at these systems of urban planning and I can't find risk in there except some very fleeting and problematic definitional things in there where hazard means the same as risk. And, you know, there's all mixed up thinking in, inside our planning systems. Um, and of course, they don't mean the same thing to us, do they? Uh, so we need to have an intentional dynamic approach to resilience in our governance and we need to look forward. We need tight feedback loops and things will come at us that we don't necessarily know what's going to happen yet. And we need to think about how we can build now with the greatest level of adaptability. There's a, a design principle called loose fit long life, and it applies to single structures, but I think it's a good one to think about for an overall settlement. Um, it's build it and imagine, uh, imagine that while it's an office today, it might be residential next year, and it, and it might be a dentist's office the year after that and so forth. And it has a long life and we're not expending all this energy and emitting carbon just for one structure because we allow it to be repurposed. We need to think about that for our cities and our urban settlements as well, how they can be adapted and changed in the easiest way. We must do it now because cities, as I said, have this incredible irreversibility. Once the lot pattern's there, once you've put in certain infrastructure, it's hard to change easily and quickly. So final slide, um, again, another diagram you've probably seen. And, and of course, there are other ways of thinking about this uh, three horizon thinking, uh, Newton 2008. And I know you probably can't read the detail there, but really I want to invoke uh, a question or two or three uh, about, okay, what time horizons are we going to work on and, and how, I really believe we need to think of quite different settlements, be very aspirational, build in all of the social benefits, even though we end up working on the physical stuff a lot. What sort of place is it going to be? Where are our children and grandchildren going to be? And you know, what if one of them is disabled? It's quite possible. What if, you know, all those questions that should be asked, 
and imagine how they're going to live there and still have a great life with the threat of climate change and all of its implications hanging over them. So that's all for me. Um, and uh, thank you very much. And I'm probably kept to time. So I hope I get a gold star. Thank you. I think all our presenters get a gold star in this session. You, you, you have been the best presenters keeping to time so far at the forum. Um, I just wanted to remind people who are using Slido, um, scroll up to the top of your app. There's a button at the top, it should say Boulevard Auditorium. If it doesn't, and it says Boulevard B1, you are confusing Loriana in the other room when you put your questions in. So change that to Boulevard Auditorium. And, and then your questions um, have a much higher chance of getting put to the panel. So I actually would like to invite our speakers back. So if Adriana, Cameron and Alan would like to join us and come up to the panel. And also they're gonna be joined by Jeremy Mansfield. Welcome up, who's also going to sit over here at the panel. Jeremy is our provocateur. He's gonna provide a bit of a response on the themes and the presentations in the session. So Jeremy is the National Sustainability Manager Operations for Lend Lease Australia, which I um, didn't put correctly in the um, intro slide. Lend Lease is all one word. Um, Jeremy received a Medal of the Order of Australia for his service to the building and construction industry in 2021 and he's passionate about sustainable and resilient built environments and communities. Amongst other roles, he's also the board chair of Green Cross Australia. Green Cross Australia is a not-for-profit organisation that educates and empowers Australians to become more resilient in our changing environment. So I'd like to invite Jeremy to reflect on the presentations and the themes that we've heard in the panel so far today. Great, thank you very much, no pressure. Um, first, I'd like to just acknowledge the uh, traditional owners and pay my respect to them past, present and emerging. And also a shout out to the Natural Hazards Research Australia for its commitment to reconciliation as well. Um, some great uh, presentations there and I might uh, try to work out how to take them each of their time. Um, I might actually start with Alan's first. Um, I want to reflect on something that, that came up for me in your presentation, Alan, is that uh, heat waves of themselves is a hazard. However, the opportunity to mitigate them um, may actually solve other challenges we have both on a sustainability or resilient front, um, both to cool our cities and buildings and, and communities, but also to reduce our carbon footprint at the same time. So we're seeing evidence of that in the built environment now with cool roofs that we've um, produced in uh, some buildings now of large scale um, that highlight that you can have green roofs and large solar systems um, working together um, that also solve other water challenges of slowing water flows um, at the same time reducing the ambient temperature as well. So I think for me one of the key takeaway issues is we need a joined up approach to hazards so that we don't look at the opportunity of solving heat waves by itself. So we can absolutely address mitigation action but um, address a broader range of benefits and co-benefits um, without adding unintended consequences. Um, one example of that in the unintended space is where we might respond to bushfires and have a asset protection zone and we get rid of the trees and we have open spaces and that just leads to one, increasing heat, um, two, uh, increasing problems with soil and the ability for water flows to increase. And also no trees means a high wind speeds. So the unintended consequences of managing for bushfire risk adds to other hazard issues. So for me, it's a big shout out to all hazards needs to be the consideration. Um, and that's a real challenge given our standards for every piece of um, built environment aspects looks at uh, singular hazard um, approaches to responses. So um, I totally agree with all of the human opportunities uh, that you've flagged there in terms of settlements. And I think there's a, a great list there, but, and probably the next bit of how do we have a joined up approach and make sure that regulatory impact statements and others consider a whole hazard and all hazards and co-benefits approach, um, and not seeing it as being in isolation of other benefits. Um, in terms of, uh, Cameron, in terms of looking at some of the critical infrastructure piece for me, I started to think about, uh, what's critical at the local level versus um, the kind of broader systems, critical infrastructure. And uh, there seems to be something missing there in terms of when you start to reflect on recent events or just how 
uh, communities are impacted, it seems to have a disconnect between where the, where the reliance factors at the local level and does the critical infrastructure really talk to local impacts? Um, for example, uh, it, it picks up higher education but doesn't pick up schools. Now, that might not be an issue in the big cities because there's hundreds of schools. But if you're in a regional remote region, and this is picking up a bit of a connection to you, uh, Adriana, is that uh, that school in that local community in a regional remote area might be the lifeblood of the whole community. So its critical nature as a piece of infrastructure in that context is hugely different to a, a CBD. And I guess that gets back to what um, a few of you mentioned is just the issue of equity and how do we make sure that we're not leaving anyone behind in, in the other locations and making assumptions that everyone will has access to all of these services all the time. Um, the other big shift we're seeing is uh, in the built environment is a very much a decentralized model. Um, whether it's virtual power plants or complete communities that are going off grid or having the ability to have um, solar batteries and their own capacity to deal with it, which is responding to some other hazard scenarios. But again, it's that issue of, uh, I guess, a just adaptation scenario where uh, First Nations and other marginalised groups may not have the capacity to have that. So that might be fine for the well-to-do suburbs that can afford to have that. And so they're response to a power outage is that's fine, I'm okay, I've got 100% backup power because I've got my power wall and everything else running, but that's not so not the case for other communities. So there's a, there's a fine line about how do we discern differences of communities um, and also what they have access to or not. Um, because I think the language of the crew infrastructure, even back from 2015, because has a very generalized version of we're all the same in our context, which is absolutely not the case. We, absolutely know that there are much more vulnerable groups to that. That brings up another question for you, Adriana, um, or just to highlight, um, I was recently for Kicks and Gills reading the Building Codes report on Class 9 buildings and its impact on bushfires, and it kind of highlights some pretty interesting um, and disturbing issues around residential aged care, schools and health, around the vulnerabilities of that and how they may address some of those um, aspects. And it highlighted a couple of things around, it may not be possible to, um, to relocate, to evacuate people in those locations, in those situations. And in fact, even if they do, they might actually bring along stress, uh, heat exposure and death because you know, they're unable to cope with those you know, situations, you know, bushfire, heat, um, smoke scenario. So it's, it's interesting that at the moment that residential aged care or that particular sector are we leaving it behind in terms of seeing it not as a critical piece of our society fabric because it's not a hospital, but they are very vulnerable um, occupants. So it brings up an interesting bit. And also, again, for local and regional areas, when you think about allied health access to mental health services and whatever, they aren't going to be in hospitals. They're going to be in some other location. So how do we pick up some of those other vulnerabilities in communities that have different ways in which you might access that? Um, so it just brings up a couple of things for me around looking at those as well as, um, again, an all hazards approach that reflects on solving for one or recognising a vulnerability. There might be an opportunity to solve it through other ways. And I guess yeah, community and lifelines is local. And how do we make sure we translate uh, infrastructure kind of analogy versus the critical community needs at the local level and, and align those. And I think that's a real challenge when we have three levels of government, um, development industry and other and private industry, and get an alignment between a, a national framework and then an implementation at the most local level that says we're acting in response to our community needs in the most appropriate way. That's my kind of quick take on it. And uh, hopefully that's added something to the conversation. That's really good. Thanks, Jeremy. Could I get Slido put up on the screen now? Thanks. Um, that actually resonates with one of the questions, um, one of the top questions we've got there, um, which I'll read out to you um, as well. So you might want to elaborate on this, but I think you've partially answered this already, Jeremy, is about the health sector as being as one of the stakeholders. And so the questions around, uh, is there any re research on health system resilience for disaster management, including healthcare workforce, financing, governance, et cetera? And personally, I don't know of much beyond hospitals, but others may be aware of other research. Um, I'm sure there is. 
I, mm. I can think of responder um, health workers as responder research, but uh, as we know, it, it's all the, the prior training and the wider systems and the yep. care afterwards. Um, but I, I would add something to this that uh, health workers and indeed responders um, generally work within uh, a set of circumstances, often not of their own making. Uh, and by that, I mean, has, has a, a community been designed to have spaces where care could be given to people, where there's good signage, where there's good systems in place to facilitate what they do? And I, I suppose this is um, the, the designer in me thinking about whole of system design and indeed policy design that if we anticipate events, uh, so maybe a, a nice analogy is that uh, a bushfire approved dwelling uh, in the country will have signage on the front gate. So the fire responders will know that there's a water source there and they'll, their coupling will fit and they can turn their truck around. That perhaps we could think more about um, health uh, in all of the complexities and do our built environments and our other systems facilitate their roles. Uh, I can think of plenty of examples in the COVID-19 scenario where the built environment was not made for that set of circumstances. Even though um, as far back as I've been involved in disaster risk reduction, pandemics been on the very top of the big risks in all of those big reports, <laughs> but the built environment didn't really have a very good setup for it. So there's there's plenty to think about there. It's on. Oh. <laughs> Thanks for that, Alan. And you know, thank you to the uh, oh, anonymous question asker here. I think one of the other things that this question touches upon, perhaps a little bit implicitly, that I, it, I think is really critical. Huh? to this, this whole conversation is about the relationship between general underlying resilience and disaster resilience. You know, health the healthcare is a critical infrastructure, not only in the event of a disaster, it is a critical infrastructure for our whole society and the interactions that happen between, you know, the, the, the general or the underlying health of people and the, and the health um, care that they receive throughout their lives and what happens in disasters. I mean, it's, it's, it's extremely stark. And we saw that in the 1920 bushfires and we saw that um, during the pandemic. So getting to your point, Alan, about this, we've got us, and I think we've been saying this for a long time now in the disasters field, but this siloing of thinking about disaster response and thinking about general community development as separate things, they're actually one thing. And um, I think this question highlights it beautifully. Thanks. Yeah, that was, that was spot on. <laughs> um, looking at the international literature, I remember a couple of years ago, I read a paper i can't quite recall which southeast asian nation it was based on but they did some simulation training with a tsunami and how that would impact impact the hospital so in, in terms of people actually you know getting getting access to the hospital and how the hospital would respond but also the physical the physical structure of the building and there was a so if, if you can find it it's a really good paper um there was another one as well, which was, I think, between the Philippines and the US, and they compared uh, disaster management training for nurses and hospital practitioners. So this was giving them an extra set of skills to, on how to respond to a disaster when it actually impacted their own hospital. So again, if you can find that, then that would, that would be a really interesting read for you as well. Thanks, Cameron. So another question here from Bryony, which touches on another and I, I must say, I love that the questions are um, extending our kind of um, framing of what is critical infrastructure um, as well here um, about schools, which Jeremy has touched on in education and schools. Um, so to what extent are schools being considered as critical infrastructure or lifelines in current academic and policy discourse? Thanks very much. Um, I will be drawing heavily on the uh, the work of my colleague Maeda in this one. I mean, when we look at 
critical infrastructure, lifelines, research. Uh, I think someone else said it before. I mean, higher education is, is highlighted, but uh, education for children and adolescents, I think, is missing. Um, now, that doesn't mean that it's not important. In fact, I think we all know that it is super important. It's interesting to me that the healthcare system is mentioned, whereas the education system is not. I think that probably comes from the fact that people see a more direct link between a more direct role for healthcare in the event of a disaster, so in the, in the response and recovery phase. Um, I think the COVID pandemic has demonstrated that there is a far more flexibility in terms of education than we um, had previously anticipated. Um, although we've got to be cognizant of the deep inequalities and what that and what that means for children having access to, you know, for example, online learning, that kind of thing. Um, I know that in I do a fair amount of work looking at measuring resilience. Um, measuring disaster resilience and the provision of education and the, and reducing the disruption of education is very much highlighted in those disaster resilience measures um, as a sort of a critical system. So I'm not sure that it is uh, in the critical infrastructure um, legislation and, and that kind of um, direct space just yet. But I do feel that with the, the shift in the field that, that we're witnessing right now, I think it's coming and this is something that we can um, all work to highlight. Thanks. Just to, um, just to add on to, to, to that, when um, I think we can all understand that disasters occur first at a local level. So when responding, responding to disasters, I'm speaking in a Tasmanian context, which is you know, evolved, evolved out of recommendations from, from a, lot of, a lot of reviews into fires. Uh, the 2013 Denali fire, for example, was a, uh, was a, was a huge catastrophe for, for, for Tasmania. And what arose out of that was asset protection. So when first responders go into, go into these areas, they, they look at community, community assets such as schools, such as the town hall, because by protecting these, these assets in the, in the community and trying to make sure that they, they survive the, uh, the, the disaster, whether it's a fire or a flood, it actually increases the, not only the disaster resilience of the community, but also the community resilience at large, because these, these schools are still there, these places, places to gather are still there. And this, this is also for, for other infrastructures such as bridges and, and, and pathways. So, so, so the community is still able to travel within itself. And uh, just to add, to add I mean, heat waves on my mind, obviously, there are some great examples of, of when this works really well. Uh, shopping centres, mm -hmm. local libraries, council offices, etc., used as cool spaces. And talk has begun, I don't think we're really doing it yet, about requiring large develop developments uh, such as retail parks, etc., mm -hmm. to include cool spaces in them uh, in advance of, you know, uh, to do... to build that into the, into the design initially to provide for um, future circumstances. So, you know, we, we can riff off that idea, I think, really productively. Yeah, I can actually talk to that because um, I'm actually on the expert reference panel for the Green Building Council, and we've um, highlighted to building owners that they will be recognised for their contribution to community resilience, responding to key shocks and stresses and hazards. And so that's one way they can identify that they're in a location that has a demographic that they can play a role to support their community resilience in that particular aspect. So best practice tools in the industry, and again, that's only at the, you know, a certain level of the industry is recognising that they can play a role and be and be recognised uh, through their, their rating system through that part. Thank you. So there's a few questions coming through and interesting about definitional issues and relationship between capacity, resilience, exposure, vulnerability. The panel can breathe a sigh of relief because with the five minutes we have left, that is a rabbit hole that I don't think we have time to go down. Very pertinent questions um, that I'm sure everyone here on the panel could, could say something to, but I think it will generate quite a lengthy discussion. So I'm going to hold those, but acknowledge those definitional questions are there. 
Um, and in the five minutes we've got left, I'll throw to a question from Melissa Parsons, who's sitting in the front here. Um, and this is one for Alan. So the time, what's the time scale for transformational change in human settlements? Are we talking about decades or centuries? And this is interesting because in the prep session, when we met to kind of talk about this session today, that um, idea of transformation, transformational change was one of the themes in our discussion ahead of this session too. So take thought, it away, Alan. I thought Mel was my friend. So. <laughs> no, it, it's, it's a fantastic question. I'm sure everyone here will have something to say. Uh, and there are a number of ways of answering it. I think, however, uh, we are looking at decades, but we have so many opportunities to transform like mm. next year or five years from now, uh, the one that I bang on about a lot is when we build on the edge of our settlements, greenfield, new development, we tend to build at very low density with poor services and mm -hmm. poor resilience. But if we just got a bit of resolve, governmentally and regulatory wise, we, we could really design these places well and, uh, and stop creating new unnecessary risk. And um, I think that's the, the real opportunity that's not being taken up. There are good stories in there as well, like the bushfire standards are pretty good now, what we do there, for example. But in, in terms of changing our, our legacy housing and, and building stock generally, I, I think we're looking at a, like a 30 year time frame. Uh, but there are some things can be fixed relatively quickly. Plantings and, and vegetation, for example, um, that's within our control and we can do things about that. But changing the fundamental housing stock, for example, is, is a much bigger prospect. And I'll, I'll stop there because I suspect everyone's got something to say about this. <laughs> Jeremy's, Jeremy's <laughs> Probably say it's similar in terms of decades. However, I think we need to be careful we don't leave anyone behind. Um, and there is a risk of new, new builds being great. And I only look at, um, I think it's called Babcock um, Ranch in Florida that's uh, represented what a community can do in terms of being 100% renewable and resilient to hurricane category four cyclones and uh, hurricanes um, to highlight that you know, gentrification is a risk because people might move to that location and the old stock and old legacy areas become a socio-demographic challenge. So I think there's some real challenges in that transformation that we don't leave people behind. Um, I had one other thing I was gonna tell you about that I missed earlier. It was probably a concept that we hadn't talked about and it's about safe failure because infrastructure and standards and built environment is built to limits. And that's another concept I don't think has been researched enough. There's some international researchers doing some great work in this space, but what can we do to actually a better design for safe failure in that when things do fail, because they will and in this human errors and everything else, how can it happen in a way that doesn't have catastrophic in impacts or consequences? Thanks very much. And thanks, uh, Melissa, for this great question. I love it because this is what goes to the heart of everything we do. You know, how can we affect transformational change that we can also clearly see is needed? Um, obviously, when it comes to you know, built environment infrastructure that has, you know, 50, 100 year lifespans. We are looking at decades, 30, 40, 50 years. At the same time, there is a lot, as uh, my fellow Pelham, these blokes have just said, <laughs> there is a lot that can happen quickly. I mean, look at, look at the way in which our systems changed because of COVID. No? <laughs> it's just, we can do it. We can do it in, in, in three to six months with the right will. Um, and I also think about, you know, in it with a slightly more concrete um, example would be the rise of solar panels um, in Australia and particularly in the cities and the, the impact that that's had over the last five to 10 years from, you know, from mindset changes that have filtered through into uh, policies that, you know, have retrofitted existing infrastructure. Um, but, you know, transformational change comes from shifts in mindsets. And that is something that we can shift and we can start to shift and we all must be working towards shifting now so that that transformational change can occur in five years, in 10 years, in 30 years, because if we don't start making those mindset shifts now, then the thing's just gonna keep going and we're not gonna have that change. It's not like we can just wait 30 years and then make the change. So yeah, thanks very much.
Yeah, that's a brilliant question. And I think it, it's, it's really, um, it's poignant today being a disaster risk reduction, reduction day because building back better is one of the key, one of the key aspects of the Sendai, the Sendai framework. Looking at, um, looking at how we can build back better and because when we do that, we can also tackle these issues of justice and these issues of, of, of infrastructure democracy to make sure that there's a more equal and even distribution of these resources within our community. It presents a wonderful opportunity to have more decentralised energy systems, to have more decentralised water systems. And with climate change, we are going to have to do this. You know, it's the, the, the option not to make this transformative change is that in 10 years or 15 years or 20 years, Mother Nature will do it for us and it will not be smooth. Thanks, Cameron. It's a call to action for all of us. So um, that brings us to the end of our session. Thank you all very much for your questions on Slido. We'll make sure that your questions get to the speakers, even if we haven't had a chance to answer them in session today. Um, and I'm sure they will take a lot away from reflecting on your questions. So um, after lunch at 1 p.m. sharp, the next session in here is learning from disasters. Um, and in B1 is operational response and innovation, which is down the other end of the hall. But I'd now like to release you all to a lunch break. Um, and just before we go, could you please put your hands together to thank our presenters and panel members today? Thank you. Okay, I think we'll make a start. Good afternoon, everyone. I wish to pay my respects to the Turrbal and Yagara peoples whose beautiful country we meet on today. As I said earlier this morning, I am a guest on this country, as I always am wherever I walk in Australia, and understand there is much we must do to learn from and listen to our First Nations people. Before joining NHRA, I was very lucky to work closely with a number of First Nations people, and I've learned that country is the greatest teacher of all. We just need to learn to listen. My name is Kat Haynes. I'm the Node Manager for New South Wales ACT in South Australia. It is my great pleasure to introduce this session on learning from disasters. Understanding the underlying social, economic, and political circumstances that underpin why a hazard event becomes a disaster is fundamentally important to reducing future risks and transforming how we live and adapt to hazards. Exploring why some people are disproportionately impacted is critical if we are to reduce vulnerabilities. It's only by critically exploring the efficacy of our preparedness, response and recovery systems that we can improve them. But learning why is only part of the process. Implementing transformative change is challenging. First, I'd like to welcome Bayami Williamson to the stage. Bayami is a Yuli man from Northwest New South Wales. He's completing his PhD at ANU and is a research fellow within the Fire to Flourish team at Monash University. In addition to his post-disaster work, Bayami works on a number of areas around indigenous cultural and natural resource management, indigenous men and masculinities, indigenous governance and indigenous data sovereignty. Please join me in welcoming Bayami to the stage. Move the slides. The magic green button. No, thanks. Yeah, I'm everybody. Lovely to be here with you. Um, and thank you, Kat, for the introduction. Um, yeah, real thrilled to be with you. Uh, thanks to NHRA for, for having me. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging country as is customary for our people. So, in the language of my people, we say, De Mange Nale, Winning Arena. I've really enjoyed being around the conference, the, the day or so of it already. Um, I particularly like this morning having some Indigenous speakers and I and I really enjoyed the event last night, which was the uh, the launch of the wrap. For those of you who weren't there, you missed something special. It was, um, it was a fantastic thing to be around. It'd be a remiss of me, however, to not remind people that all the platitudes in the world is no replacement for our land. We need our land back. Land needs us back. And reconciliation means being brave about having that conversation. So I'm a Yualiao man. My people come from the Narran River and Darawa, the Narran Lakes wetlands. My mother comes from Cloncurry and her mother comes from Normanton. Our family go up into the Gulf country, up into Queensland. And in the 
in the context of this of this presentation, I'd also like to acknowledge my sisters who are from Cabbage Tree Island, not an incidental factor given what we're discussing today. So this research project is uh, mixed methods. It uh, utilizes geospatial data to map the extent of indigenous interests across the disaster affected LGAs in the Northern Rivers area. We use population statistics, the latest ones from the 2021 uh, census um, and associated housing wellbeing indicators and contextualize these through a number of qualitative interviews. The goal of this project really has been to create a picture of what the uh, of the extent of Indigenous peoples and their recognised interests in land and cultural heritage, um, and to understand their experiences as Aboriginal people, which may or may not be distinct from others. I must acknowledge the uh, Centre for Aboriginal Economic Policy Research at the Australian National University, with whom this project was undertaken, as well as the Australian Indigenous Governance Institute, who have sponsored the Indigenous Governance of Development Project, which has provided funding for this project. I'd also like to acknowledge my colleague and friend, Dr. Francis Markham, at CAPER, he's a demographer and a geographer. Uh, the tables and maps you see today are his labour and I thank him for his time and efforts in this work. So to begin, this is a, a map of the disaster affected LGAs throughout the Northern Rivers region. I apologise because I know a lot of you will struggle to see this uh, map. This screen's a bit hard to see, especially from the back up there, I notice. Um, but you should be able to see the Small black dots, and they're all the discrete Aboriginal communities dotted throughout the 10 disaster um, uh, declared LGAs in the Northern Rivers region. You can see in the brown, um, the dark brown spots are uh, more up in the, the top of the screen, um, the top of the map. Uh, they are recognised native tidal interests, um, multiple native tidal interests from multiple First Nations, and they're dotted right throughout the area. You can't see, um, there, uh, we've mapped the extent of land council boundaries in the disaster affected area as well. Um, they're the kind of dotted lines. Um, they are harder to see. We'll, we'll, we'll work on this map for the publication when the paper comes out. But to put it into context, um, you know, in summary, there are 18 local Aboriginal land councils located within the disaster affected LGAs. 15 of those are located entirely within the disaster affected areas. So you have 18 local Aboriginal land councils, you have 10 local government areas, you have multiple native title rights, possessing an extraordinary array of rights and interests and cultural heritage responsibilities. I hope I'm painting a picture of the complicated land culture and social governance that exists in the Northern Rivers. So this, is a um, table of the population statistics, as I said, the latest ones um, from the 2021 census. Um, it reveals that which we intuitively know that indigenous peoples are overrepresented in disaster affected areas. In some LGAs, such as the Nambucca Valley, Clarence Valley and Richmond Valley, indigenous residents make up almost 10% of local populations. 8.3% of indigenous people in New South Wales live in the Northern Rivers region. But population statistics are only one part of the story. This is a graph comparing the age distribution of Indigenous versus non-Indigenous population. As you can see, they have very different profiles. The largest cohort of Indigenous peoples are those aged 10 to 14 years, followed by 5 to 9, followed by 0 to 4, followed by 15 to 19 years. Whereas the largest age cohort for non-Indigenous peoples is 60 to 64 years, followed by 65 to 69, followed by 55 to 59, followed by 70 to 74 years. I ask you to consider how this may impact relief and recovery efforts and how strategies to support communities might be different between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities. And whilst these are statistics, the story behind them actually became immediately apparent in qualitative interviews. So this was an interview from a resident of Box Ridge, a small Aboriginal mission next to Korokai. You will notice that I've not used participants' name. Um, in, for some of the participants, I haven't finished checking use of their personal information and their names. Um, but I have included the location, uh, where they're from, where they've provided consent. It's purely a thing for consistency. Um, so yeah, they say there's a couple of babies, lots of toddlers, there's a lot of kids. <clears throat> this is a table with socioeconomic status indicators for Indigenous versus non-Indigenous residents in the disaster affected LGAs. You'll see that 28% of Indigenous households live on less than $500 per week, as opposed to 19% of non-Indigenous households. 15% of Indigenous residents live in overcrowded dwellings, as opposed to 5% of non-Indigenous residents. 
26% of Indigenous peoples live in a household where one or more person under the age of 44 years has a chronic health condition, as opposed to 20% of Indigenous pe uh, non-Indigenous peoples. Clearly, Indigenous peoples are excelling in all the wrong socioeconomic areas. This was seen in one interview I completed with a young Bundjalung woman working with the Jali Local Aboriginal Land Council in and around Ballina, who said, so there's roughly 27 homes on Cabbage Tree Island, and within those homes, there's heaps of residents, like some homes, there could be up to 12 or 13 people, and they're all in three or four bedrooms. And some people with large family units have up to nine kids. So I would say that easily over 50 kids on Cabbage Tree Island, possibly up to 80 sometimes, and there'd be roughly 60 adults on Cabo. And that includes elders who have chronic health issues and stuff. But it wasn't just the socioeconomic indicators that provide divergence from mainstream experience of disasters. The effects of flooding on country also had a notable impact on Aboriginal people. One participant, a young ranger from Box Ridge told me, the country looks dead, you know, when dirty water goes over the grass and it leaves all the dirt and mud there. That's where the country, that's what it looks like all over Korokai. And there's been a lot of weeds and things that have come up as well. This existence of weeds in particular really, um, uh, came up a couple of times and it's worth having a second quote to to that effect so this is from a participant from uh, Muli Muli which is a bit more inland not along the coastline um, but still within the disaster affected area um, this person stated but what happened at Tumala which is a mission here there's two rivers that meet here the Demerics and McIntyre now we've noticed in the last two months that there's an invasive weed called castor oil plant which is highly toxic to animals and human beings as well so we noticed that it only came down through the one river. So we have two, river, um, two rivers flood, Demerics and McIntyre, but all of this invasive weed was coming down from the Demerics, which extends up into Queensland. And that's come down with the flood. You know, I've spent years on the river swimming, fishing, just being there, and I've never seen this plant until after this flood. And it's only been a matter of two months for it to go from a foot high to 14 foot high. It's come along in this recent flood and it's settling a settling a lot throughout this river. This participant who is heavily involved in caring for country programs went further to explain the damage on cultural heritage. The thing with a lot of our cultural heritage, a lot of that stuff is on the ground, you know, it's our artifacts and stuff like that. So the impacts of floods on the ground, you know, the ground moves. Some of the stuff that we have, uh, that we've had here 20 years ago is downstream from where we are now, because it's moved, you know. So this needs to be taken into consideration. Like we were just on the ground just before, and we had an opportunity to look out for a burn plan in that. And there was a creek out there that is a known place where our old people would grind. There was a big grinding stone there. We couldn't find that grinding stone. So I don't know if the water has taken that or not. You know, nothing has been done on the impacts of, on cultural heritage since the floods. I never seen it. I don't see it. No one out here looking around, looking at scar trees, I don't know if, it, if an assessment has been done because there is a lot of significance in and around this place, Tumala and Bogabilla. There's been no post-floods cultural heritage assessment done. Some participants also shared experiences of racism, such as one participant from Korokai. Some of the community boys, they were mistreated by these recovery hubs here. They had babies and everything. I remember two girls that was going off their heads at one of the recovery hubs here because they weren't, because they went, and then fellas were like, you can't come here. You got supplies dropped off the other day or the other night or last week. These are for the town people. And these two women, they came up to me and they were stressed and angry. And I was like, you know, who are they to say you can't grab some supplies? These are a part of this community too. Yes, you had a drop off, but that, was, that wasn't much. And you've got all those kids. You know what I mean? And I remember, because one of those boys who was helping deliver some food with the SES, he got stopped by police here at the hospital. And he said that the police took meat off him that he was taking out to the reserve and they took it off him and brought it back in town. So there was a lot of stories like that. Now I've lived in Korokai all my life and there was a lot of racism and these floods brought a lot of that racism back out. Yesterday afternoon in the session, Professor Mary O'Kane, was talking about the need to continue to develop mapping technologies, including our ability to measure likely impacts should you know, hazards occur at any one time and also uh, in any one location. In the context of my work, you know, like this is um, 
Unfortunately, these kind of experiences, we heard a lot of them in the bushfires as well. So there's, you know, starting to come up as a pretty consistent matter in these uh, post-disaster contexts. So it kind of made me think, you know, I wonder if someone can develop a tool that maps all the races in this country. I mean, it'd be a wonderful tool for our people all the time, but in particular after a disaster, you know, but maybe some things are beyond mapping. But look, um, it's unfair to say that the experience of racism was wide, widespread. I'd categorize it as uneven with a lot of the people that I spoke to, because there was also wonderful examples of community cohesion. This is from a participant in Kingscliff. The response was really a whole of community response. When we arrived to help out, there was this fellow who does stand up paddle boarding. His name is Tim. He already started paddling down to see if anyone needed help. And he started bringing people out and the evacuation center was four kilometers away. So me and my partner started running people back down there like a taxi service. And it just got worse and worse. The number of people needed evacuating was increasing. The number of people needing help was increasing. The number of people needing to go to the evacuation center was increasing. And so Tim, the stand up paddle dude, he ended up taking on a real leadership role. He was there from 4.30 in the afternoon till about 12.30 in the morning. And I reckon we would have rescued about 300 to 400 people. There was old people, there was babies and mums with their babies. There was disabled people, it was full on. And it was just a whole of community response. Didn't matter who you were. If you could and wanted to, you helped out. We had residents who were nurses who just started treating people on the side of the road where we were dropping them off. I was really impressed with how brave a lot of our community members were. It was 100% community. There were common stories, uh, sorry, there were conflicting stories between some participants between the experiences of racism and these stories of um, incredible community cohesion. There was one uh, real consistency though that went across all of the participants and that was the centrality of indigenous leadership. This is from one participant who volunteered, went up from Redfern, Waterloo and went up and volunteered at the Koori Mail. This person said, and I love this, the way that this person said it, the Koori Mail was basically the head of the snake. They were the ones that were like, basically their whole building was destroyed too. So they were starting from scratch as well, but they seen they were in a position that they could help out the rest of the town by using their now destroyed offices to use that as a space to help regenerate people. Everyone that was there was just community fellows. And it wasn't just black, it was black, white, everyone. It didn't matter. There was one guy we met, he was an Islander kid. He was in his early twenties and he was from the next town up from Lismore. And I just got chatting to him. And how did you come about being here, Russ? And he was watching on the news and he just decided that he couldn't watch anymore. So he literally walked from his house all the way into Lismore and just decided to help out. And then he heard about the Koori Mail. And so he just made his way down there. And that's how it happened, word of mouth. Everyone just came to hear that the Koori Mail, that's the place to be. That was the hub. If you needed anything, that's where you went. Or if you're in a position where your house didn't get damaged and you could help out, that's where you went. Throughout the, um, the talking with people um, across the, the, the cohort of participants that I was able to access and, and volunteer to, to be part of this, there were some striking similarities as well that was coming up in not necessarily what they were saying, but certainly to me, it was very obvious. And one of, one of the key lessons that I um, thought about is trying to develop our understanding of the, the support mechanisms um, and the ecosystem of support available and to Indigenous peoples and that they activate. And the best way that I can express it, are they are kin-centric circles of support. This is a participant who, uh, so their, um, uh, the name of their home community be withheld. But they said, we had this group, it was done through the Tweed Byron, local Aboriginal land council. They had coordinated with a whole lot of young black men to come and help Fingal and Chindra. So their little communities, um, suburbs uh, in and around Kingscliff. So the day that they, so the day that they said, you know, we're coming and we'll be at your place on da 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 da. And I was like, oh my God, I don't want anyone to touch anything. So I had to get ready to be prepared, but these young men, like they were all in their twenties or younger, one was only 17 and they were like, I never, never seen so much care. They, the care and respect they gave and like, they know me, but it wasn't only to me, they were like this with everyone they helped. And you know, nothing was too much. They asked very simple questions, you know, auntie, do you want to do that? Auntie, do you want to do this? 
Uh, Arnie, where can we? Arnie, do you want us to take out? It was like they were all well-raised kids. And when they came, I was in the same clothes I'd been in for three days and they didn't even raise an eyebrow. They had gurneys, they had big street brushes, anything you would want to come and clean the place, um, clean the place they had. They were at my place for two hours and everything was done then. It was such a relief. Some of these young fellows, I've known them since they were kids. They still do everything in town and things with my daughter. And you know, you know respect, um, they know respect because they know the language, they know the stories, they know the families. They do yoa, that's a traditional dance. They were just super gentle. This is a point worth reflecting on with another quote. Um, this is the same participant from Redfern Waterloo. Um, this person spoke about why they went up there. And they said, because we had those family ties up there, I just really wanted to help out. I just like helping out too, especially other blackfellas. Like you're in a position where you can help. And I always try and do that, just playing my part. An unexpected uh, outcome of the research was the healing opportunities it provided participants. So this is from one of the participants, the, the, the same one from Kingscliff. At the end of the um, interview, they said to me, it actually felt really good. It felt really good to talk about this stuff, which I didn't kind of expect. Yeah, I'm glad I did it. And this came up again with another participant, the same one who um, withheld the location. It wasn't as scary as I thought it was gonna be. In my normal self, I would, I would just discuss things. I'm an orator. I do talk, but talking to you now about my experience, it was, it helps me in, the, in my process of healing. Like, it's not a conversation that you can have just normally around here now because people's experiences are the same as you, are the same. And you know, it's just not something that we talk about. And I haven't had many opportunities to talk about it. It was good to reflect back on what I remember and also my emotions that I still find really hard to talk about. So what are the key learnings from this relatively small scale study? Well, there are a few. Firstly, the existence of multiple overlapping and confusing social, cultural and governing arrangements in the Northern Rivers complicates response and recovery efforts. There exist larger indigenous populations in the Northern Rivers than in other parts of the state with this population um, possessing unique demographic profile all of its own. In particular, the prevalence of children and babies. This is compounded by the fact that more Aboriginal families are living in overcrowded and intergenerational housing, live with high rates of chronic health conditions and live below the poverty line. The floods have had an immense impact on country and the introduction of new invasive species with few resources to manage these is of great concern. Of concern also is the damage and degradation of cultural heritage values, many of which are located along or adjacent to river systems. There are experience of racism with some people highlighting this as a key hazard that they and others encountered. This trend is consistent with previous findings from research I undertook in the 2019-20 bushfires. For Aboriginal people, racism is a significant and ever-present hazard. I've heard a number of keynotes of this forum talk about solutions and being focused on solutions. Um, I'd suggest that the first step to finding enduring solutions to this particular, um, to this particular hazard is perhaps asking the right questions in relation to this matter. And I'd suggest that that question is the same one that our former Prime Minister Paul Keating asked in Redfern when he challenged, um, when he challenged the crowd and he challenged non-Indigenous Australia to think about how you would feel if these things happened to you. And while racism was evident, it was also uneven. In other areas, there was strong evidence indicating the floods galvanized communities and broke down barriers between groups and the uh, groups within the community. Many of the people whom I spoke with highlighted the centrality of Indigenous leadership with notable examples from the Koori Mail in Mismore and the Jali Local Aboriginal Land Council in Ballina. It is clear that Indigenous leadership is central in disaster responses. We've seen this now in COVID and we've seen it in the floods. Given this, I can't help but ask myself, why hasn't Naomi Moran from the Koori Mail been asked to give a keynote address at one of these conferences? Why hasn't Chris Binge been invited, who's the CEO of the Jali Local Aboriginal Land Council to share their experiences? These are the experts. Oh, sorry, can I go back? Can you go back? I wasn't finished. Thank you. Um, other key learning, concentric circles of support exist and are activated in times of disaster. These concentric circles of support operate regardless of location or profession. When Aboriginal people are impacted, it is families, 
It is the families of those impacted, impacted who act first and provide relief and support. There then exists an outer layer of extended relations who can be mobilized to pro provide large scale support and importantly, advocacy. Finally, an unintended consequence of this project has been the revelation of research as a therapeutic intervention in the lives of participants. None of the people whom I spoke with had previously had an opportunity to talk about what happened um, and their experiences. While nervous to do so, they found solace, relief and healing through telling their stories, being heard and knowing that by doing so, they will continue to be heard through this research. It is worth pausing for a moment here and reflecting on my position within this project. As I said, my sisters are from Cabbage Tree Island and it was important for me to do this work. Um, it was important for me to use my academic skills, my academic training and my platform to be able to do this work, to find out what happened, to think about it deeply and then to come out and suggest and propose solutions and tell those people's stories. The fact that I had familiar um, family relations made it easy to access people and, uh, um, and meant that people from these areas, you know, people living with trauma were actually eager to talk to me because of that, um, because they, they knew me. In this way, my position is a, I guess, an, uh, an extension and, and also embedded within these concentric circles of support that we're talking about here, um, providing relief, playing our part. Finally, I'll end on something which was noticeable, but which was also, uh, was also unsaid. Uh, I should say in relation to the concentric circles of support, one of the people who I interviewed was a country woman of mine from back home in Garuga. Um, one of them was my cousin, one of them was my niece. Finally, I'll end on something noticeable, but unsaid, there exists a culture of resilience in Aboriginal communities. This culture of resilience allows communities to assume leadership roles in times of emergency and provides a platform for effective and timely recovery. People are hesitant, use the word resilience, you know, I'm using it, I'm putting it out there, elevating it, celebrating it, because it does capture the, the real kind of traits, the personalities and the, and the community cohesion that exists within Aboriginal communities makes them incredibly, incredibly resilient and incredibly proud of our people in that way. Thanks to all of those who shared their stories and trusted me to, um, uh, to tell their stories. I hope that through this presentation, others and the paper can put their stories out there and advocate for lasting change. And uh, finally, a shameless plug. Um, this is why we're going to undertake a new project called the National Indigenous Disaster Resilience Project. We're going to kick it off next year. It's going to go for four years. We're going to look at the experiences of Indigenous peoples all around the country who have been involved and recovered from hazards and been through emergencies, learn these lessons, put them together and develop the resources which we so desperately need and provide a policy platform to guide NGOs and governments in making decisions and preparing, helping communities prepare um, themselves and help help those who need to work with them to do so. Namale. Next, we welcome Matt Mason to the stage. Matt is a senior lecturer at the University of Queensland. He is a wind engineer and has spent most of his time studying cyclones and storms. But considering Matt is an engineer who loves stochastic and probabilistic modeling, He's also pretty good at the social sciences when required. Thank you, Matt. Uh, thank you, Kat. I will not, um, uh, I wouldn't say I was good at the social science. Uh, and some context to this, this is what Kat and I did together probably about 10 years ago. So she did all the social science. And I, what I was gonna say is compared to the other talks in this session, I'm gonna give you the heartless engineering so but I think it, it does link very much to how people people respond to the events because in events like cyclones and potentially floods as well where people sort of shelter from storms or try and remain safe is in their buildings so people have to feel that they are going to be safe in their buildings and this is where I guess engineers play a really important role in this um, so uh, that said what I'm going to talk about today are some lessons that were learnt uh, from Tropical Cyclone Tracy and the impact that it had. Uh, and what I'm going to focus on is the engineering lessons that were learned and some of the changes to engineering, uh, the, the way we engineer structures um, in response to this event. So there are obviously many other social uh, lessons that were learned from the event. So things that were done well and not so well, um, but I'm not gonna to touch on those. It's really gonna focus just the, on the, uh, the engineering. 
So, um, Cyclone Tracy, for many wouldn't have been around, some may have been, uh, occurred in 1974. Uh, you don't need to change it, I don't need to read that. Um, uh, the, the storm itself made landfall on the morning of uh, Christmas Day in 1974 up in Darwin, and it pretty much made the landfall right over the, the town of Darwin at the time and is really, you couldn't have picked a worse track for it to take. Uh, it was a very intense tropical cyclone. So um, for those interested in numbers, got down to a central pressure of 950 hect hectopascals, um, but it had, was a very small storm. So the radius to maximum winds was seven kilometers. And um, as just in general, the radius to maximum winds normally on the order of 20 to 30 kilometers. Um, so this is a very, very small storm, but made a very, very direct impact on uh, Darwin. So the, the red dot there is where the weather station is at the Darwin airport, or at least was at the time. Uh, it recorded a peak gust of 217 kilometers per hour, which puts it at about low end category four tropical cyclone, um, but it got knocked over just as the storm was coming ashore. So the, the best estimates are around 240 to 260 kilometers an hour as the gust wind speed. And that puts it at a top end category four storm. So this is a very, very strong storm that went through. Uh, and what it was, was that the wind speeds that were the, that are recorded, so that level wind speed is beyond what anything in this town, well, not, not anything, but the vast majority of structures in the town were designed to resist. Um, So the, looking then at what the impact that Tracy had, so there were 71 deaths associated with Cyclone Tracy. So 50 of those were on land, 21 were out in the uh, ocean. So people on boats, uh, about 650 injuries. And they're just for context, there was roughly around 40,000, a bit over 40,000 people in Darwin at the time. Uh, so looking at the, the engineering side of things, so about 60% of housing was completely destroyed uh, with 94% being uninhabitable. So only 6% of houses in the town were left habitable after the event. Uh, so as you would probably expect, if you have that sort of level of damage, there was failure to power, water, communication, and since sanitation runs on power, there was no sanitation either. Uh, so this becomes pretty problematic for a town like Darwin or a city like Darwin, because there is nothing you can go to very close. So uh, what ended up happening was about 35,000, probably a bit more than that actually, uh, of the residents had to be evacuated out of, uh, out of Darwin. And this at the time was the largest airlift uh, ever done in Australia. And this had to, this people were transported all over Australia uh, to cap, so major cities around Australia, uh, and this in and of itself was quite problematic for the the re recovery of those peoples. Uh, and many interviews sort of point to the the fact that this was um, this really hampered how they re re recovered from the event. And there were many people who didn't ever return. To Darwin after that. Uh, so financially, it cost about four to six hundred million at the time, uh, and if we put that in today's terms, uh, that would be an impact of about five billion dollars. And the the figure there is just showing the um, normalised the Insurance Council of Australia's normalised losses. So this is ju that's just insured losses uh, puts it at about the the third highest impact event uh, in Australia since this started being done back in the in 1967. So why why we study this one is because it's uh, a very very consequential event, uh, however you look at it really. Um, so then just to put some imagery to the type of damage that occurred during Tracy, the buildings up on, uh, on the left-hand side of your page are houses, and these are really the new houses. So they were the newest houses built within a couple of years of Cyclone Tracy coming ashore. So not what you would expect to happen to a building that's just been built. Um, and a couple of things came out of this is, and one was that, the newest houses were the worst impacted. So again, not something 
you would typically expect, uh, you would expect new buildings would respond better, but that was certainly not the case. And I'll go through in a couple of slides time, I'll sort of give you just some quick uh, engineering analysis of why that was indeed the case. Um, however, when we looked at the larger buildings, so these might've been hotel buildings or office buildings within the city, ra rather than having sort of 60% De completely destroyed and nearly everything else uh, com uh, quite severely damaged. Uh, these sort of engineered buildings, there was about five to 10% that were destroyed. So still quite a number of uh, buildings damaged um, with 80% having some level of damage to them. Now that's obviously not, again, not brilliant, but it's a heck of a lot better than 60% being completely destroyed. And Really, the reason behind this was that all these buildings had some engineering input in them. Up until the sort of mid 70s, when we were looking at residential construction, there was very little, if any, engineering guidance on how to do it. So uh, builders uh, learnt from their father or the whoever else was, uh, whoever they were working for, and they passed on the trade from one person to the other. And this is very good for being able to design and build for something that occurs quite often. So they, they knew what the regular conditions were in Darwin and they could build a, a house to, to withstand that. Um, however, it's not a very good way to design for events uh, that don't occur very often. Um, with, and the consequence was what we saw in Darwin. And this was certainly not something that was specific to Darwin. This is how we, houses were built everywhere in Australia and really everywhere around the world. Um, there was uh, very little input put into it. And really part of the reason was, I mean, houses are not, well, they're now very expensive, um, but uh, compared with other structures, the, the kind of prevailing thought was, well, houses are not particularly expensive. Uh, if there's a bit of damage, it can be repaired without really thinking about the flow on consequences of what happens when you lose a lot of houses. Um, but that all that said, engineered structures performed much, much better. Okay, so, so what went wrong? Uh, and the, the picture on the left uh, is essentially what was a big, one of the, the triggering factors for all this damage. So the new houses had new, used a different type of roofing material. The roofing material was really good if you apply one load to it. If you apply lots of cyclic loading to it, it was not very good. And so what you end up having is that type of failure. So the roof material coming over the bolts that held them in place and a decision had been made in when they built these houses is that they would rely on the fact that you had the roof there to give it a lot of additional structural resistance. So once you started losing the roof, you lost that additional structural re resistance and therefore everything ended up cascading down. So one very simple engineering, well not simple, but one very key engineering thing and we try and sort of instill in our students is that a structure is only as strong as its weakest link, right? So you have a small failure like this, you can trigger a whole lot of other damage. Um, and that, that unfortunately was what happened here. So um, the, what was really evident was that this kind of trial and error and sort of very slow process of maybe improving a structure based on what you or your boss had seen didn't prove to be a very successful way for us to continue um, designing our buildings. Oh, I forgot to put that in there. <laughs> anyway, um, there we go. There's the house getting damaged. All right. Um, so what happened next? So the response to this from, from an engineering perspective was that there was a moratorium on rebuilding. So it was very quickly seen that there was so much damage, we, we couldn't just, well, not we, uh, they, they couldn't just let people go back and rebuild in the same way, um, which uh, is a very, very difficult political decision, I think. Um, and it was really probably only something that could work because you've evacuated so much of your population. If you had people wanting to get back in their house and they could just drive down the road to try and get back in their house, you couldn't tell them you can't go back for three to six months because we're gonna, we're gonna do some analysis in the labs 
and come up with some new guidelines to, to look at how we rebuild. You would have people saying, I don't care about that. I just want to get back in my house, build something, right? Um, so there was a moratorium. So nothing started getting built for about six months. Uh, and through this process, quite a bit of work got done on trying to really diagnose what was the reason for failure and what were the solutions to trying to do better. Um, so this was a really a reimagining of how you design a house. Uh, and it, it moved it from being just this trial and error process to something that took quite a lot of engineering input into what you're going to do. Uh, and so this took, uh, so this was really taking engineering understanding and putting it in the design of houses. And this then got put into a regulatory framework that basically said that everyone building a house has to do it in a particular way. Uh, and th this is not necessarily put a nail here, put a screw here. It's these are the sort of thresholds of uh, what we expect the structure to be able to do. Uh, so this ended up taking um, six years in, sorry, it, it took two years for that to be completely regulated, but after six months, work started going. Uh, in Queen, it then spread to Queensland first, and in six years after Tracy, there was regulation within Queensland, and for the rest of Australia, regulation was about 14 years later. So not a quick process, but that being said, there was quite a lot of that that started being implemented much earlier than that. Um, so, but, there needs to be a continual updating. So we have new products all the time, new materials. So how we incorporate those into uh, the actual uh, design and building has to be continually upgraded. Um, so uh, again, the, the question then is asked, well, this is, that's all well and good, but where are the, the lessons actually learned? Uh, and one way of looking at this is to look at damage to structures after storms that have followed. Uh, and here we've got an example. So the, the damage over on the left was just some from Tracy. And then over on the right hand side, we have some newer houses uh, following Tropical Cyclone Ingrid, so the Northern Territory. And the top image there is a, a new house. And so the wind speeds were not exactly the same in this event, but we do see much better performance there. So the bottom image there was a, an, a house that was built before Tracy, but had been retrofit to try and remove some of the weaknesses in it. So it doesn't stop all the damage, but you don't have a complete failure of the structure. So in that particular example, you could potentially go back, put the roof back on, people can get back into the house. Um, similarly, after Cyclone Larry, uh, much more modern. So it, the wind speeds here again, not quite as strong, but still very strong wind, wind event. Uh, on the bottom there, we have a relatively new house. So it would have been a few built a few years before and we can see some very, very strong, uh, some very good performance. And think, doing things like shaping the roof as we've done, are things that we now know work well to minimize the loads on structures. And so these things have been done. Um, so, uh, and for those that like looking at graphs, these show a couple of different things, but uh, they're different areas. Blue is looking at the response of structures built before Tracy, red is looking afterwards. And in for all metrics, we can see that there is a, a relative improvement being done, seen through these events. So um, looking then at the lessons, uh, regulation of stringent building standards works, um, but it's regulation, but also certification that it's done. So it's not, a, not enough to just say, go ahead and do this. You need to unfortunately make sure people do, because around the world, there are many places with very good design regulations and poor implementation and that, that doesn't work well. Um, so I think the, the next couple uh, about the same. Um, so the point there about is that small periods of reflection prior to reconstruction can be extremely beneficial. They're often very hard to, to do, but they can be beneficial. But the actual implementation then has to be quite quick. So if you let it drag on, there becomes much less public will for this to occur. Um, so the implementation would be swift. And I won't say that any sort of disaster can present the same opportunities that Tracy did. Tracy was a very, very sort of special situation where there are uh, circumstances that allowed a lot of this to happen, which uh, realistically could not be repeated today. But I think the lesson sort of st stays there. Um, 
so but, and, but, and it, the only reason it was strong was because there was strong public and there was strong government support that this wouldn't happen again and we have to do what we can to ensure that happen that is the case um so just finally the, a couple of challenges that still sort of sit so building codes and standards are not the the answer to all these questions so building design regulations uh, are applicable to something that will be built tomorrow not everything that's there now so there needs to be other solutions just uh, other than just um, waiting for the damage to occur and then putting something back better. We have to have retrofit programs and other um, things that ensure that we try and take care of the legacy uh, buildings, uh, the legacy building stock so that we can ensure that the, the resilience or the this type of damage isn't going to occur. Um, the other thing is temporal effects. Um, Tracy was now 48 years ago. So if you look like we'll, we'll, an engineer will tell you that the regulations required in the few years after Tracy are great. If you build that house now, it's gonna stand up. But one that was actually built after Tracy is nearly 50 years old. It's not gonna perform how it was. So this has to be revisited and we have to look at how we, we ensure that the strength and the resilience of structures continues through time, not just at that point of time of reconstruction. Um, and I'll just leave the other ones there because I think I've probably gone way over time. So um, thank you very much. So next, it's my great pleasure to welcome the post 2022 flood research team to the stage. They're all female and all female power team. So we've got Professor uh, Associate Professor Mel Taylor and Associate Prof Fiona Miller from Macquarie Uni. Mel's an experienced researcher in the behavioral and social aspects of natural hazards research and the leader of the team. Fiona's a human geographer specializing in the social and equity dimensions of climate change. We've got Prof Kim Johnson and Associate Prof Anne Lane from Queensland University of Technology. Kim is an expert in stakeholder and community engagement and has experience in projects investigating community engagement for resilience. Anne is a social scientist with expertise in dialogue, organizational storytelling, and intersections with engagement. Dr. Barbara Ryan from the University of Southern Queensland is a communications and disaster management expert who has been researching disaster communication and behavior for 20 years. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and hello to everybody on live stream as well. We haven't forgotten you. Um, we're going to talk about this post-disaster research. It's uh, independent social research that's being conducted with funding from NHRA and supported by New South Wales SES and Queensland Fire and Emergency Services, and we're very grateful for that support. Um, you will have heard Josh Whitaker talking yesterday about post-disaster research, and this research project um, followed a similar approach. Um, of two phases where we have interviews that we've just around the end of completing those and we're following off with the survey shortly as well. The goal in this project was to hear community voices, to understand and to walk with people through their lived experience um, of the floods in 2022. And some people have had one flood, some people have had multiple floods, and indeed if you go back to the previous year, some people at the time of our interviews will have had had four floods already. Um, I do want to say thank you to NHRA, in particular, Kat Haynes and Nicola Moore for their work in the node managers, because uh, alongside the support we've had for emergency services, we have a number of other stakeholders who've got interest in this work, including Resilience New South Wales um, and the local councils as well. So, our goal was to conduct 200 interviews in this first phase of the research, and we've divided into two teams. So we've got our Queensland team um, of Kim, Anne, and Barb, and they took uh, different routes with uh, folk, uh, field work and with virtual interviews. So we've done a combination of virtual interviews, and probably at least half of our interviews now, I think, have been done through field work. Uh, in Queensland, we've been as far west as Dolby and as far north as Maribor and uh, Gympie areas. And in New South Wales, myself and Fiona have been leading um, those interviews and we've um, conducted our field work in the Northern Rivers, but we have been interviewing people from all the other areas in New South Wales that have been flooded, um, including around Sydney, Central Coast, um, Mid-North Coast, 
um, and all those other areas in between. We had our we, uh, we achieved our sample through a mix of uh, media, and again, I'd like to thank Nathan, Beth, uh, and the team from NHRA for helping us with social media, radio media, to actually um, interest people in the research. And then people, some people uh, filled out a registration form, and we uh, interviewed them through that contact, and others we found through word of mouth, through community con contacts, and elsewhere. Our project's ending at the end of February, so that's when the report is going to be written by, and we will be doing academic papers and hopefully finding a way to share the data so that it can be reanalyzed uh, into the future. At the moment, we've just finished our interviews, or we're just about finishing our interviews. We haven't had much opportunity as a team to actually talk with each other about what we found. So what we're going to talk about today are not findings, but we're really giving you some really early insights from some of this preliminary sort of uh, brainstorming we've been doing and what we're actually going to do essentially is have a little bit more of an extended brainstorm in front of you live um, it'll hopefully look like there's some order there but it is really an illusion because really we are free freewheeling um, as a group here and I don't know where we're going to go I've got some trigger words and I'm hoping that the team is going to just take it on from there um, I'd also like to just finalize uh, this with uh, some thanks to our transcribers who who have done a fantastic job so Ellie and Cole and his team and I'd like to ask the IT people if they could put up uh, the slides now. So in the background, we're going to have a set of slides that have been provided to us from some of our participants. I'd like to thank them for their time, for all the participants for their time, but also for those that supplied us with these photographs and gave us permission to use them and indeed name them in some of these cases as well. I hope you'll find this interesting because you'll appreciate, I'm sure you already do, that just like all our stories are different, all these floods are different as well, um, are very different. And I'd also like to say just by Amy, um, your presentation, we found a lot of, I think, very similar types of findings, you know, the healing from actually having that process of talking and being listened to, um, and, uh, you know, indeed, there are many community issues around in-group, out-groups, um, and other sorts of things in there as well. So I do think we, we are seeing very similar types of uh, things in both our sets of data. So I'm going to go to the team and pretend I know what I'm doing now. So first trigger word, guys. Um, information and warnings. I don't think we can really um, go without starting in that in that uh, that subject area. Okay, um, I'll start. Um, and remembering, I'm I. We interviewed um, a certain area, so it's it's obviously we're going to go through um, the four different um, areas. Um, people that we interviewed were taken by surprise. And they were taken by surprise because even though they acknowledged they received information, it didn't resonate with them. It was either not localised enough or it wasn't... Um, it wasn't... Um, relevant to them or based on prior experience they believed it they wouldn't flood and it was surprising how many people actually said I've lived here for 20 years I've lived here for 30 years it didn't flood or this time it was different they relied a lot on neighbors uh, Facebook groups um, the bomb news and other groups such as Higgins uh, and there was uh, there was a, a, you know, people felt that depending on the source, there was a lot of um, risk aversion, if that's the right word, or, or unwillingness by some sources of information not to tell how it actually is going to, to be. And so therefore they relied on other sources. So there was certainly a loss of, of, of trust in some of the sources for that information. Uh, finally, there was a general lack of ability to translate the information they were receiving into actions that were relevant for them. So, for example, um, the river warnings, the amount of rainfall, a lot of people didn't understand what that meant or they weren't able to say, well, if the river reaches this point, this means my property is going to be inundated. Um Visuals are really big um, to emerge from the study. Um, people would go out and, and have a look at um, what the water was doing. Um, they also, 
I interviewed people mainly west of Brisbane, so a lot of country people involved in that um, subsample. Um, they really rely on the river gauges. And so when a river gauge breaks down or um, is um, faulty or not reporting, then they really um, uh, feel a loss of that. A couple of, um, of the participants relied on cameras that were attached to gauges in some of some areas that have really experienced terrible floods in the past cameras have been attached to some gauges and so that visual was uh, became really important as well and my impression was in in some cases because of the lack of timely information there was as there always is um, a reliance on neighbours and the comments that people are making around them, which often tend to be reassuring, you know, it's not going to be as bad as 2017 or whatever it was. Um, so I think, again, we saw, you know, we expected to see that, but I think that had more of a, a salience, I think, for a lot of people because it was outside their experience. Just was going to add to that one as well. What we did come a lot across was a sense of fatalism um yeah we knew we were going to flood we flooded before what we didn't know is this flood would be different and the way that it was different was not only how high it went but how quickly it went and also this is something i've quickly had to become an expert in um the type of water with which they were flooded so it wasn't just necessarily the, the riverine stuff but there was an awful lot of reference to sewage um, which just adds a, yeah, and stormwater runoff. Um, and people were saying that they thought that the, perhaps the reasons that they hadn't received accurate warnings was because things had changed since the last bad flood in terms of where things had been built, uh, recent developments, people who'd created structures without permission or without proper notification, so they hadn't been factored in, or particularly where there'd been large developments on floodplains of um, low cost housing because we need houses and we need them quickly. So there was a few people commenting that they thought that maybe this had led in fact to the outdating of the relevance of the warnings that they'd had previously or their experiences. Yeah, that came up a lot. Um, one country town I went to, um, there was a levee bank had been built up the creek um, on a farm. And previous to that, the water seemed to go down into this shallow spot, overflow into this shallow spot and skirt around the town. The levee bank was built across the shallow spot, so it forced all of the water to go down the creek. And so suddenly there was this um, a, a raising of depth of the creek that hadn't happened before. Yeah, just pick up on that point around floodplain development. Um, we spent a bit of time around Woodburn, a uh, very controversial um, case there where the um, upgrade of the M1 has uh, acted to intensify the um, flood and the um, period of inundation. I just want to reflect on this um, sort of strong attention that emergency management and disaster management agencies give to issues of warning and preparedness. And I think uh, we need to reflect on this sort of increased stress on personal responsibility uh, for preparedness. And I think one of the things that came out of many of the interviews that um, we conducted in the Northern uh, Rivers region was there's obviously great variation in terms of people's level of preparedness from nothing uh, to hypervigilance. And um, I met one uh, woman um, who, uh, whose father was a lifelong SES member. She had been a lifelong SES member. She had extensive um, historically informed knowledge of floods. She was best case scenario in terms of level of preparedness and hypervigilance. And yet she was completely inundated and lost um, many of her possessions. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge that there are limitations in terms of the level of preparedness that individuals uh, can take on when we're confronting these um, catastrophic events such as this. Um, yeah. Okay, second trigger word. Um, forgotten, forgotten people, forgotten communities. Anybody want to start with that one? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, what we've seen, well, what we observed a lot on 
um, people talked about is now like seven, eight months on from the event. Um, I observe very little evidence of recovery. Um, people shared very distressing stories of uncoordinated, inappropriate, delayed, slow response from formal agencies. Um, and the re-traumatizing experience of having to tell their stories again and again and again to different government agencies to get access to the most basic information or assistance. Um, and what we've seen, and Biami touched on this as well, is that community agencies or communities have self-organized and stepped into this void. And uh, we see a lot of community run hubs. Some of these entirely run by volunteers, you know, seven months on. And whilst some of these responses are sort of amazing, and we've got a lot to learn from these communities and the way they self-organize. I think in the case of these complex disasters that have long-term consequences, there's a limit to how much uh, communities can shoulder the burden of recovery. And so we're seeing high levels of fatigue and um, harm associated with the work they're doing to support their communities and a sense of being forgotten uh, as well, so. Yeah, um, the, I, I sort, of sort of see that forgotten level of forgottenness on a spectrum because we did see this across the project. So I'll start at the worst end and these guys will take you up. Um, I interviewed a lot of people who um, said things like, and this is one quote, but I, I came across this again and again. This wasn't their first rodeo where were they? And um, what they were looking for was not even uh, concrete help, but just to be acknowledged that they um, had done it tough and um, at a local level. So Kim and Anne have got some really nice stories from, from some of their interviews, but the ones I did were um, around mainly local level of government where um, it seemed like all the resources, once, once the, there were a few weeks beyond the um, recovery, beyond the, the impact, all the resources were removed and then they had to plough their way through the bureaucratic um, nonsense of local government to find out even the name of the person they had to talk to who would then pledge to call them back and nobody would call back. Um, so now I'll hand over to Anne and um, Kim because they have some really nice things to say. I, I don't, we don't want to be doom and gloom all the time, do we? Well, <laughs> not necessarily nice things all the time. So I'll just kind of come to a midpoint. A lady I spoke to lived in a part of a town that we visited, which was geographically separate and distinct from it. And she said her experience was so bad, so negative, that it destroyed her faith in the community and she could no longer stay there and she'd had to move. So there was no one to help her or her disabled partner. One thing that made it particularly bad for her, which does kind of tie in as well with our previous conversation about getting warnings and accurate warnings, um, she had actually built her house so that the floor was one meter above the flood level. Now, you don't have to be an expert to think, okay, that sounds pretty good, pretty useful. It flooded to the eaves. Now, you might say, well, that's just bad luck, isn't it? She was so distressed, she decided to sell up and move on. And it was only at that point, ladies and gentlemen, that she had a visit from a real estate agent and said, we can't sell your house because you've actually built it below the flood level. There was a heated conversation, as you might imagine. What turned out to be the case was that the council had actually changed the flood levels. No one had been told, no one had been notified. So this lady's house, the floor level was actually 1.4 meters below the new flood level. She had no idea. And I'm sure you can imagine the impact that finding had on the value of the house that she was able to get when she did sell. So this whole idea of being forgotten, not involved in things, being left to one side, um, just absolutely tragic. And the layer of complexity and pain that that inflicted on people 
after the original flood event was something that was a recurring theme. Okay, Kim, I hope you've got some happy stories. Sure, I have. Anyone from Brisbane City Council here? Well done. Yeah. <laughs> and I say that because uh, the people in the metropolitan region that I interviewed, after the flooding, um, and as you can imagine, there's a lot of cleanup and, and not being forgotten, they said, and, and it came up time and time again, that local, oops, local members who put up a barbecue or dropped in water or, or this was all the local councillors and, and people from Brisbane City Council came into their area to specifically try and support them. That was seen and that was noticed. And, and little things, and that's the thing I think about being forgotten. It was like, I see you, I know you're in pain, I, I can do something little to help you. And it was very powerful. So, yeah. Okay, I think we've been given the wrap up. Um, we could talk for five hours with no problem whatsoever. Um, so it's just, well, cats, cats there to stop us. While she's coming, I'm just going to talk about vulnerability, if I may. Just people being, no, no, help leaving people a bit more vulnerable than they were beforehand, which is unintended, um, including kind of, you know, that rushed clear up um, that we talked about a bit yesterday, people rushing to help and people not having time to process the losses, uh, especially having seven months down the track, um, the time to think about how nice it would have been to have had the contents of their kitchen that could have been saved. Um, caravans that have been you know a fantastic for people to have accommodation on their properties but now they're living at ground level rather than on the first level of their flood designed house um, insurance which leaves people paralyzed while they're waiting the mud army yes again yeah we're going to talk about we're going to override your cat just going to let one, him say one more thing just one point on the mud army one of the really strong themes that came out of of post-flood support and post-flood help was the impact of strangers coming into people's houses and making people that were traumatised make decisions about things. And there was this, this reoccurring theme of time. We need time. People need time to make decisions. People need time to process what had actually happened to them and, and, and the loss and things like that. The other comment I wanted to make was about people's possessions being out in the front yard. As a, as a community, we need to stop, what did you call them? Human raccoons. People going through people's possessions. A number of um, community members talked about how seeing their possessions out on the front yard and people coming in and picking through them actually exacerbated a lot of the trauma that they'd gone through. So um, that's just something I thought was quite important. I, I just I just have to. So there is so much from this. Um, Bayami was telling the story about the young fellas that came in and I noticed that the questions they were asking were really specific and that's exactly what the respondents in our um, interviews have um, talked about. Like if we, we go in and say to them, what would you like us to do? People are stressed, they can't think of what they need, but those young fellas asked, would you like us to do this, a certain thing? And she could say then yes or no. It was an easy decision for her to make. And so that's what we've got, get, got to get better at as well. Gentle help, I think we... Okay, um, I'll just quickly get Bayami and Matt back up on the stage and we'll just have uh, one question each, I think, and then we'll go off to afternoon tea. Yeah. So I'm going to ask the first question again, um, and this is to Bayami, I think. Are we learning the right lessons from disaster events? Are we learning lessons? Are we? Um, that's a good question. Uh, uh, yes and no. Mm. Uh, yes. Uh, things like the, you know, the, the research that's been done, like that, like we know the knowledge, we know things that work, we know things that don't work. Um, and, and, you know, what, what makes things worse? What makes, um, 
recovery worse, uh, you know, emergency response worse. We, you know, we, we know what works and what doesn't. It's kind of the wrong question though, because the question to me, like the, it's, it's not about whether we know what works or what doesn't, because we know a lot of it, sorry. Um, thank you. We know a lot of that stuff. The question is how capable are our institutions are of responding and instituting what works when they're doing something that doesn't. You know, there's such slow moving beasts. They, you know, there's this, there's, there's just, like, they're impervious to, to, um, to, to writing wrongs, to operating differently, to asking different questions. So the question is what prevents our institutions from changing when the business case is so clear that they must? Yeah. Um, can I just add yeah. to that? I think um, looking at disasters in isolation from these wider structural problems that we confront in society is a real danger. Um, what the disaster, the, the floods have revealed is um, that those who are already struggling, who are socioeconomically disadvantaged, those who were affected by the housing crisis, by the mental health crisis, by the fact that our health systems are run down, that we've got unresolved issues around land rights, et cetera, et cetera, poor planning systems and so on. Those are the ones who are most affected. And so we need to address disasters in, in, um, with some awareness of these wider structural issues. Yeah, can't be treated separately. Yeah. Did anyone else want to make a comment on that one? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so again, I'll respond as an engineer. Uh, I think, say, and for the example that I talked about today for Cyclone Tracy, a lot of what happened after Tracy worked in some sense because it was one thing we were trying to fix. We were trying to fix how you design houses. Um, flooding is a much different problem because it's not just the building or the building regulators there's an interplay between how you build but where you build and that then pulls in local councils planning agencies and you have to then get everyone to work together in a way that um, that ensures you get the end result is what you want so I think the some of the lessons are being learned I think individual little bits get learned here and there but one thing I always find whenever I go and do post event damage assessment it always throws up many questions and we keep going in and there keep being lots of questions that get asked of the event and then in some senses that's a bit sort of disheartening because you keep going well are we getting nowhere um but uh I, I think uh, little bits keep getting chipped away and I'm, unfortunately I don't think that's that's good enough but that seems to it we seem to be learning some things but often when some things get learned other things get unlearned or whatever the correct word for unlearned is. Um, Matt we'll stay with you for a minute there. One very quick comment. Okay. I, think, I think we have learned but I think the wrong people have learned. Um, I think where the learnings need to go they haven't managed to get through they haven't managed to make it through to that somebody that can do something taking action so that's where our report's going to come in I reckon we're going to make sure that the people who need to know this stuff do get to hear the stories that we've heard so Matt there was a question you published a report in 2016 on cyclone Dina making landfall in present southeast Queensland um, politically the, this is it's controversial it's difficult how do we learn from the past if politicians don't listen to what we're telling them. You ask that question to a political scientist, <laughs> not an engineer. As, as a wind engineer. As a wind engineer, <laughs> I'm very good at answering that question. Um, I don't know. And again, well, just reflecting back on, on Tracy, a lot of that worked because there was a lot of impetus and desire at every level of government to make change. Uh, and if, if you have that situation, I think it was still difficult like it, it wasn't I don't think it was an easy process then for the change that happened to happen but there was will and people wanted to do it so how you actually convince people to sort of fess up to the inconvenient truths I, I, I won't be able to give you any useful information on that but I get I mean that's that's sort of where you you have to get I guess um, 
Yeah. Uh, this is a question to either of the post flood the team or Miami. Um, you both said how beneficial the sort of um, almost research counseling role that these interviews have played with people. But you know, we only get to speak to an, a fraction of the people. You know, what can we do to sort of try and get you know a way to hear to let people talk to hear their stories on a bigger on a bigger scale? Um, so. Uh, to respond quickly, um, it's uh, remembering also that that some people don't want to talk. Um, you know, being open to have these conversations and sharing your stories, it um, you know it's filled with anxiety and vulnerability and stress, um, and some people aren't ready for that. Uh, so really, you're talking about making available the option to speak with people um, who are ready and willing and able. And the question then is, you know, it's kind of a question of like uh, sitting with someone and telling a story, but making sure that they feel really heard, you know, um, and there are structured ways to do that. You know, certainly the methods that I'm um, developed there, they're trauma-informed, almost kind of counselling um, techniques, but that you can adapt and apply in the context of research. And they're actually really effective because you can get really deep into people's experiences in a really safe, transformative way. It enriches the data that comes out of it, but also creates a really positive experience between the researcher and participant. Um, and in the context of the work that I do, working with Aboriginal communities, um, that can only be safely and adequately done with another Aboriginal person. Yeah. 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 I was just going to say that um, a lot of our participants did reflect that they felt it was the first time they'd had the opportunity to really process and reflect on what happened to them. But I think that now, and we've talked about this as a, as a research group, that we have a lot of responsibility to ensure that the stories have some change because a lot of people agreed to participate in our research to try and change something in the future. So to, and, and for us, we've got this huge responsibility to make sure that, that what comes out of our research does, does lead to change. And that's really the, the premise under which they share their stories with us. Yeah. And we shouldn't have to be doing this anyway. There should be a mental health structure that supports these people. Um, my last interview was with a woman who was ter terribly traumatised. The only way she could get mental health was by paying $500 to a psychiatrist. And she wasn't able to get much follow-up. Um, and the conversation that we had with her was upsetting all around. And um, it was, but it was, she said, thank you so much for hearing my story. Um, I needed that. I think one thing I wanted to add actually is the um, the, the persistence um, that people have to have to get help. Um, we certainly came across, I know as a team in, in a number of different areas, but it's the, you know, the flood, then the clear up, then the two years of paperwork, um, almost like some of the processes are in place to, to encourage you to give up at some point and either take the payout or go away. Um, and of course, the people who need that help the most are sometimes the ones who are functioning least well. And, and I guess uh, in our research, whilst we haven't interviewed children, a number of parents talked about um, the traumatic effect of the floods on children and the lack of support and mental health support for children in particular. And that's obviously something that needs a lot more attention. Yeah. Okay, great. I think we have to stop it there unless you had anything burning, one last burning thing you wanted to say. We're 10 minutes over. So um, <laughs> I think we will call it there. Thank you everyone so much. Thank you to our panel and our speakers. And thank you very much to the audience. Thank you. All right, just while everyone's getting settled, I just want to let you know, please have Slido out. Um, this session is a little bit different. There's no presentations. It's a panel session. We won't be taking questions from the floor, however. I'm putting the audience to work. 
So in this session, it is a panel session. I'll invite panel members up fairly soon. Um, these are preset questions that the panel members have had a bit of a time to think about. Some of them have thought about, Alan not so much. Um, and I'm going to put the same questions to you in polls on Slido. So open up Slido, please make sure that it says Boulevard Auditorium at the top, not Boulevard B1. And please ignore the Q&A tab. We are not using Q&A. If you put a question in there, it will not get answered. We'll be using polls. There's a, another tab for polls. So I'll be putting some polls up for you to respond to. I just wanted to let you know that um, all, the, all the responses we'll be collecting in this session to the questions I will put to you shortly. Um, I'm going to collate them and summarize them and we'll share them back in an article in the NHRA newsletter. All right, so I think we'll get started formally. So I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're gathering, the Turrbal and Yagara people, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And for those who haven't met me yet, my name is Blythe McLennan. I'm a Node Research Manager for Natural Hazards Research Australia, and I'm absolutely delighted to be chairing this session. Uh, the theme of this session is workforces and communities of the future. And this is no small topic, um, and this session is a little bit shorter than the ones we've had this morning. And so that's why we were not including a Q&A session. Uh, so we have about an hour and we'll finish at quarter to four. So the panel is responding to three broad preset questions that I've posed to them ahead of time. Um, and as I said, I'll pose the same questions to you. Just a note of housekeeping in the way that we'll be using Slido. Your responses are going to be shared up here on the screen. They are not moderated. So please, everybody play nicely and be constructive and be succinct in your responses as much as possible. You're going to be on display. Just before I introduce the panel, I just want to take a tiny little bit of your time to set the scene for the questions that they're responding to. Um, and I'm going to start with some things that we already know about the EM workforce. So we know that the environment around emergency management is changing. And it's becoming more complex and dynamic and uncertain. And we know that that has implications for the workforce, for workforce planning and management, and for the way we work together and coordinate and collaborate. We know that the nature of work itself is changing, both paid and voluntary, um, influenced by a host of different factors, um, not least of which is the impacts of COVID pandemic, which we don't yet know what the longer term impacts of that are gonna be. We know that much of the current emergency management workforce are volunteers, and that includes volunteers with the fire emergency services, with NGOs, with community organization, um, and those informal emergent spontaneous volunteers that reach out to help outside of organizations. We also know that how we understand what that emergency management workforce is, is shifting as well, with a growing understanding of community resilience, of cultural knowledge and caring for country, of the importance of shared responsibility and diversity and inclusion. And underlying that all, of course, we know that with the influence of climate change, intensifying natural hazards, demographic change, amongst many other trends, that what Australian society needs and probably expects of the emergency management workforce in the next 10 to 20 years, whatever that workforce looks like, is likely to be different from what it is today. And so the challenge that we've set for the panel today, and for you also by your responses on Slido, is to reflect on three broad questions. So what does the emergency management workforce need to look like in 20 years time? Lots of different aspects to that question. What does the sector need to do to build a future ready workforce? Lots of different elements to that question as well. And what does the sector most need from research to be able to enable and support building a future ready workforce? So these are all really big questions and there's a lot of different directions that the conversation could go in. And so I'm quite fascinated to see where the panel is going to take us today. So without further ado, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to our panel members and invite them up to the stage. I'll wait till I know who's sitting where before I introduce them.
All right, I'll introduce people from left to right, which means I'll be jumping around my notes. Okay. Um, Alan Slipovich is Deputy Chief Officer, Bushfire for CFA, um, um, worked in fire management in New Zealand and Tasmania and has been with CFA since I think 2012. Celeste Young is a Senior Policy Officer at the Department for Emergency Services, Fire and Emergency Services in WA. Many here will know her in her former role as a researcher at Victoria University. Uh, Celeste here today to um, talk about um, some of her research around workforce, most recently work focused on diversity and inclusion. Next, we have Amanda Nixon. Amanda is Senior Manager for Initiatives at Volunteering Queensland. And Volunteering Queensland has quite a strong role within the Queensland structure in coordination and planning around disaster and emergency volunteering. Next, we have Ellie Bird. So Ellie is a councillor on Lismore City Council, and she's an executive director of Resilient Lismore. We're very lucky that Ellie has been able to join us today in the midst of the reconstruction and recovery work that's currently underway in Lismore. We next are joined by Andrew Short. Andrew is Assistant Commissioner with Queensland Fire and Emergency Services. He's a Commissioner for State Emergency Service. He's also Commander State Operations, which is a rotated rostered role. And prior to that, he's actually Assistant Commissioner for Human Capital Management at QFES. So this is right up his alley. And last but not least, we have Ricky Archer. Ricky is CEO of Nailsma. That's the North Australian Indigenous Land and Sea Management Alliance. He's a Jungan man, did I say it correctly? Jungan man from the Western Tablelands regions of North Queensland. So could I please have Slido put up on the screen? All right, the poll is open. You're welcome to respond to it. As you're going, uh, we're building a word cloud of key words here to describe the future emergency management workforce. So please, as the panel is responding to this question as well, you can pick out key words from their responses and put them up and you can repeat responses to, to grow the words and make them more prevalent in the word cloud. So with the panel, I might begin with Ellie. <laughs> Delight, thanks. So question, what does the emergency management workforce need to look like in 20 years time? Okay, um, I was sitting on a seat just before getting ready to come up here and um, this morning, because my time is quite uh, poor at the moment, I wrote some very good notes that I promptly left behind. <laughs> so everything will be off the cuff, um, but that is pretty apt given the uh, recovery that I'm living through and that quite often in Lismore, in the epicentre of the disaster that's impacted the Northern Rivers, things are still relatively off the cuff. So I have experience from 2017 and 2022, responding as a community organisation uh, on Ridgeable rival country in the heart of the Bundjalung Nation. Uh, earlier today, we heard a good um, presentation from um, Miami, I'm not sure if I've got your name wrong, apologies, about some of the story of the Northern Rivers. Um, what that makes me reflect on those two experiences that I have lived through is the importance of resourcing communities to be our own disaster emergency management and recovery organisations into the future. So we need to ensure that communities have the skills and ability to respond to disasters. We need to ensure that communities broadly have the skills and abilities to care for and support each other after disasters. And we really need to think about how we're going to bring our entire complexity of community into the conversation about emergency management and recovery. So, yeah, it needs to be broad. It needs to be um, easy to access. And there needs to be fast and effective pathways for people within communities to find their places and spaces within emergency management response and recovery. Wonderful, thank you. I have a funny feeling that Amanda might follow that up quite well, so I'll ask Amanda now. Uh, I just want to apologise up front. I'm going to use notes. If I don't use notes, I'm going to take you around the moon. I'll take you everywhere <laughs> before we get to the destination we have to get to. So first of all, when we think 
um, of emergency of the um, emergency management workforce, we tend to think more of those formal organisations such as SES, QFES, and those people that come into our communities to support us at times of disasters. So we do want to recognise that those organisations will continue to have a role and they will always play a role in our, in our communities. In, in the next 20 years, they will still be there. So we know that these organisations will continue to remain agile and they will think of ways that they can move their organisations forward and continue to respond to those uh, increasing disasters and the impacts it has on our communities. So while we see these, these sorts of organisations will continue to play a role, what we also know is most likely what's going to happen is it's going to get harder and harder for them to respond and be in these communities at, at times that communities are expecting them. We know that a lot of communities, we've already heard today, that a number of communities get quite angry, they get frustrated, they feel left behind when these organisations aren't there to support them. So what we feel is needed is we need to start to broaden that definition and start to look a little bit more about what emergency, uh, what we actually see as an emergency management workforce. And so for us, what that actually is about is looking more at place capacity instead of response capacity. Um, we need to broaden our view on that. We need to see about, look at how we support and encourage um, our communities to be more involved and more able to support their own, um, to support themselves at times of disasters and crisis, particularly in the immediate, um, when the immediate response from government isn't available. We see the need for volunteering um, involving organisations and other NGOs in our local community to also be at the table as well. So at the moment, we have very formal structures where we have those formal partners that sit at the table with us and we talk about what we're going to do, what our response is. Within our communities, we have a wealth of knowledge. We have so many organisations that are there. A lot of the organisations may not have the capacity to support uh, support us, but there are going to be organisations out there that will have capacity. So what we can see is those organisations, we need to be supporting those organisations in coming together and supporting greater planning for us. And let's start to talk about the resources that they can start to share and how they can assist us in the delivery. Many times in department in volunteering Queensland, what has happened is in this previous event, we had 300 organisations, which includes corporates, and but there were non-government organisations and volunteer involving organisations involved. They put their names forward and said, we want to come and play. We want to come and support our community in its recovery. Only a handful of those organisations were utilised. We refer them on, we keep them on a list, and that's where they stay. So we need to start to see those organisations being brought to, the, brought to the table and being supported in identifying how to support the, uh, their community's needs. Sorry, just checking the notes. We also know that spontaneous volunteers are going to continue. Uh, they will continue to emerge. They're not going away. So people are going to step forward and support your communities at time, our, our communities at times of disaster. Um, formal models of how we manage that workforce will still need to be in place. So that, and the reason why we say that is there are going to be times that your communities or our communities are going to be very overwhelmed with those offers of support. So we're going, when, it, when that happens, we need to find ways to make sure that that can be managed better. We also know that there are going to continue to be that, those informal types of volunteering that are going to be in place and emerging groups. So what we saw in the, um, the recent floods um, in Southeast Queensland, we had over 30,000 volunteers register within uh, a week. So as soon as government comes out and says we need help, people will, people will register on our EV crew website and they'll say we're there and we're ready to help. The sad thing is at that moment for, for us, we only got to mobilise about 20% of that 30,000 workforce. And what we know will happen is a lot of the times when people register, they will start to remove their interest from registering because things change. They're not used fast enough, um, life goes on, or most importantly, they start to self-mobilise and they'll get stuck in and they'll do it regardless of what help we're providing them. So, um, and what we, we are seeing, so at this moment in time, we are seeing 
we don't know if it's a growth, but we, we do think people are starting to move more towards the informal volunteering and that's going to continue. And what we're seeing it as, it's like the pendulum. So the more that controls that we put in place, the more restrictions or frameworks that we put in place, it makes it harder for people to volunteer and they're going to find ways around that. So now what we're now seeing is people starting to pull that pendulum back. So they're starting just to self-mobilise and find ways that they can support their community. Uh, so there need to be stronger structures in place to assist with that. So the one thing that the message we want to provide is let's not be frightened of those self-mobilising and informal models that are going to start, uh, that are emerging in our communities and are really playing an important role. Thank you very much. It's so much fun having the power of choosing who gets to speak next. Um, and it's fascinating watching the word cloud develop. That's, that's great, thank you. Um, Ricky, I might throw to you next. Thanks, so I think it's important just to set the context from uh, a NALSMA perspective that some of the things I'll talk about uh, reflect on what happens in North Australia and, and more specifically some of the remote um, Aboriginal communities we work with across the North Australia. We've been having a discussion, you know, previously through the, the Bushfires and Natural Hazards CRC and, and uh, translating some of those opportunities into current research projects. And what we're finding is the needs that, that were there five, six years ago are still here today. And some of the things I, I wanted to you know, explore further in terms of this question here is setting the, the context that it's a bit different in remote North Australia. We're starting at a different starting point to, I suppose, regional and, you know, other more populated um, towns and cities. And, and from an agency perspective, we're kind of a few years behind, um, but we've got I think some challenges that exist, but we've also got some opportunities. And in some of the discussions this morning, uh, it was mentioned, I think, um, from Ollie, that there are some differences in the North and South, one of them um, directly relating to land tenure and, and ownership of land and what land is managed by Aboriginal people. And I think in, in hearing, again, thread throughout all the discussions, um, We've talked about and heard about the opportunity to, you know, in, increase capacity in the use of technology, um, you know, through comms uh, infrastructure, etc., and 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 remote sensing, um, and just taking some of those examples in a real world, um, you know, application is that remote North Australia does not have the same infrastructure as our you know, mates down the road. And it's a really key point in terms of any emergency response aspect. The key thing that we've been working on at Nailsma with a number of partners, um, some of them you heard from this morning, is the opportunity to integrate the roles of Indigenous land and sea managers and rangers across North Australia to play more of a high level role in what happens on their country. Not just what happens in terms of management, but um, you know, the processes around how you respond to something. And we've had the opportunity to, to get uh, some of our colleagues, um, you know, QFES and, and others, our other colleague, Mike Wassing is not here, but to have high level opportunities, getting people face to face with people on the ground, um, you know, across all of these agencies has really been pivotal. And we don't get the chance to do that as much. That's why I was really looking forward to, you know, the opportunities out of this forum. The future for, for from Nailsman's perspective, based on the work we've been doing, is that Indigenous groups, rangers, organisations out there have been telling us to find opportunities where they can be more involved in, in the planning, in the response, in strategic direction, just in everything. If you've got you know, disasters and emergencies happening in their backyard, you know, at least knock on the front door before you get out there. And we're finding this, this is common. Uh, again, wanted to set that context that that's uh, what we're finding in North Australia. 
I think some of the um, opportunities are scalable, um, but the, the problem at a national scale is not one size fits all. There are over 1,000 FTEs um, through the Indigenous Ranger Program in the various states, um, Queensland and, and WA invest in ranger groups that have uh, a role to look after country and, and aspects of that include, um, you know, really high levels of traditional knowledge and knowing um, details of, of, of the land and, and sea environments. I think that's a, a big opportunity in terms of when you look at, um, you know, how much that on ground knowledge plays in terms of a, a response. Um, so look, my, my future looks like a much integrated uh, approach where you've got um, traditional owners and indigenous groups, indigenous rangers having a, a much more stronger role in emergency management. The key thing to that, it sounds easy to do and develop, but um, we need to realize how important building trust and relationships uh, is towards that. And, and that's why, again, I point back to those opportunities where we can meet with senior officials in agencies and departments. And sometimes it's not about showing what the opportunities and data is and, and saying why and, and how. Uh, you just need to build some trust and um, over a period of time. And I think reflecting back on, on this um, phase of post-CRC, it's good to have a 10 year time frame to do things because that's how long it takes. Thank you. I think I might throw to Andrew now. Oh, thank you. Uh, a great opportunity to be here with you. Uh, interesting listening to the other speakers. Uh, I think there's a lot of agreement on the, on the challenges that lie ahead. For me, I always start out with this shift that needs to happen within the sector, which is a shift to uh, doing with people or as opposed to doing to people. And certainly uh, within QFES, which is my agency, we're, we're, we're using the term place-based solutions to try to keep us really clear that every policy, every approach, every idea we come up with, it has to be able to be contextualized into that local, that local community, uh, whatever it looks like. Now, the challenge is in, it's very easy to say place-based, uh, but when you have to rub that up against um, culture and um, uh, old ways of doing things, it gets really, really tough. And, and certainly I, uh, in preparing for this little session, it reminded me of a, a story which I will share, which, which is an expression of uh, change. Uh, and it's not an Australian fire service, but it was a story that was told to me by some of my um, uh, United States colleagues about how change is expressed. And the, and the little story is that um, there was a visitor to a, a fire station and they're watching uh, the crew put on the Sunday uh, roast dinner as happens in many fire stations around the world, particularly in Western, uh, Western countries. And they, this individual watched how they had this big uh, cut of meat and they cut it into a large piece and a smaller piece and then proceeded to put it into two trays. Uh, and then, then it went in the oven. And of course, um, it was quite a large oven. And so the visitor, visitor actually said, well, why did you cut into two pieces? Um, why didn't you just put it in one tray? And the answer was, uh, because we used to have a smaller oven. And so the habit was that, that we'd, we'd cut it into two pieces. And that habit had um, outlasted um, many changes in designing that station, designing the kitchen, designing the oven. So old habits really die hard. And certainly for us in this sector, I think you know, if we go back to the question, what does the emergency management workforce need to look like in 20 years time? I think it needs to be one that's fit for purpose for the situation we're in now. And that's again, very easy for me to say, uh, not so much easy to realize. The other comment I'd make would be that I would hope that that future workforce, a much larger percentage is dedicated to prevention and preparedness and a reduced percentage is dedicated to response because that shows that we've actually made a big shift and it's not unlike um, you know, the same 
thinking around um, healthcare that uh, you know, time spent on getting people to be proactive with their health um, allows them to be in a better, better position should they be confronted with something as opposed to uh, doing what many males do for the men in the room, and that is ignore something for a long time before we do something about it. So that would be my comments for now. That's great, thank you. Celeste, you're up. Um, I took mine from the research because that's what I was sort of brought here to do. So because we've looked at systemic risks for the last 15 years and we've looked specifically at things like risk ownership and diversity and inclusion, my thoughts are really kind of focused on that. So to me, the whole emergency management workforce needs to be a collaborative system and it needs to have a culture that's curious, that's inclusive and adaptive and where it's safe to be different. And I think that's something I would like to see in 20 years time, because in our interviews, what we picked up was people were saying, we're having the same conversation we had 25 years ago. So I'm hoping in 20 years, it's not the same conversation. It's not actually a conversation because it is. I think also where communities and organizations work as a team and know where to pass the baton on to each other and how not to drop it. So at the moment, there's, they are still forming the structures that need the workforce, uh, that the workforce need to do that. So I think we have to have the systems that support the workforce as well. It needs to be a workforce where people understand how they fit, who needs to lead, and how they need to lead, and why this needs to happen in which area of the PPRR spectrum because at the moment there is a, a very strong focus on response because of the cascading events. But if we don't start looking at the other areas, we're just going to be going down a hole where it just gets more and more and eventually the system is going to break and it's already starting to show signs of that. And also a workforce where community strengths and capabilities and the thresholds involved with these are understood so that they can use these and that they can recognise them. There's a self-awareness for the communities and also for the organisations themselves as to how those thresholds uh, can be approached and avoided so that you can keep functioning. Uh, technologically agile and adaptive is something I wrote down because we've got so much knowledge. It's happening so quickly. We need systems and people who can support those systems. So we've got in-time knowledge that's robust and that people can make sound decisions around. And that's, that's a kind of utopian thing, but it's a really exciting field as well. Um, also, uh, this is my particular bandwagon, I'll just put that out there, but social risk is something that's hugely underestimated at the moment, and it's not very present in the actual risk system. So it's something that needs to be socialised. It needs to also be valued and rewarded at the same level as technical risk. It's critically important because with the trucks and all of those things are vitally important, but without people in the communities, without people, we just have buildings. We just have things. Um, so I think we need to be also strategic and forward-looking and it needs to be able to, in 20 years, at least you would hope to have the ability to shape new narratives that are salient um, to, to the whole system and provide pathways forward. Thank you, Celeste. Alan, you have the last word on this question. Thank you, Blight. As you know, I was the one that took the question today. So um, first, First words that I wrote on a on a piece of paper today were passion. So, in my experience, we can build knowledge into people, knowledge about bushfires, about emergency management, but we can't build a passion into them. They have to come with a fire in the belly for us to build on. So, to me, that's number one. Uh, kindness. If people are not kind to each other, then we can't operate internally in the organizations. We can't. Uh, work with our communities properly. And that's where the emotional intelligence comes into the play as well. So other than that, uh, I've seen a lot of things here that I ticked. So I'll go through some of those ones. Resilience, you know, the frequency and severity of catastrophic events is just incredible now. Mm. So I'm hoping that the future workforce won't be exhausted like we are. So they hopefully be rested and have more time to think 
we want to think strategically and make the right moves into the future because we're moving from one problem to another problem without having a proper break and a proper thinking. Uh, more diverse, so that's number one there. Um, representing communities that we serve and we are diverse workforce is not just the right thing to do. It actually diverse teams produce far better results as a, as a whole. Uh, technologically savvy, which shouldn't be a problem. Kids are now born with a smartphone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got the first one when I was 28. So that shouldn't be a problem for, for them. Knowledgeable. We will have to build the knowledge into workforce very quickly. We won't have a 20, 30 years time to build that knowledge that we we taken to to acquire it because new generations according to research will change their career three times in their working life so we won't have them for 40 years or the 50 years we might only have them for 15 or 20. how do we build the same knowledge into them that um, that uh, um, we acquired over a much longer period flexible and adaptable so they're comfortable to operate and make decisions in a very gray area Nothing is black and white in emergency management. Thank you very much. Um, it's been wonderful watching that word cloud form up there and see all those really positive words. And I think it's interesting to reflect on how well we think that reflects the current emergency management workforce. And, and, and so the next question that I'm putting to the panel in one moment is how do we kind of move from where, from here to, to there? So what does the set the need to do to build a future ready workforce? So you should have that question there for you to respond to. Now, this isn't a word cloud. This is short, pithy, constructive comments and they'll scroll up the screen. All right, so to the panel, who will I begin with here? Um, Andrew. What does the sector need to do to build a future ready workforce? Just uh, sitting here contemplating on it because I knew you were going to give me the first question. <laughs> uh, certainly, uh, uh, look, and we all do this, we all think about the, the question or the problem from, from our own uh, mm -hmm. perspective, and that's quite okay to do that. Um, I, and going back to my earlier point about that the shift that needs to happen is a shift away from response to you know, stopping uh, or protecting or uh, readying people uh, before the event so that they can be uh, more reliant than probably communities are currently. And looking at our agencies, the way we, uh, the way we recruit people, uh, at the moment, most agencies like to portray a, a real hero image of a, uh, whether it be a, a firefighter or, or a, um, an SCS volunteer or a rural fire volunteer, uh, showing them in action you know, in the field, you know, dealing with the whatever big nasty problem they're dealing with. Whereas the reality is, is that we're trying to get them to do that when they need to, but certainly want them to be spending more and more and more time uh, being on the proactive uh, side with with uh, with communities or families or individuals. And that's that that's not that doesn't come across as real. You know, if you talk if you talk to a marketer about that, you know, the the, the marketing expert's gonna say, oh, that's not gonna get the hook in them. The problem for us is that, and we see that I see that mind patch at the moment with our uh, SES volunteers where we where we do have a retention problem. And it's partly because uh, you know we have uh, SES volunteers join and they're sold on the concept that they're gonna be out there. Um, helping people every day, climbing over roofs, vertical rescue, and uh, you know, doing all the things, all the wonderful the things they do. They just, in certain locations, they just don't do it very often. So therefore, they go, "Well, this, this, this is not the picture that I had when I joined." So I think we need to somehow kind of re, uh, redirect that. So we're being honest with people when they when they join. Probably means we need a different skill set. I'm a I'm a big advocate for increasing diversity of thinking in any group and, and certainly in our sector uh, we do uh, and can suffer uh, groupthink uh, commonly because of you know we know all the ways that things are all, always worked and going back to my you know that little story about you know putting the roast in the oven uh, you know we, we really hold true to 
uh, things, and it takes a, a big shift of energy to accept something new. And even before I was having a chat to a, a colleague here about you know, what does it take to accept new research, which advocates for a big profound shift in direction. And as I've learned, it takes two or three times of what you think it's gonna take. Even if you convince them, you need to get people to give up on uh, something that they've believed in for a long time. So I think we're looking for uh, people with uh, probably broader thinking or people who can come in and broaden the thinking of the group. Uh, and just to summarize, going back to where I started, uh, people who appreciate and can jump in on uh, educating, helping communities prepare before an event, uh, uh, you know, working with communities before an event so that we're doing less response work and all the you know, um, you know, mop up that we have to do after the event, which, which really hits hard socially. And, we've and one of the other speakers has spoken about that. Thank you. That's great, thank you. Amanda. And I should just let the panel know that we've got about, what have we got, 25 minutes. So we'll keep, so not, not very long answers, <laughs> but, but still still would like you to say what you'd like to say. So, so I just want to say I can have 20 minutes. So <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, so for us, uh, when we're looking at things, what we can see is there still needs to be stronger planning occur on the ground around how, um, particularly because we look at a volunteer workforce, uh, and particularly those informal kind of volunteers, spontaneous volunteers, we still see that there needs to be stronger planning occurring. Planning needs to occur so we can support the structures, we can support the individuals that are on the ground and doing their work to make sure that they aren't doing any harm, but not getting in their way of doing what they need to do to help the communities quite naturally. Uh, one, having a one size fits all plan is not going to work. So there are going to have to be a number of different plans in place to ensure that, that um, the different types of workforces can be supported. We need to start to think now, not when the event happens. We need to start to think now what kind of activities uh, volu the volunteer workforce can undertake and support. We would love to see volunteers and we, we understand that it's a need. We get it, it's a need because it's what we see. And that's the mucking and gutting of houses, the cleaning up of properties. But we would really love to see move away from that being the only activity that a lot of these volunteers are currently used uh, in doing. Um, with all due and I know Ellie, your volunteers don't just do that. Um, so we do. We would love to see other plans go in place, some thought being put in place. Because what will normally happen here is there's going to be rapid impact assessments that are occurring by the time they're completed and it's safe for volunteers to enter. Their interest is gone. It's gone. So what other activities can volunteers do to support um, the actual recovery space? But it, um, when we're talking about preparedness of communities, we would really love to see structures being put in and some supports put in to help communities become better prepared. Uh, so that would include ways that we can um, establish um, volunteer um, groups such as a VOAD in America, they have a, a voluntary organization active in disasters. And that's all the organizations that don't traditionally play in that space. They come together, they talk about the resources they have, the capacity they have to support and ways they can mobilize volunteers quickly. So we would really love to see those sorts of structures established as well. Let's start to share information with our communities on what they need to know uh, so that they are better prepared. And let's start to talk and move, just not just talk about being ready for a disaster itself and what they need to do to prepare so they don't, you know, to clean out gutters and things like that. Let's start to talk about what the impacts they will see in their communities once a disaster hits. Let's start to share information about the impacts on individuals. Um, so when they are stepping forward at times to help, they have a better understanding that people may not be ready um, to accept their assistance when it's being offered. Um, with that in mind, when we talk about information being shared with people before events, what we know is going to happen is that volunteer cohort that step forward. So the emergent volunteers, spontaneous volunteers, informal volunteers, the majority of those volunteers are not going to have interest in undertaking training to get ready to be responders on the ground. 
So the import, we need to start to look at our messages and the importance of those messages as that's all starting to take place and how we better inform those volunteers is really important. It has to happen as that is happening. Again, these volunteers, if they do training, the chances are they're not going to maintain the training. So we really need to get better with those messages. Thank you. Ricky. I agree with um, the recommendations from, from uh, the other responses. To me, what's important, and sometimes we may not think about it, we'll get into some of the details about, um, you know, what structural processes need to happen to get from A to B. Uh, I, I took a different approach in, in, in this question saying that, well, in 20 years time, what we want our workforce to look like, I then picture, well, who's going to be at the top of their game in 20 years time. And it's probably not us here in the room. It's going to be a bunch of 10 year olds to 15 year olds mm -hmm. that aren't here. So my, my priorities would go towards how we can get that integrated thinking into the next generation of leaders and practitioners, because if we don't have that transition happening, um, we're going to have the, um, the oven example all over again. So, you know, without uh, going into detail on, on how and some of the opportunities that exist, I think just an overarching um, priority to be placed towards the things we're talking about now have some type of pathway to get through to that next generation so they can take some ownership um, over it. That's great, thank you. I might pass to Alan. Um, I'll start with the right culture so we can attract people to come in the organizations for the new generations. The other moral and ethics are really important if you want to attract them to come into the, the work, workforce. Learning culture, I think it was already spoken about, you know, the, us creating the environment where we take the latest knowledge, science, and bring that into organization. Uh, but also, I've seen it somewhere up, up on the screen, beyond uh, allowing people a safety net to make mistakes. We all learn from the mistakes, but now mistakes are not allowable anymore. So how do we create a space that some of those things can be done without hurting people in the process? Um, just culture versus blame mm -hmm. culture. Mm -hmm. So I think we really need to spend more time working on just culture because all of our reviews are in, and inquiries are really inquisition type of things where we're trying to find who is guilty and then cut ahead. And that's uh, normally not helping with the attraction and retention of the workforce either going through those cycles. Um, I I think for me, it's extremely important to gain the social license mm -hmm. from the communities, from the government, from the businesses, so we can get out of this continuous cycle of disaster inquiry, disaster inquiry. And before we can implement anything, a new disaster happens, we have another inquiry with more recommendations that we can't implement because we don't have a time. Mm -hmm. So that's the other. For me, that's important. Uh, we need a better funding so we can actually provide proper mentoring and coaching to our people. We normally, the standard practice is we wait for somebody to resign or retire, then we advertise that position. There is no even handover, let alone any mentoring or coaching that would probably need to take year two to build that knowledge in the organization with back to what Archie was talking about. A uh, review of our doctrine, it's very rigid, we are the very specific that things are changing, our doctrine needs to change, it needs to be more principle based than step by step guides how to do things. And um, I think one thing that we're doing really poorly is learn from things that we're doing well, we always keep learning from mistakes but never from things that are going well. And there is a lot more things that are going well than the things that are going wrong. We never learn from those. That's a great point, thank you. I think Celeste, I'll pass to you now. Thank you. Um, I think 
when we're talking about culture, because I'm I agree with Alex, I think culture is a key part of that. The fix it culture is something that I think we need to move through. That has a place, and it's not that it's not relevant, but we also need to think about there are things that just can't be fixed. And when the unexpected happens, how we learn from that and what that mindset is. What's that sort of, I call it a nomadic mindset where you can move through as a team through a changing landscape and still maintain purpose um, for the longer term. The other thing is, is I think the community absolutely need to be in the centre of decision-making for planning and preparation. They need to be risk literate. They need to understand the risk so that they have respect for the risk, not fear. I think if you engender fear, then you get bad decisions. Um, the other thing is, I think, unpacking trust. There's been a lot of talk about trust. We need new forms of trust and we need to have different expectations because these events are not happening, happening the way we are used to them happening. So we need to think about what does that mean in terms of our expectations of our communities and our communities' expectations of ourselves. Um, I also think we need to curate better ways of looking at the intersectionality of risks because we've got these cascading disasters and they're not just all natural disasters, COVID being a point in case. How do we have those conversations? How do we manage them holistically? We're still learning that. So I think developing, we need to keep developing the systems to help us do that. We need a lot of help with that. And I think the other thing is we need to start socialising um, the whole thing of the different types of risks as they arise, rather than waiting for a perfect explanation. We need to start people thinking about how the risks are changing and becoming more agile in response. Thanks, Celeste. Ellie, you have the final word. Ah, this is the bit that I have so much to say. Um, so, look, I think we're running out of time to think about usual ways of bringing people into this workforce. So I really think we need rapid escalation pathways for people that activate after disasters. So an example of that is that I would estimate that I have had to say goodbye to probably at least 25 excellent organisers who are highly skilled in the emergency management and recovery space purely by dint of their natural abilities or they've come to work with me because they're events managers or they've come to work with me because they're just good organisers. Now, if I had the capacity and the ability to retain those people, then my community of Lismore would have a new workforce ready to stand up because they are excited by the work. They see the meaning in the work that they're doing. They see their effectiveness. They see the need for community people like themselves to respond and support communities. But our organisation, currently I've come here from a situation where I am managing a, um, a wobbly organisation because I do not have enough funding to resource it well enough. I don't have the external support that I need to keep us going. Um, we will keep going, but the sector and government more broadly needs to put really laser focus attention on rapid support and um, integration of emergent initiatives like ours. Um, we need to do things like inclusive training opportunities. So if um, local agencies, and I'm really excited because our local police have just said to me, come along, do our emergency management training with us. Come into the tent, come in and learn with us, sit alongside us and learn the skills that you need as a community organisation to be able to respond effectively in future events. Um, the most important recommendation out of the flood inquiry for me is about um, recognising, escalating and amplifying community-led initiatives. So the other thing we really need to do is move away from a centralised system and get into decentralised community resourced um, responses. And I just acknowledge this is really um, reflective of my experience in the Northern Rivers where we have lots of little communities and then we have Lismore, which is a different kettle of fish. But for those communities in the hills that are isolated by landslides, have their own things to manage, it's very easy and they're all trying to do it themselves with no money to resource those communities now with equipment, systems, um, quick training so that they know how to do it better next time. 
Um, we need to amplify the concepts like community response teams so that little communities are able and ready to run their own evacuation centres, um, that they've got the infrastructure and equipment that they need, that they've got generators, that they've got satellite telephones, that they've got connectivity, that they've got all that stuff that they need to look after themselves in the gap between when they respond and emergency management makes it to them. And then we really need to think about the longer term recovery. So my organisation is one of the only organisations in our community that is actually getting in and helping people rebuild their homes. Everyone else is waiting for funding, waiting for grants, waiting for the inevitable announcement about buybacks and house land swaps. Um, we are using volunteers to rebuild people's homes. And again, I'm doing that with not enough money. I'm doing that with looking like we're going to fall off a two year funding cliff. Um, it's not good enough. Governments need to recognise communities um, need to be enabled to actively participate in their own recovery and we need to be ready to do so. The last point I would make is that um, I really encourage anyone in any agency whatsoever to amplify your commitment and resourcing for community engagement and community development. A little example of that is that in the Northern Rivers, we have one community engagement officer for a massive area for the SES. That's not okay. Again, we need a big community engagement workforce so that we can have those preparedness conversations and so that people are ready and able to respond. And that community engagement needs to be um, modern and current and not simply reliant on community hall meetings because we need to be adaptive, flexible and meet the community where they are. I love this panel. Okay, we are at about five or six minutes left. So I'm going to go to the third question. I'm going to throw to the panel for speed answers of about 30 seconds. And that's going to be incredibly challenging for the question that I'm about to pose to them. So please um, have some compassion for them in this moment. Um, and I will show you what it is. Okay, what's the role of research in supporting the sector to build and enable a future ready workforce? A poll. All right, so people on Slido can shoot their, their little answers in there. For the panel, I might make this one easy on myself. I'm going to start with Ricky and move from the right to the left. In terms of the importance of research, um, research is really good to have, but it's also really boring to do. Um, <laughs> I'd be looking at the last 10 years of research with Bushfires, Natural Hazards, CRC, and using it more than we currently are into the next 10 years. Um, I get more excited about implementing research rather than doing more research for the sake of it. So looking at stronger pathways from taking research to implementing on the ground um, works for me. I'll just add that uh, I'm going to bring money into this because sometimes research is so there's not enough money to support it. Um, a, a paper recently uh, reported that in one of our state jurisdictions, uh, expenditure on uh, fire and emergency went from 200, 250 million to 2.5 billion over 10 years. Now, I reckon a betting person would probably say that most of that has gone into response. So my point would be that I think the money's there. It, it's how we get the money to the researchers so they can sell their uh, product or change uh, in a much more effective way because as I said earlier, we're dealing with a cohort who take a lot to be convinced. Uh, with my very current lens, I'd love to understand um, what makes people that engage in those first few days, weeks and months, what are the barriers and what are the things that make those people put down the baton? Um, obviously, I've flagged that I think that it's money. Like, I think if those people could be given jobs, they would keep doing what they're doing. Um, I would really like to understand the nexus between community development independent of um, preparedness initiatives. So just community development in general, do a community garden, have a community event, have some fun together as a community. I'd love to understand the nexus between that and between community preparedness and ability to respond to, respond to disasters. Ditto. And also we would like to see 
um, while we're the volunteering peak and we want volunteers to have a great time and, and uh, be front and centre as well, at the end of the day, it's about the people that receive the services and support, the people that have been impacted that matter. So we would really like to get a better handle and some more research that goes into the types of services and supports they have received from uh, their community and uh, what has worked and what needs to happen to continue to make that work. On an, uh, the second body of research we'd like is volunteer in Queensland, we do promote the VOAD, the Voluntary Organisations Active in Disasters, and those models of where organisations can come together and uh, be better prepared, uh, share resources, support their community. Um, but that model hasn't really been tested very well here in um, Queensland in particular. So we would like to know a little bit more about uh, if that model, that American model would work here. Um, I'm going to talk about it from a research perspective. I think we need, as an institution, to really start fast track transforming our systems so that they validate and reward impact based research. And in particular, we've got to be aware of the new skills and the new languages that people need to learn to do this within research. I also think um, we need to hold on to desperately the importance of public good research. It's very important to have industry-based research, but that will always be funded. But public good research, as you said, it's about the communities and that is the mo our most vulnerable people are least able to fund themselves with that. And I think we have to keep a focus on that. So to think beyond the money and remember it's about people and their lives. And also for us to understand ourselves as an ecosystem, and how we keep research as a healthy ecosystem, because how we treat each other and respond to each other as research institutes nationally is really important. We need both big and small universities working together in a healthy ecosystem. Um, I think every generation comes with a slightly different incentives for attraction or attention into the organizations. So I think that's a work that will never stop. We need to continue working on that because we really need to attract the best that we can in it and then keep them in, a, in the organizations. Um, human factors, I think we haven't done enough work on the human factors still in it. And um, we talked to some people talked about uh, the other place-based engagement and planning i think it's brilliant but it's extremely resource hungry and we'll continue doing it but we won't have a, enough resources to cover all the communities so the key you on know, for me is still how do we bring the rest of the communities and keep them engaged in um, in hazards or the risk when in quiet years as we know you know, the post big disasters communities are really engaged for a couple of years and then the interest starts dropping off. But what about all the other communities that didn't have any disaster experience, but we will, they will in the future? How do we engage those ones? Alan, you've done a wonderful segue to the um, wrapping up I have to do and the introduction to what's happening next in this room. So thank you very much. All right, this is obviously the beginning of this conversation. So workforces and communities of the future is an underlying theme underpinning, um, one of the underlying things underpinning NHR's research program. So um, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. I will shortly ask everybody to, to extend their thanks as well. Um, but we'll see a lot more happening around these conversations and themes moving forward, I think. I wanted to let you know what's happening next. So next up, we have in this room in about 15 minutes, something really special happening. It's the Disaster Challenge Final. So we've got three finalist teams of postgrad and early career researchers who are pitching solutions to a wicked problem that the sector has put to them. And the, the wicked problem they're responding to reverberates very nicely with Alan's last point there about engaging with perhaps a less engaged in communities. So the challenge set for them was how disaster preparedness can engage with the unengaged, the moving or the hard to reach. So we have three pictures that will be coming done up here on the stage and we'll be finding out who has won the disaster challenge. So please hang around. You're welcome to stay in this room while we set up the stage for that, or you're welcome to go out and stretch your legs. If you do go out to stretch your legs, please make sure that you're back by four o'clock for that session to start. And the disaster challenge final will be followed by some refreshments and drinks in the foyer afterwards. So stick around for that. Um, so please join me in thanking our panel very much 
for their responses and honest responses today. Okay, welcome back. Thanks for coming back. And welcome to the future. All the discussion we've had in the past day and a bit about solving these huge problems, these big problems, these existential problems. And I couldn't help but thinking, you know, with greatest respect to a lot of the men in the room, there's a lot of faces that look like me looking in a mirror. And we need to change that. And if you're of the other gender, then think of yourselves too at that part of your career, because now it's the exciting time that we, at, at this stage of our career, get to hand problems on to the new ones. And we're looking for the solutions for the big problems. Good afternoon. My name's Ian McKenzie. I'm a member of the board of Natural Hazards Research Australia, and I'm your MC for the next two hours through this exciting session. I'd firstly like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, the Turrbal and Yugara people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to all First Nations people here today, and acknowledge the lands and the waters of which we are on and enjoying uh, to be present on, lands which have always been places of teaching, research and learning. So welcome to the inaugural disaster challenge and the final. Now it's time for some fun. And it's, it's it, the challenge we've said is a challenge to solve a wicked problem. And today, of course, as you all know, is the International uh, Day for Disaster Risk Reduction. And I'm sure you're also aware that each year um, there, there is a theme centered around the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. And this year's theme was to substantially increase the availability of and access to multi-hazard early warning systems and disaster risk, disaster risk information and assessments to people by 2030. That's a bit of a mouthful um, and a bit of a challenge. But I read that and I thought it was interesting reading it today um, because yesterday we saw another review released, uh, uh, the, the iGEM review into the flooding events uh, in Southeast Queensland earlier this year and guess what I think the major theme was out of that review was again, warnings and information availability to people in need. So it's accurate, relevant and timely. Of course, I joked with someone earlier, I thought there needed to be another recommendation that says just do all the previous recommendations from all the previous reviews and we won't do it again and we'll have it right. But we set the wicked problem that we set this group of, of up and coming learned individuals was to explore how disaster preparation can engage with the unengaged, the moving and the hard to reach. Now, why is that a wicked problem? Because frankly, most of the information and engagement programs that we have and materials that we have target people who live full time in residential places at a place somewhere on this planet. But many people just don't fit that category any longer. And at any given time, people are on the move, whether that's for work, play, holidays, or um, in, in this changing world because they need to, because the place that they have lived is no longer suitable for future living. Others just have living arrangements that are more transient. And we know that those that are less socially connected in communities suffer the most when disasters occur. So what is a wicked problem? A wicked problem is one that is urgent, that's difficult to solve because of incomplete or even contradictory information. And we've heard you know, the, the notion of contradictory research even in the past day and a half. A wicked problem calls for new ideas. It calls for new thinking and it calls for new research. So to deliver on that, we've got some of our best and brightest minds. Our PhD, PhD students and early career researchers that have put their creative talents together to present possible solutions to our wicked problem. And in the challenge final this afternoon, you'll see three innovative and very different approaches to that one problem that we've posed. And we'd also like to thank 
um, all of the other teams that entered. There were many teams that entered. Um, a, a select panel went through it and narrowed it to these three groups. Uh, but we have our top three here today that we'll, we'll get to listen to shortly. So it's encouraging to see that that passion exists at that level of researcher. Our finalists will hear about a new solution to harness community connections with culturally and linguistically diverse communities with Jyoti Katri and Mohammed Alakatani from the Queensland University of Technology. Then we'll learn how Wi-Fi can be used at tourism venues to teach tourists about what to do in the area during an emergency. And we'll hear from Mark Owens from CFA and Dr. Kamara Pooley from Fire and Rescue New South Wales. And finally, we have Jane Toner, Sheridan Keegan, Ahmed Kazim, Lin Lu Kopman, Yujin Wang, Minori Disaniyaka from Griffith University, along with Christina Hernandez Santon from RMIT, who will show us of the value of creative placemaking and art that can bring communities together. These are our top three teams, as selected by our expert working group, and Andrew, I'll ask to come up shortly to talk about that group. Our hope is that all three finalists that you see today can take their concept further. And that's a call to action for everybody in the room to think about how they can take that concept further. Um, and I know some people just on the topics are already thinking about who we can contact and how to make that of greater use. So as you watch these presentations today, think about it in, in terms of your work and how you can help take that forward. Now, there's more than bragging rights on offer this afternoon. Um, these teams will all, I was gonna say go away. I don't know if you go away with cash in your pocket necessarily, but there are prizes associated. First, the first place uh, winners will receive $5,000. No one goes away empty handed. Second place received 2000 and third place will receive $1,000. I'd like to welcome our judges, our very special judges uh, who are sitting in the front. Kath Ryan, Manager of Public Information and Warnings Unit with Queensland Fire and Emergency Services. Thanks, Kath. Carl Peterson, Manager of Emergency Management and Public Safety with Moreton Bay Regional Council. Rebecca Norris, Director of Policy, Queensland Reconstruction Authority and Associate Professor Andrew Taylor, a demographer at Charles Darwin University. Thank you, and thank you for your time. Our judges spent this morning uh, with our finalists to learn more about their pitch and provide feedback. Over the coming time, we'll ask each team to come up and we've given them 15 minutes. And I think you can just about set your watch by that 15 minutes from what I saw this morning. Um, and they'll use that time very well. Remember, they are telling us why their solution will engage, engage with the unengaged, the moving or the hard to reach with disaster preparedness information. After all the teams have pitched, uh, our judges will retire for 20 minutes. Uh, and in that time, we'll have two talks. Uh, we'll hear from Dr. Margaret Cook uh, for about 15 minutes delivering a keynote. Uh, and we'll also have some time with Kate Retsky from Queensland Reconstruction Authority to hear about Get Ready Week here in Queensland and how they're engaging the hard to reach audiences. Before we kick off though, I would like to introduce our CEO, Andrew Gissing to say a few words. Thanks, Andrew. Okay, thanks to, uh, thanks to Ian and great to see everybody here tonight. Uh, really, uh, also the, the, the teams, really looking forward to hearing your presentations and your pictures, <coughs> excuse me, it's going to be really, uh, this is what we're trying to ignite the, uh, the, the power of, of innovation and of that excitement for innovation and uh, as Ian was saying, the wicked problems that we're facing and, and the need to really be thinking differently, that cross-disciplinary uh, thought and uh, really bringing together this, uh, this challenge we see is a uh, really key way of driving that innovation uh, in a different way than what we have uh, previously. This is our first uh, disaster challenge and it rightly sits within the, the first uh, Natural Hazard Research Forum that we're holding here on uh, the day of uh, International Disaster Risk Reduction and also Get Ready Week uh, in, in Queensland and, and really looking forward to hearing Kate talk uh, later on uh, as well. 
we've had a working group that's worked really hard to pull this uh, this event together uh, and uh, and inspire uh, the, the great work that's uh, gone on uh, to date that we're all going to see here uh, tonight. Um, it's supported by uh, uh, not only NHRA but uh, our university uh, partners and uh, most importantly to our wider emergency management organisation uh, partners uh, here as well, bringing uh, it together. We couldn't do it without uh, all of you uh, involved. Uh, the other key thing here is that we've obviously, I've got some key people to, 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 to thank. Uh, Mike Carroll, firstly from, uh, from QFES, Cheryl Desher and, and Nancy Spencer uh, from Griffith University, Lisa Schuster from uh, QUT, uh, Alexandra Freeney from QRA, Alison Rufai, Chris Kerr, uh, Lucy uh, Tamachi uh, from IGEM Queensland, Helen Kerr D uh, Dyer from CQU, uh, Barb Ryan from the University of Southern Queensland, Alastair Stark from the University of Queensland, Eden Wooden uh, from the Office of the Queensland Chief Scientist, Samantha Lloyd from Healthy Land and Water, Jack Thompson from the Red Cross, uh, Siobhan uh, Allen from the Queensland Police Service, Paul Salmon from the University of the Sunshine Coast, uh, Nicola Moore from Natural Hazards Research Australia, who coordinated this group. Uh, I also want to pay uh, you know, a special tribute uh, to Anne Swinburne uh, from James Cook University. Uh, and it was great sadness that we uh, learned uh, last week of, of her passing and, uh, and also made a, a fantastic contribution to the, uh, the working group and was very generous with her time and, and her sharing with the ideas. So tonight, uh, uh, Anne is certainly with, uh, with, with us. So uh, we are, Anne is in our thoughts uh, uh, tonight throughout the, uh, the challenge event. But you can see that the wide number of people that have been involved uh, in, in getting us uh, here today. Um, so what, why, is, why is this challenge? So I've, I've mentioned that innovation, but we've got so many examples of, of the challenges that we're facing with these wicked challenges in the future. That's what's coming out through this uh, whole forum, right? Uh, and as I said on day one, it's not just the problems that we need to describe and research, it's the solutions. And tonight is really all about finding these innovative solutions, bringing them together and uh, helping to uh, produce uh, tangible change uh, through research, innovation and, and science. We, are working here in this wicked challenge with the next generation of, uh, of scientists and researchers and practitioners. Uh, and that's really important to, to help boost that through our education and training programs and initiatives uh, like tonight uh, as well. Uh, and tonight really involves uh, all, those, uh, all those individuals from a postgraduate uh, lens and undergraduate as well. Um, and there's much to learn uh, from, from these uh, pictures uh, today. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the efforts of John Bates, our research uh, director who uh, left us uh, at Natural Research Australia a couple of weeks ago back. Uh, John was instrumental in uh, really pulling together so much of, uh, of today and uh, so much of his vision of the, the, uh, the, the, the disaster challenge is what has been implemented uh, here tonight and throughout the uh, preceding months uh, leading in. So uh, thank you, John. I think you're on uh, having a watch tonight. Uh, the other thing there too is uh, the 2023 challenge. We will hold another one uh, next year. Uh, again, uh, it'll be it'll be different again in terms of its uh, focus because there are so many different problems that we need to solve. So we'll focus on a different area of, uh, of science and uh, focus our wicked uh, problem uh, on that. So we really encourage uh, people's involvement in our challenge uh, for 2023 as well. Uh, let's make it bigger and better uh, even than what we do here, uh, here tonight. So uh, uh, good luck to uh, all the finalists. Uh, uh, let's see how everybody goes. I'm really looking forward to seeing your, your pictures. So uh, well done and uh, uh, let's see some great work. Thank you, Andrew. And um, can I just uh, also echo uh, Andrew's words in terms of my thoughts and wishes with Anne's colleagues and family, and I know she mentored uh, one of the teams. So the teams are sitting here anxiously waiting. I think we've kept them waiting long enough. So I'm going to introduce team one. Mobilising local, culturally and linguistically diverse stakeholders and gatekeepers. Can I welcome please to the stage Jyoti Katri and Mohammed Alakanti from Queensland University of Technology. Please welcome them.
Natural hazard is a shared reality of our community, but has it also been a shared responsibility? Good afternoon all, this is Jyoti. This is Muhammad. And today we are pitching on mobilizing local, culturally, and linguistically diverse stakeholders and gatekeepers for disaster response. Before we start, let's together watch this video. This video will give you an overview of information that we want to talk today. Australia is one of the most ethnically diverse countries and is home to people from more than 200 different nations. The Australian Bureau of Statistics 2021 shows that 21.9% of Australian populations were born overseas. Australia is ranked ninth for migration destinations and most of the Australian population migrated from China, India and the Philippines. The 2016 to 2021 data shows that migration from countries like India, Nepal, China, Philippines, and Vietnam are escalating annually. The language diversity associated with majority of migrants living in Australia includes Mandarin 2.7, Arabic 1.4, Vietnamese 1.3, Cantonese 1.2, and Punjabi 0.9. Most of the Australian tourists come from China, Japan, and Singapore, while the country is also a popular tourist destination among the minority groups from other non-English speaking countries like Nepal, Bhutan, and Thailand. Like the diversity in Australian population, the country is also prone to diverse natural hazards. Some of the nation's common hazards are heat waves, floods, cyclones, bushfires, earthquakes, and hail. In the heat waves of 2009 in South Australia, 37% of those hospitalized were identified as people born overseas. People migrating from non-English speaking countries are impacted negatively due to language and cultural barriers. The culturally and linguistically diverse communities not only lack a proper understanding of Australia's physical and social environment, but also lack adequate awareness of local natural hazards. Has everyone watched this video? Yes. Australia has a diversity of communities, including the Saudi Arabian community. Albert Einstein stated that the only source of knowledge is experience. Let me share my experience when I held my community here in Queensland. I came here in 2019. I held my community with bushfire disaster. Early 2020, COVID pandemic occurred. I heard our elder and his people to be evacuated to Saudi Arabia. Today, I will just focus on the recent disaster, which is a flood. One day, my full rank and Saudi government, Saudi council called me and asked me, required me as my duty to locate and contact our people. We found that more than 23 families been impacted. As you can see here in the slide, they send these pictures to me. They are from different areas, such as West End, South Bank. They came to us because we share the same identities, same values, same religions, same culture. They put all the trust in us. Sometimes Arabs, Muslims, cannot speak to strangers. This type of challenge makes me feel hard and I cannot do anything. I ask one of my stakeholders to assist. They denied because of the lack of information of disasters. I imagine that if I wasn't able to help my community, even if I didn't have enough information, how I could help them. I wanna finish by saying this. A disaster doesn't override cultural traditions. Even though I'm Saudi, I still keep in mind social interaction, important cultural information. Thank you. Next, we can watch a video could explain different even communities share their experiences with other communities.
Hello guys, how are you all? Good, how are you? I'm okay. Have you seen you in the office this weekend? Is everything okay with you? Mm, I'm still recovering from the flood disaster. Our unit got flooded and I and my roommate recently arrived from Nepal. This flood event was very traumatizing for us because it reminded us of the flood 2021 when our entire village was inundated. In that incident, many people lost their lives and shelters. Oh, Sita, that's so unfortunate to hear. How are you settling now? If you need any help, please let me know. I represent Saudi student community during the recent flood and also during the pandemic. We supported many students and their family with food and shelter. How did they contact you? We are linked with virtual community and they can reach us through our community social media. I understand how important it is to find someone from your community who, and who can understand your needs, especially for newcomers like us. We don't know what to do, who to talk to. I'm also the member of Queensland Nepalese community managed by the Nepalese social workers. During COVID, they organized several awareness programs and posted important information in their Facebook page in our own language. It was very easy to understand and keep ourselves updated. Did you get any help during the flood? Yes. I and my friend uh, contacted the president of the community and uh, he assisted us to find one of the executive members in our suburb. He was very helpful and followed up with us regularly. He also helped us check the eligibility of the government assistance. We wouldn't know anything about this if we were to find it ourselves. That's so true. One of my friends and her family was also impacted by the flood. They live in this suburb where majority are Sri Lankan families. They helped each other during the flood. We all are also the members of Sri Lankan Australians group. The group organized food bank for the flood affected victims and cleaning programs. The group understands our needs and can offer appropriate support. I know it is very comfortable to share our problem in our own language with our people and ask for help. It's good that we have our communities and the social workers are doing awesome jobs. As you watch this video and Mohammed's, listen to Mohammed's story, Actually, this also reminds that how complex is the cult community in Australia is. It also reminds me of my own experience as a community outreach volunteer during the recent flood where I had to deal with this refugee family. This family was impacted severely during the flood. Still, they managed to cope very well because they received support, all types of support, emotional, social, um, financial, everything. And they coped really well uh, during the flood. Um, and then um, how uh, still um, during the conversation unfolded, um, what I um, discovered was they mentioned that they were not eligible for the government fund, not because um, they were uh, they could not apply, but they did not know about the information. And even their community leaders and uh, social workers were unaware about it. This problem could have been averted if the social workers were aware or well informed about such types of information. It was expected that, that this non-English speaking family could not extract um, information from the government website, but the social leaders could. And even what Mohammed just mentioned that how he wished for more helping hands during the pandemic and even the flood. This problem could also be addressed by training and developing skills of these potential volunteers so that they could provide support during um, these types of disasters and also in future as well. 
Realizing the importance of training these stakeholders who actually link with their community and who are also capable of connecting their community with the government and other humanitarian organization and other support organizations. Uh, we contacted the relevant organization and despite several conversations going on for months, we're still in the following up phase. Imagine if this is the situation during non-emergency, what would happen during emergency? We have, um, we already have limited resources. So in order to demonstrate, we have, we want to present you a mock demonstration. So can we have our participants here, please? Please, thank you. Just in the middle. If you allow me, Ruth, I will go first. Sure. And allow, allow me, everyone, I will speak mother tongue. السلام عليكم وش الله يعطيكم العافية احنا بنكون سريعين احنا بنشرح لكم عن الفيضانات بنشرح لكم عن السيول السيول هي عبارة عن مياه جارية وصعبة ولازم احنا نتحكم فيها التحكم وتجلسون وتسمعون المعلومات اعطني اجابتك باختصار انا اسمع دائما على الكوارث نشوفها في السوشيال ميديا او في التلفزيون او اي كان ولكن الاستعداديه والتدريب يعني يهيئني ما عندي الخبره الكافيه حتى الان شكرا just to translate what they say i have asked them how did they find the session i gave them a brief information about disaster floods and cyclone and if they confident or not what they will do in the future they say that we are now confident and we would be happy to support you and support other community stakeholder if you knew about this information. It's your turn, Jyoti. Yeah. So, how did the cost to like you? Yeah, I was a question. Yeah, participate in the program. There is a lot of And yeah, Nepal, ma, cyclone, many things. Kalvini, there is a lot of Yeah, I read up. I mean, you could all my own community. My girl, so well, I see how many people share the news. And it's to. Thank you. Yeah, I just asked him how he found the training session about cyclone, and he said it was very interesting because cyclone is very uncommon in Nepal, being a landlocked country. So he he is now going to share this knowledge and learning with his other community social workers so that they can again train more, um, train and prepare more volunteers with their respective ethnic groups. So thank you for participating thank you all. and thanks thank for your you time. All. Okay, before we finish, uh, you want to add, Jyoti, anything? Uh, you want to say something? Okay, I would like to say that thank you, everyone, for giving us this opportunity to share our experiences. No one will understand us better than us. Thank you very much. Yeah, and then, um, yeah, let me briefly conclude with the final words. Um, we all know that it's a very, we have a very short window to act right during disaster. So it's time now to invest in resilience and let these stakeholders lead the community during disasters. And when I say let them lead, does not mean that we wanted to shift the responsibility of the government and burden these community, but we wanted to share the responsibility as an Australian community for the shared reality. And to do that, let's start the conversation today and right from here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Please join with me again in thanking Jodi and Mohammed. We're now going to introduce team two the Tourist and Tourism Worker Education Using Wi-Fi Portals team. Could you now please welcome to the stage Mark Owens from CFA and Dr. Kamara Pooley from Fire and Rescue New South Wales. Welcome, thank you. Hi, I'm Mark Owens, Commander Alpine and in charge of CFA's Alpine Service Delivery Team. I completed my master's degree in emergency management in 2020, and I've been in the sector for over 20 years in staff and volunteer roles with the State Emergency Service, Country Fire Authority and Fire Rescue Victoria. 
And I'm Kamara Pooley, Senior Firefighter with Fire and Rescue New South Wales. I've been a firefighter for over 10 years and I completed my PhD in 2018. Our innovative solution is to use Wi-Fi captive portals to play short videos to tourists and tourism workers to enhance disaster prevention and preparedness. When individuals log into a Wi-Fi network, they will view a short video before gaining full access to the network. The video can be tailored to disaster risk that exists in that time and at that location. Our idea is innovative because it taps into the large scale adoption of wireless services and the everyday behaviours of an increasingly tech savvy population to target people while they're on the move. Australia has embraced wireless services and Wi-Fi is now considered an integral part of public infrastructure. Free Wi-Fi is increasingly rolling out, particularly in public and recreational places like accommodation, information centres, parks, cafes, restaurants, airports and on airlines and buses. Wi-Fi is especially valuable to travellers. I'm sure there are many of you here today who have access to free Wi-Fi networks since arriving at this forum, whether that be in this very venue, in your accommodation, on transport, or in a cafe or restaurant. Captive portals are web pages that users must view and interact with before accessing a Wi-Fi network. They're generally used, to used by providers to enhance security, monitor usage and control bandwidth. Captive portals can also be used to influence user behaviour, such as showing you an online an ad for a product or service before you jump online. Even though wi -Fi, uh, free Wi-Fi is everywhere and captive portals are common, they've never been used to communicate disaster and preparedness information. This is a great opportunity because the way that captive portals work means that messaging can be specific, measured and timely. So evidence shows that knowledge is fundamental to disaster prevention and preparedness, and that education is an operational and cost-effective tool for managing disaster risk. Evidence supports the use of short videos to communicate disaster risk. People remember visual messages more clearly than text, and they're more likely to be convinced by something they see than they hear or read about. So we wanna produce a series of short videos that inspire people to reduce disaster risk. These videos will show relatable people taking simple evidence-based positive actions to reduce the risks and consequences of disasters in a way that normalizes these behaviors within the everyday activities of tourists and tourism workers. Within each video, people, a group or a family will travel across different parts of Australia at different times of the year. The final videos will show people who are demographically diverse to enhance relatability. While traveling, the people will engage in disaster prevention and preparedness behaviors that are specific to that time and place. So for example, while traveling on the south coast of New South Wales during bushfire season. Each video in the series will have a similar look and feel to implement a standardized and harmonized approach. This will ensure that the information is delivered consistently and frequently enough to embed disaster prevention and preparedness within the common knowledge of tourists and tourism workers. Each video will also highlight tourism hotspots and activities while promoting a positive holiday vibe, enhancing the likelihood that the videos will be viewed in full by tourists and tourism workers and will be supported by tourism businesses. By promoting the local area and supporting positive behavioural change that reduces risk in tourists and tourism workers and therefore tourism businesses and local communities, it's likely that these videos will be used by local Wi-Fi service providers. We've developed a video to show you how this would work. In this video, you'll see a family of tourists visiting a holiday park. They begin by accessing the accommodation Wi-Fi network, and then they watch the Captive Portals disaster preparedness video that was created for their location and time. And in this case, the south coast of New South Wales during bushfire season. You'll see them watch the disaster preparedness video through the Captive Portal. After watching the video and accessing the network, the family then implements a proactive uh, behaviours that are then observed demonstrating how disaster preparedness video is intended to influence everyday tourist and tourism worker behavior.
South Coast. It's going to be calm and mild. Temperatures in the mid 20s and no wind. As you can see, I won't be winning a Logie for my first outing. Uh, so while this um, ex example showed a bushfire safety video uh, to the, uh, specific to the south coast of New South Wales, videos can be used to educate tourists and tourism workers about disasters of any scale in any location at any time of the year. The technology is scalable from a single building to a large area, from an individual Airbnb building to a chain of hotels to a local government area to the whole east coast of Australia. Our approach is highly adaptable. So captive portals can select videos based on time and place or current conditions such as the fire danger rating. They can automatically personalize based on the language settings selected on the device, meaning the content can be tailored to the individual language needs of the user. This is important where we know one third of the Australian population are culturally and linguistically diverse and where many of Australia's tourists and tourism workers are from overseas. Captive portals are also demographically adaptable. They can ask basic information such as your age and can use this to select videos tailored to individual needs and preferences. Captive portals identify the IP address of the device. This means that we could play a video only once when a user logs on for the first time to avoid viewer fatigue, or we could play different videos every time a user logs on to communicate multiple messages. The videos will be highly visual with limited spoken word, and this will ensure that the content can be understood by people who have low levels of literacy who speak English as a second language or not at all, or who are deaf or have hearing impairments. When people are blind or they have low vision, the captive portal can use existing voice enabling software on the user's device. This idea is affordable. There's no cost to the viewer as Wi-Fi networks are usually provided for free. And there are no additional business costs of hosting a video through an existing captive portal. <coughs> Excuse me. The videos themselves are inexpensive to create. Evidence shows that uh, short videos can be created and updated quickly, easily and distributed cheaply and produced at a low cost and require few resources and little time investment. Our sample video took two weeks to write, one day to film, two weeks to edit, and involved a crew or two, a cast of five and a total of $5,000. These low costs will be significantly offset by the social and economic benefits of prevention and preparedness. The Australian government or a network of governments and industry bodies could fund, develop, and distribute the series of videos which are then made freely available. Government incentives could also be used to encourage businesses to promote disaster preparedness through their free Wi-Fi networks. Our approach is achievable because it taps into existing technology and aligns with existing evidence-based practice. Of course, the approach relies on Wi-Fi accessibility and there are going to be locations that don't have access to a network. However, where tourists and tourism workers travel through locations or where they use public transport that does have Wi-Fi, they can be captured on the way to these inaccessible locations. In addition, a study conducted in the United States found that Wi-Fi kiosks offer an effective, reliable and affordable means are providing Wi-Fi in otherwise inaccessible areas. And these can be supported by government and industry investment and incentives. This idea addresses an urgent issue of reaching the tourist and tourism worker with disaster preparedness information. While domestic and international tourism declined during the pandemic, interest and intention to travel has increased since early 2022. If we return to pre-pandemic levels, Australia will see 9.3 million international tourists, a domestic tourism spend, of over $80 billion and 660,000 Australians employed in the tourism industry and an influx of international tourism workers to meet growing demand. Meanwhile, we're seeing an increase in the frequency and severity of disasters with our changing climate only worsening the risk to tourists and tourist workers.
So during the 1920 bushfire crisis, tens of thousands of tourists were trapped by fires on the East Coast. Service stations ran out of fuel, supermarkets ran out of food, power was cut and mobile phone services stopped working. Our idea can help get preparedness information out to more people before events like Black Summer, giving people a higher capacity to anticipate and respond to disasters. A higher level of preparedness relieves pressure on emergency services, local communities and critical infrastructure and enhances efforts to respond to disasters when they occur. Importantly, we can monitor and evaluate our approach in determining its effectiveness in instigating behavioural change. So evaluation can start with a pre-post-test matched pairs study. Within each pair, one area will receive the videos via local Wi-Fi captive portals and the other area will not. Surveys will be conducted with tourists and tourism workers before and after implementation or no implementation to measure changes and differences in perception of risk and knowledge of disaster prevention and preparedness behaviours. Evaluation can also involve interviews conducted to explore tourist, tourism worker and tourism business perceptions of the approach, of the slogan, of different versions of the video, such as animation. We can also embed a like-dislike function at the end of every video to measure immediate term interest and engagement, or use longer term data metrics to measure the number of times each video is viewed, in what location, in what language, through which network. And all of this information can be used to continually monitor, evaluate and improve the approach. We want to seek feedback from agency and government representatives and disaster preparedness experts. Kamara and I collected some initial feedback from Stacey Jones at Shoalhaven Council in New South Wales about using videos at Holiday Haven tourist parks. So Stacey, as the marketing and business development manager of Holiday Haven, what do you think about the idea of using Wi-Fi captive portals to deliver disaster information to tourists? I think it's a wonderful idea. Um, in fact, I can't believe it hasn't been done already. I think uh, this kind of tool would be so useful for, well, I can say for our holiday haven parks, but um, other holiday parks as well, and other tourist providers. Um, it just seems like such an important initiative that you would be able to educate your guests on uh, the potential dangers in the surrounding area. Um, the fact that it's seasonal, I think that's amazing too, um, that you can tailor the message according to the season, because that would be very important that you're not bombarding them with too many messages that they perhaps don't need to have for that time period. Um, yeah, I can see us using that in the future because we haven't included, like safety is such a huge, issue for Holiday Haven. Um, it's just as important to us as it is to providing great space for guests to have a wonderful um, holiday. So having that ability to share uh, an important message but do it in a, a positive way I think is really important and the fact that you can incorporate it into other marketing messages is really appealing as well. Um, so it becomes more of a like common knowledge versus you know a dire message that kind of scares people off so in that respect i think it's really incredible the use of videos embedded in wi-fi captive portals to deliver disaster prevention and preparedness information is innovative it uses existing technology and embeds evidence-based practice it is adaptable to disasters of any scale in any area and to different individual needs and preferences it can be realistically achieved within a reasonable budget and addresses an urgent wicked problem with efficiency and sustainability. Although there are going to be complexities and challenges involved in full scale implementation, these can be overcome through government and industry investment incentives, leadership and the formation of networks. We would like to thank Natural Hazards Research Australia for the opportunity to be involved in this brilliant initiative. And special thanks to Kat Haynes and Bethany Patch for your incredible generosity and support. And a huge thank you to our wonderful mentors, Maureen, Michael, Helen, and Alexandra. We really appreciate your generosity, support, your feedback throughout. It's been invaluable to us. And of course, to the wonderful Anne, who is in all of our thoughts today. Thank you. Well, I need to go and get out a tech dictionary and start reading some things now to understand just what a captive portal is, but uh, fascinating. Thank you again, uh, Mark and Dr. Kamara. Great. Can I now introduce team three, Beacons of Hope? And could you welcome to the stage, please, Jane Toner, Sheridan Keegan, Ahmed Kazim, Lynn Lou Kopman, Yunjun Wang, Minori Disanyaka, 
uh, and Christiana Hernandez Santum. Thank you. Um, we, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians, the Yagara, Jagara and Turbul people on whose lands we are gathered today. And uh, we would like to pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders, past, present and future, and uh, pay respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders with us today. Always was, always will be. So local knowledge and real time data are critically important in disaster response. Where I'm from in the Lismore region, this was demonstrated in the recent floods. When real time information lagged and broken river and rain gauges gave misleading information, residents were given false assurance of uh, steady river heights when in fact water was rapidly rising. The value of local real time data was soon realized, however, when quick thinking Lismore locals put together an online spreadsheet to coordinate community volunteers in rescue boats and identify those in need of rescuing, saving many lives in the process. Often overlooked in disaster management planning are the less permanent members of the community. People like travelers, international students, refugees, the new to town or the homeless as migratory birds are intrinsic to the health of a local ecosystem, transient people are intrinsic to a thriving, inclusive, resilient community. And there is an implied duty of care from the greater community. Transient people are more vulnerable to disasters as they lack the ingrained risk awareness of long time locals and have social connections have less social connections for support. The Beacons of Hope is a process to capture and share local and real time information um, to assist emergency service operators, uh, transient populations and the wider community in how to respond to disaster. And this creates the opportunity to connect communities in many ways. The Beacons of Hope is also a thing, an interactive and artistic structure with both beauty and brains, a creative expression of place and a repository of local knowledge um, to be more prepared in disaster response. Beacons of Hope has a four step delivery process. Step one is understanding the context of place the ecology, geology, the history and the people. Step two are community engagement workshops to give voice to the full range of the community, long-term and transient. Step three is the production of community informed disaster management plans and climate adaptation and resilience plans and design briefs for the beacon's beauty and brains. Step four is the installation of the beacon of hope in a prominent and safe place to serve as a focal point for community gathering, information exchange and celebration. And so from our Lismore case study, we learned that Lismore's transient population is largely newly arrived residents, including international students and tourists. We also learned that Lismore has a long history of severe flooding with over 30 major floods in the last 150 years. This year, Lismore faced two major floods, displacing thousands of people. So now let's um, zoom in on what's happening um, at stage two of the Beacons of Hope process at the community workshop. Hello, and welcome to our workshop in Lismore. Now you've been transported into the land of the Bundjalung Nation. And um, inspired by the phrase, always was, always 
is, always will be, we've designed our workshop to honor the past, discuss the realities of disaster emergencies today, and envision a more resilient future for our communities. Around me, cafe style, we've got our participants talking to different tables and engaging in informal discussions. Let's take a look at what they're look, looking at. Both the frequency and severity of disasters demonstrates that prevention and preparedness working outside the disaster is critical to enabling communities to bounce back better. Through sharing stories, communities are able to process their experiences and develop a collective understanding of what preparedness means. Right now, we're looking at mapping the resources, the resources, skills, and needs of the community to understand what we need to do to be better prepared next time. So tell me one of the things that you've found. One of the key things that we found is food insecurity. Many young people who didn't cook that often or had limited storage space uh, were really challenged to access um, availability and preparation of food. When the power went out, many young people didn't know that they could use the barbecue to cook other things besides meat. <laughs> so right now we're looking at some strategies to engage young people, build their capacity through things like uh, cooking workshops or food preservation and just basic food literacy. This helps us to inform something called a capability and competency tool, an existing tool which will help us monitor and evaluate uh, community activities. Thanks, Lynn. Now follow me over to the next table. What's happening over here? A couple of international students at this table had a hard time finding relevant information and did not understand some of the messages about where to go, what to do, which was really stressful. Having real-time critical information from authorities in multiple languages with clear infographics will help us to mitigate this issue. This information would include real-time reliable maps with showing safe places, safe routes, and social networks to contact for support. This idea of social networks, it's critical for the transient communities, but how exactly is the Beacons of Hope process giving a stronger social networks to international students like yourself? Yeah, we are planning a program for volunteer disaster leadership roles, known as community carers, who are responsible for following up specific people in the community to make sure they are aware, prepared, and safe. For example, a student council member might contact a list of fellow students, while a community drop-in center volunteer might door knock at people who have signed up for special support. Ah, so for example, if you were in a different community like Tambourine Mountain with different risks and communities, maybe the community cares could be people working in the tourism industry or social good enterprises. Let's move on to the next table, Ahmed. Findings from the Beacon of Hope process highlighted some technical components that we can integrate into early warning system and emergency messaging to make them more robust. Let's have a look at this video to explore how the bacon process brains work. Our beacon of hope has beauty and brains. The brain is a distributed network of collaborating smart sensors tuned to detect environmental disturbances like rising water levels, fire or poor air quality. Let's say the water level sensor detects rising water, which will lead to floodings. Sensor data is sent to the disaster management team and posted to the local disaster dashboard with the critical information relayed by SMS or app notifications to people in the range of the hazard, to community carers who share it through their networks of transient people, to subscribers 
of a beacon of hope and say someone who lives here but works elsewhere or a traveler who saw a QR code at the beacon and subscribed. App subscribers become a people-centered feedback loop reporting local hazards via text and images. Algorithms analyze this feedback and GPS data to determine the appropriate response, which might be to send an emergency rescue team or a drone to scope the hazard. The app encourages neighbors to organize localized emergency support groups to check in and coordinate actions. The beautiful Beacon of Hope has an interactive screen. In times of peace, this is a source of information and stories about place, its people, and their astonishing resilience in the face of adversity. During disaster, molten sirens and lights activate, signaling people to seek further information. The screen can show maps with safe routes to refuge locations, vital services and resources. Each module is connected to power and internet. For resilience, they have solar panels with batteries for power backup, and 4G SIM card for internet backup. Additional functionality like digital signboard or navigation markers can be added if required. The beacon of hope will fill the gaps and extend the range of the existing early warning and emergency system to ensure more people get timely information. Brains and beauty united. By the way, it's also got a reliable Wi-Fi and an interactive user interface. Um, Lisbon City Council estimates that rebuilding will take $1 billion. So as we rebuild, it's time to ask, what kind of community do we want to live in? So to finish, we ask our participants to co-create a vision for Lismore and represent this vision artistically so that it can inform the beauty brief of our beacon. We have been reflected everything that has happened in the workshop and exploring how could we tangibly translate it by artwork to, that as an expression of our place, the beauty of our bacon. We decided, oh, we, sorry, we considered about the possible safe place for our artwork. The beacon brief will be issued to local artists for submission. A small group will shortlist pro proposals for community to work on. By the way, we are looking into funding opportunities. Um, does the beacon of hope process end once this artwork is installed? Actually, no. It is involving process of creating relationship, people to people, people to place, as well as reflecting and commemorating community. Our beacon will provide ongoing opportunities for communicate for community building and connection. It will be a focus of community-based events, celebrating resilience, creating a shared sense of optimism and hope. So a creative impression of our place will be attract all the deliverers and visitors an Instagramable moment. Zooming out from Lismore, you've just been part of a the beacon of hope process and heard of the tangible outputs for the community. Perhaps you can also imagine the intangible effects of this. People sharing their stories, creating connections and caring for each other. The beacon of hope process relies on cultivating partnerships with traditional owners, local authorities, business and social enterprises, like the Making Good Alliance, who are keen to pilot the process on Tambourine Mountain. Our Beacons of Hope is also adaptable and scalable to suit small or large communities. And we envisage a locally attuned, interconnected regional network of beacons that form an art trail to promote tourism and a resilient 
Emergency Infrastructure Network. The Beacons of Hope are a living artifact and tool that brings real-time local information to and from the community in a way that engages and embraces the transient population, creating a more connected community. We are confident the Beacons of Hope will engage with transient populations by bringing them into the community engagement process, amplifying their voices. This will bring to focus their risks and vulnerabilities and create shared responsibilities so that disaster preparation and planning can fill this gap. Beacons, Beacons of, of hope, hope, disaster preparedness for inclusive, resilient communities. Well, thank you, Jane, Sheridan, Ahmed, Lynn, Eugene, Minori, and Christina. Um, fantastic. I'm now going to ask the judges. Uh, if they'd like to retire for 20 minutes to consider their final decision. Um, and as they do, uh, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. But I think just one last time, I think if, if I can steal the title of the last presentation, I think we have effectively seen three beacons of hope this afternoon um, with, the, with the researchers and the future hope in this sector. So thank you all very much. And regardless of the outcome, you are all winners, so thank you. While the judges think about that, I'd like to invite historian and author, Dr. Margaret Cook, to give our disaster challenge keynote. Um, Margaret is a history lecturer at the University of the Sunshine Coast, a research fellow at Griffith University in the Australian Rivers Institute, and holds honorary research fellow positions at La Trobe University and University of Queensland. Her current research interests include natural hazards, rivers, water, politics, and environmental history. She's authored um, and co-authored several books, um, A River with a City Problem, perhaps the best known, but it, it certainly is to me. Um, and Margaret was the recipient of the John and Ruth Kerr Medal of Distinction for Excellence in Historiography, Historical Research and Writing in 2020. Please welcome Margaret. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ian. I too would like to acknowledge the Yagara and Turrbal people on whose land we meet and acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. I know one thing, I'm glad I'm here and not out the back judging because that's an extraordinarily difficult challenge. But today I've been asked to talk about wicked problems. Now Ian stole in my thunder a little by anticipating the definition but I will continue and say that for me, a wicked problem refers to a problem that is difficult to resolve rather than being evil. It's a problem that's difficult or impossible to solve because of incomplete, contradictory and challenging requirements that are really often difficult to even recognize. It can be a problem that just can't be fixed where there is no single solution to the problem. But for me, that sounds really defeatist. I'm not walking away from a challenge and neither should anyone else in the room. The main definition that I want to, to think about today is that the wickedness comes from complex interdependencies. The issues are entwined and sometimes solving one issue may create other problems, which makes it all increasingly difficult to resolve. Wicked problems require many people to change their mindsets and their behavior. And they cannot be resolved by one discipline alone. It needs many minds and different approaches and thinking around the table to work towards solutions in order to fully address the complexity. Wicked problems don't have one solution. They need a multifaceted approach and they really do need new thinking. 
So now I'm going to present a problem, a problem that many of you will be familiar with. I know I'm speaking to the, the converted here anyway. This is the problem of the Brisbane River floods. Now, the floods are a natural hydrological event. They're prompted by heavy rain. They'll happen whether there are humans here or not. Floods can be good. They replenish the water in the rivers and our creeks and they enhance our water supply. They clean the river systems and they rejuvenate habitats for the animals and plants that live in them. It's only a disaster or a hazard when humans have decided to build on the floodplain. In the case of Brisbane, the floodplain of a subtropical river with a long history of floods, the decision to build a city on the floodplain created an ongoing hazard. So how does flooding then become a problem? Well, floodwaters inundate homes and businesses. They cause substantial property loss and sadly, loss of life, both human and animal. Floodwaters lead to the closure of roads, railway lines and airports. They destroy bridges, ferry terminals and walkways. These factors make evacuation and rescue challenging and they create very expensive rebuilding. Debris such as pontoons, boats, trees, caravans and houses can become missiles as they career down the river, damaging much in its path. They bring silt and debris downstream that block waterways and close the port. Floodwaters can compromise water and sewage treatment plants, communication systems like the telephone, and they can cause power outages. These last two factors make warnings very difficult. People can be left homeless in the short term, in evacuation centers or with friends, or in the long term, in the slow process of rebuilding. And that, as we've heard today, can drag on. There is a risk of disease and infection in the cleanup process, and people can face health issues, physical and mental, during the floods and for years afterwards. People can lose their employment as their work can be flooded and the businesses may not recover. We know that floods cause poverty and strain on relationships. There can be food shortages through inundation of agricultural areas, warehouses get flooded and transportation routes are cut, which makes food distribution very difficult. Floods have a huge economic cost as they impact on the economy in the long term. But these are actually just problems. In isolation, they're all difficult to manage and together they compound and cascade. But the path, part that makes them a wicked problem is the complexity and their interdependencies. And that is deeply embedded in history and culture. And it's those elements that I'm going to speak about now. As history shows, decisions of the past have created this problem. Since the arrival of British colonists, society has aimed at controlling the river rather than regulating building on the floodplain. The solution to flooding was to turn to engineering. So we've built Somerset and Wyvernhoe dams for water supply as well as flood mitigation. Successive governments and building owners have put unrealistic faith in Somerset and Wyvernhoe dams to prevent floods. Now the dams do reduce the flood heights, but they are never going to prevent floods, especially when the rain falls downstream in the 50% of the catchment that is downstream of those dams. So simply, Floods can't be solved by dams. Since the 1970s, modern disaster managers have known that hard engineering like dams should be part of a package of flood mitigation strategies and include land use planning and public education. But flood management is all too often seen by the wider community as an engineering problem. 
As my evidence, I give you the class action after the 2011 floods. Southeast Queensland needs to consider dams and other hard structures as one option in a suite of mitigation strategies that might embrace greener solutions. Now herein lies a role for town planners, landscape architects, ecologists, botanists, and others. Encouraged by the powerful myths of dam created flood prevention, we built on the floodplain, although Aboriginal people, explorers and the early settlers all knew histories of past large floods. But oblivious to this or deliberately ignoring it, Brisbane residents continually built and expanded the city on the floodplain, despite this long history of flood experience. And now we've got decades of data collection and modelling that we're not embracing to make a change. In Southeast Queensland, the development and building industries are very strong. And the city has resisted moves to regulate floodplain development to the extent that I think is required. We live with the consequences of poor planning. To illustrate my point, Brisbane actually didn't even have a town plan until 1965. So we've really been paying catch up ever since. And we've had 120 years of development really without serious consideration of flood. It wasn't until again the 1970s that the city developed flood planning measures, but they rely really heavily on Wyvernhoe Dam to reduce the floods and the hope that future floods will not be significantly higher. But there's actually no sense in thinking that they may not be higher. And meanwhile, the city just continues to build on the floodplain. Brisbane is one of the fastest growing regions in Australia. And as hundreds of people move to the region each year, many without flood knowledge, we need to give them that knowledge. And we've seen today, just in the last three examples, just how incredibly important that is. We need to regulate where they live and we need to inform them of the inherent risk of floods in specific suburbs. To do this, we need social scientists and communicators we need to think differently. Perhaps we use writers and artists and the media to better inform the public of the real risks to make our communities more resilient. We need to have First, First Nations knowledge at the table. It is actually integral to what we do. We need to look closely at where we build in the future and if we can move people. This is an issue that needs to be addressed by governments, lawyers, town planners and developers. We compound the flood hazard through poor building design and regulation, issues that need architects and builders to address. I commend the Queensland Reconstruction Authority on their plans and findings that embrace the idea of build back better. But frankly, sometimes we should not build back. I suggest that there are whole streets in suburbs like Rock Lee that need to be reconsidered as habitable. Brave decisions like moving Grantham after the 2011 floods need to be considered for parts of Brisbane, but we also need to be conversant with the social and community issues that may be caused through dislocating those communities and manage that problem. And there maybe is a role for psychologists and community organisations. As a society, we are facing serious climate change and the reality that future floods may be more severe and more frequent in the future. Our town plans need updating, as will the flood control measures. This will need a, a whole raft of people, scientists, engineers, meteorologists to start. We'll need governments and community to seriously tackle climate change. We need the banking and insurance sector to pay their part in not funding foolish development. We currently focus on recovery and not prevention. 97% of recovery and 3% on prevention of every dollar spent is just the wrong equation. How do we change that dynamic when we know that each dollar spent on prevention saves $7? So we need to change the thinking towards more proactive solutions beyond engineered flood control. Can we perhaps think about a flood army in advance of the floods, rather than relying on the mud army to clean up the mess, or the SES, or the military, and others 
after the event. So what do we do now to put those processes in place, ready for the next flood, which will inevitably come? We need to recognise that we've moved some of the most vulnerable people into risky areas. The old age people's home on the Corso in Nuronga is a sterling example. And in doing so, we have created enormous social problems. How do we accommodate and assist the vulnerable in our communities? Who are the champions for them at the decision-making table? We need courage to have difficult and uncomfortable conversations about buyback schemes and moratoriums on building in places of high risk. There have been buyback schemes, but they've been relatively small scale. We need to establish a futures fund that steadily buys properties at risk. This will need money, courage and political will and long-term commitment to implement an enduring plan that goes well beyond a three or four year political cycle. This is about long-term enduring resilience. Brisbane's flood hazard is not going away. In fact, it's growing. To a large extent, we keep following the same path dependent strategies in doing exactly what we've done in the past. Path dependency is an economic term that acknowledges that decisions made in the past make change difficult and the cost of reversal can be very high. Cumulative actions reinforce previous decisions or limit the options available in the future. Sometimes decisions made in the short term can offer just kick the can down the road, defer it to the next generation, postponing vulnerability than offering true sustainability. This is especially in the case of building approvals that are made now in times of, or they're made in times of drought when we forget floods. And then we've built an inbuilt vulnerability that will kick in at the next flood. Short-term expediency or profit often for the benefit of an individual at that point in history can create a liability for the common good in the future. Unpopular or seemingly expensive decisions need a longer temporal framework. You need to think ahead to have some short-term pain for long-term gain. We need fresh ways of addressing these problems. We need innovative thinking, repeating the same mistakes and doing the same things again and again and again is not wise. As they say, only a fool repeats the same mistakes. We need to adapt our behavior and abandon well-worn strategies that are simply not fit for purpose. We must embrace trans transdisciplinary thinking and proactively work together to plan a different future. The role of historians like me is to show the paths that we have taken to reach the point that we're at today. We can show moments when other choices could have been made that offer insights into different futures. We can record and share stories and experiences of communities so that knowledge can help inform future decisions and encourage behavioral change and adaptation. Historians' research looks at the root causes of disasters in search of the cultural factors that can help identify ways to work with communities to change those contributors. As I said at the start, wicked problems need many minds and disciplines working together. We need courage, political will, and community empowerment to improve the flood hazard and resilience. And no one group can achieve this alone. Let's go to higher level thinking to think more adventurously and proactively with a whole community approach. We need to move people to prevent development, redesign our cities and buildings and develop better planning that recognizes that floods may become more severe and frequent in the future and not think that we are flood immune. We need to become proactive and not rely on our long history of recovery. Prevention is a much better strategy. And only through leadership, collaboration and action, together we will be able to fully address the wicked problem of Brisbane River floods. Thank you.
Margaret, thank you very much. Thought provoking and generally provoking as usual, thank you. The notion of build back better in harm's way or build back, build back differently is something I think we, we uh, continue to struggle with. Of course, this week here in Queensland is Get Ready Week, um, a week to remind people that preparation is vital to be disaster ready. And there are many things that you can do with family around the home to make a big difference. And here to tell us a little bit more about Get Ready Week in particular in terms of those remote communities, I welcome Kate Redsky to the stage. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Fantastic to be here on Turrbal Country, and I'd like to also pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land. Um, absolutely fantastic to be here for this wonderful event. I actually remember um, getting the opportunity to look through some of the submissions for the disaster challenge, and it was just really so fantastic to see the creative and out of the box thinking around disaster preparedness. So it's very cool to be here. Um, so as mentioned, I'm from Get Ready Queensland. That's a, a statewide initiative that helps Queenslanders prepare their families, their homes, their businesses for the many disaster and weather risks that uh, impact our beautiful state here in Queensland. We work with every single local government to deliver locally led tailored messaging and activities uh, for communities from up at the Torres Strait, down to Coolangatta, out to Charleville and the Isa, right across Queensland. And as a proud Queenslander, I'm really, really um, thrilled with what I get to do. We, along with our ambassador, Rug rugby league legend and all around good guy, Jonathan Thurston, uh, we ask Queenslanders to do our three easy steps to get ready. Uh, and I'd love to show you what those are. So just doing a few small things can ensure that your home and family stay safe and comfortable when extreme weather strikes. What we ask Queenslanders to do is number one, understand your risk. And that's because the impacts from extreme weather are different for everybody. Uh, so it's so important to learn about what can happen to you, where you live, and how that could affect your home and your neighborhood. Second is to make a plan. So having a household emergency plan is important so that your family knows exactly what to do and who to contact when extreme weather strikes. It only takes just a few minutes. And what we hear from Queensland is, is that it really gives people a uh, peace of mind uh, to know that all that information is in one place and easy to grab. And third, to pack a kit. Just grabbing a few extra items next time you're at the supermarket to make your emergency kit will mean that you can be safe at home, even if the power, the gas and the water stop working. So we actually have done research to learn how Queenslanders are taking on these behaviours. And we actually see that more than half of Queenslanders do get ready for natural disasters. But our research also shows us uh, that there are some improvements that can be made, particularly with hard to reach audiences. So that's people who are new to Queensland, young people, people who, with lived experience of disability, people with low literacy and people from diverse cultural backgrounds. So in 2022, we've been focusing our efforts on engaging meaningfully with people from these groups, learning from firsthand experiences and identifying ways to help them prepare better. We learned about universal human need for connectivity, how leaning into your community and networks is critical to build knowledge around risks and preparedness behaviors and support. We also learned about the power of simplicity, how keeping things approachable and attainable means that people are more likely to connect with the message. So we've been building a new suite of resources, including our flagship item, our Dangerous Weather Emergency Plan, which can again be tailored by local councils to specifically suit their communities. And we've worked to simplify how we speak about disaster preparedness and find ways to help people start with the basics and build their resilience over time, rather than asking them to do it all at once. Over the next year and those beyond, we'll continue to look to gather feedback on these and gather insights with the view of continuous improvements for how we can achieve our goals around accessibility and inclusivity.
But first, we have our 2022 campaign. It launched on Monday this week, of course, Get Ready Queensland Week, and it will run for the next six weeks. Again, we have taken things back to basics, just asking Queenslanders to tap into an existing habit, grocery shopping, to quickly and easily and cheaply get ready. Let's take a look. Oh no. This disaster season, make sure you have an emergency kit packed and ready. You'll need a torch and plenty of drinking water. Don't forget spare batteries. Adding a few simple items to your trolley next time you're at the shops will make a huge difference when extreme weather strikes. Hey JT, pass the pack. Yeah, still got it. Pack an emergency kit and get ready, Queensland. Authorised by the Queensland Government, Brisbane. No lightning bolts, no dark storm clouds, just really simple messages about one thing you can do to get ready. Pack your emergency kit. Grab those few extra items at the shop. Thank you so much to our proud sponsors, Suncorp, for making this happen for us. Uh, we're also really thrilled to have IGA stores across Queensland amplifying our message in store and across their channels this year. And I would just like to leave you today by urging you to think about your own family, your own home, your own business. For us Queenslanders, we know it's not a matter of if, but when, when it comes to natural disasters. So what will you do to be disaster ready? Preparing before it happens is absolutely the best way to ensure you can bounce back quickly. So please get ready, Queensland. Thank you. Okay, the time has come to put our three groups out of their misery at the pointy end. Our judges have considered their verdict closely and our winning team will not only receive $5,000, but Natural Hazards Research Australia will promote their winning concept over the next 12 months, explore how the concept can be taken further and provide speaking opportunities in emergency management and academic, academic forums. So, without letting anything being seen anywhere, let me grab a microphone as I announce the teams. Uh, our chief judge, Kath, will say a few words about each of them. Okay. I'll move out the way of that other microphone. Andrew, you're ready. Everybody's ready. So the winner of the inaugural challenge addressing the wicked problem is team two. For instant tourism, working education, Wi-Fi portals, would you please welcome Mark Owens from CFA and Dr. Kamara Pooley from Fire and Rescue New South Wales. All right, so as team two come to the stage, I'll share the comments from all of us as a judging panel. What a wonderful example of disruptive technology being used for good. We loved the innovative and adaptable opportunities your proposal offers, in particular, the flexibility across disaster, geography, language, and across preparedness, response, and recovery is really impressive. We would encourage a national approach, but flexibility to allow contextualization locally. The research allows continuous improvement and refinement over time. Congratulations on a fantastic pitch. Thank you. And, and please remember, these are all winners. In second place today in the challenge, Team 3, Beacons of Hope. Please welcome Jane, Sheridan, Ahmed, Lynn, Eugene, Minori and Christina to the stage. Well done. And again, the, the judges' comments are brains and beauty, what a combo. We've inspired, we're really inspired by your creativity and innovation. Your concept is a wonderful blend of community, technology, culture, and resilience. We liked your well-considered four-step implementation approach. We think the beacon of hope will work across prevention, preparedness, response, and recovery really well. We're really excited to see your, innovative, your innovation come to life soon. And hopefully in time, beacons of hope become standard features in all Australian communities. Thank you. 
And in third place, could we please welcome Yoti and Muhammad to the stage, mobilizing local, culturally, and linguistically diverse stakeholders and gatekeepers. Thank you very much. So again, what an excellent, innovative, um, and certainly a great solution to a very wicked problem. All of us judges felt the proposal had great merit and is urgently needed. We have no doubt your idea will and work will get momentum soon. And we really look forward to collaborating with you and supporting your exciting work. So well done to you all. And um, as Ian had said, everybody up here is a winner in our eyes. So congratulations to you all. Um, can I ask our finalists are all on stage, um, but judges and the working group and invited reps, if you could stay behind um, for some further photos, please. Um, I think you'd all agree, I hope you'll all agree, I, what a fantastic outcome. And um, a, as a challenge, the first one, uh, we're already talking in the back room during the judging about how the second one will go. Um, people, there's, there's judges already talking about funding sources uh, and recognising grants around the country. So, um, but as I started off this, I, it was about the future. Um, and I think we can all agree that our future is in good hands. I said, welcome to the future. Here it is. Thank you. Can I now invite and encourage everyone uh, to enjoy some refreshments in the fair uh, while you discuss how all of these ideas you've heard during the challenge can go to the next level and think about how you can be part of that. To our audience who have joined us online today, thank you for your time. We hope you enjoyed the live stream and good evening. Thank you. Thank you.